the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr. Rivagotti. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this morning we will hear from Professor uh, Alexander McFarlane, and then thereafter we will hear from Lieutenant General Simon Stewart, Chief of Army, and in the afternoon we will hear from Gregory Vines, the Chief Executive Officer of Comcare, together with Justin Napier, the General Manager of Regulatory Operations at Comcare. But if we could start with Professor McFarlane. Um, of course, Commissioners, Professor McFarlane has given evidence at this Royal Commission previously. He testified um, before you on the 1st of December 2021. You will recall that Professor McFarlane is a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, formerly head of the Department of Psychiatry in the School of Medicine at the University of Adelaide, and a director of the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies at that university. He is an international expert in post-traumatic stress disorder, and he has held the rank of group captain in the RAAF Specialist Reserve and has been an advisor to many groups in post-disaster situations. Um, I might ask that Professor McFarlane be sworn in. To you, Alexander McFarlane, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, this examination is accompanied by a tender model. I would ask that the tender list for that be displayed and I tender the documents in the manner therein described. You'll see that um, uh, there is one confident, confidential document indicated there and the tender list is two pages. Thank you. They'll be accepted on that basis then and um, as exhibits and allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor McFarlane, we've, we've heard over the course of this Royal Commission um, evidence in, in from, from various witnesses that address the most prevalent conditions for serving members in view of the risk of suicidality and suicide. Might I ask you just to summarise your views in relation to that evidence or separately from that? Uh, well, I think this is a critical question because the evidence is that at least 90% of suicides uh, in properly conducted studies are um, related to people suffering from psychiatric illness. And we looked at this question in a special report that was produced in 2012 for the um, Defence Force Joint Health Command based on the 2010 Mental Health Prevalence Study. And what we were able to show there that 22% of members of the Defence Force suffered from a psychiatric disorder um, the most common ones were post-traumatic stress disorder, 8%, depression, 6.4%, panic disorder, 7%, and alcohol dependency, 2.3%. Um, and then we looked at the rates of suicide attempts, and the one which was most important was depression. If you suffered from depression, you had a, a seven times greater uh, risk of uh, attempting suicide. Um, when we did the 2015 Transition and Wellbeing Survey, we found that 45% of uh, members suffered a psychiatric disorder. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder was the most prevalent. Unfortunately, in that study, despite finding that 21% of the transitioned members had any form of suicidality, um, the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs chose not to further analyse that data. I strongly advised them to do a similar analysis that we'd done on the data from the 2010 study, uh, but that was declined and there would have been a great deal of information that could have been ascertained about who were the populations who were at risk. Another important finding was that um, uh, in a subsequent analysis we, that was partly funded by the Royal Commission, we examined those people um, uh, who had progressed uh, from, from having suicidal ideation in 2010 to attempting suicide. Um, and uh, they had all gone from, if, the, if they hadn't been having, uh, having a disorder in 2010, they all had progressed to a full diagnosis by 2015. So it shows that even the 10% who don't have a psychiatric diagnosis have significant symptoms. If you follow them long enough, that disorder emerges. So I, I think uh, psychiatric um, disorder uh, absolutely underpins uh, the risk of suicide. Now, while there are many other risk factors, psychiatric disorder amplifies those other risk factors. Yes, and, and you mentioned, mentioned their progression um, to psychiatric disorder. Could, would you be able to speak very briefly about subclinical markers to the extent that you can? Yes, subclinical disorder is a very important issue. There's a tendency by clinicians to minimise 
people who have symptoms that don't reach a diagnostic threshold. And we've done a variety of research now in these longitudinal studies showing that these are populations at high risk. For example, somebody who has symptoms prior to deployment, they are the individuals who are at particular risk in the longer term of the going on to develop all disorder. Yes, thank you. And tell me, do you see any relationship between physical health conditions, uh, and chronic pain and the like, and uh, a psychiatric disorder that can uh, pose a risk factor? Uh, look, I think the relationship between physical comorbidities and psychiatric disorders is grossly neglected. Um, we have published and shown from the data sets that I referred to the very strong relationship between physical symptoms, pain, gastrointestinal distress, irritable bowel, chronic pain, injuries, and psychiatric morbidity. And to, to imagine that they can be separated in a health service fails to recognise that they, they're critically interlinked. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor McFarlane. Um, on the topic of separation, can, can we move to this issue? And that is health care and defence and then health care in the broader Australian community. Um, uh, I assume that that can't be considered in a vacuum. Um, can you speak to the, the relationship between the two and whether there are any stressors in that broader system that impact the delivery of healthcare and defence and, and through DVA? Um, look, I think one of the, uh, the challenges uh, in understanding the comorbidity and the link between uh, physical symptoms and psychiatric disorders, which I think is where your question was going, is that primary care plays an absolutely central role in mental health care. And to imagine that people with a psychiatric disorder go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist is not what happens. The bulk of mental health care is provided by medical officers uh, in, the, in defence and by general practitioners in the civilian community. Why, why, why do you say that? Well, that's what the evidence shows. Yes. And it's because often people primarily initially complain of their physical symptoms, uh, not realising that uh, often they uh, a manifestation of their psychological distress. For example, people with panic disorder will often believe they're having a heart attack or they'll have abdominal pain, which will lead them to being referred to gastroenterologists. Um, whereas in reality, it's the underlying psychophysiological disturbance of panic disorder that underpins those symptoms. Yes. Tell me, do you have any view as to whether um, stigma plays a role in that as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, I think there is uh, uh, a great deal of... Uh, stigma if you have a big sign over a door which says mental health uh, in contrast to uh, going to see the general practitioner which uh, particularly on a military base will discourage defence members to go down the mental health care path and uh, I could give many examples where um, allowing indirect pathways into care um, is absolutely critical to people with psychiatric disorders being identified and, and treated. Yes, thank you. Um, and a, a, as, as to stigma and um, seeking health care, uh, health care in defence, do you see any uh, connection to the medical classification system or no? I think in any occupational setting, um, people who are suffering from health conditions know that if their disability or their impairment becomes known to command or to the health service, they are at significant risk of... Um, not being able to, for example, deploy. Um, and uh, I think that is a significant disincentive for people seeking early treatment uh, and sometimes appropriate care. Um, I think the other issue is that there is a um, whole culture of mental toughness, which is obviously very important in a, in a defence force, that can sometimes lead to people who complain of injury or distress being uh, stigmatised. Yes. And there's a long history of that in the military. Yes. Tell me, do you have a view as to whether or not that causes um, serving members to seek health care outside the defence system? Uh, I think there's considerable evidence that um, defence members will choose that path uh, for the f uh, very reasons you suggest. Of it's, they don't want their command structure to know of their um, symptoms um, and distress. And, uh, and I think that's uh, an inevitable consequence of, of the MEC classification system. But clearly the MEC classification system is equally important because people who are unwell should not deploy and there are examples where they have deployed and it's caused considerable difficulties. Yes. Um, and when, when it comes to defence members seeking healthcare outside the defence environment, um, do, do you have a view as to whether 
civilian health professionals and the, the general civilian healthcare system is well equipped to meet the needs of serving and ex-serving defence nurses? Um, look, in, in summary, I do not believe that the um, community health services in Australia and the mental health services are equipped to deal with defence members for various reasons. Uh, first of all, um, as has been shown by the productivity inquiry into the mental health system, there was also the Royal Commission into the Victorian mental health system, uh, and they show that these systems are, are really very deficient. My own experience has been very much in the area of uh, the victims of accidents and uh, victims of uh, crime, uh, police and other emergency service personnel, and there is really not an equipped workforce um, for treating those domains. And if I can just hold up one little graph. To, on Monday this week, there was a, uh, a, a, an article published in the MJ in Insights, which is a, um, a summary of information in the um, uh, Medical Journal of Australia. And this graph shows how the level of mental health funding in Australia is um, lower now than it has been since 1992. And this is despite all the mental health strategies, all the suicide prevention programs that the federal government has put in place. The percentage of the, of the Australian health budget uh, for mental health has declined to somewhere in the order of 7% when the impairment from mental health um, is about 15% of the burden of disease. And that's what a defence member will meet when they try and get health care in the civilian community. Yes, thank you. I should say, Commissioners, we'll arrange to obtain a copy of that and supply it to, to my friends as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no, I, I informed the fact it's document three on the tender list. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, now, Professor McFarlane, in that, those circumstances, how, how might that issue be addressed? Is there a question of... Is it, uh, military medical expertise? Is, does military um, cultural competency play a role? Are you able to speak to those issues? Um, look, I think uh, there are a number of ways that this could be addressed. The first one is to address the competency of the workforce within defence and the Dunt Review um, uh, into mental health and defence in 2010 recommended the upskilling of the um, psychologists in the Defence Force because many of them do not have clinical qualifications and therefore are not optimally competent to treat psychiatric disorders. Uh, the University of Adelaide set up a Master in Defence Psychology program to address that issue uh, based on the Dunt Report recommendations. Defence uh, had one intake, provide one take, intake of uh, psychologists for that program and then allowed it to lapse. So uh, I think Defence hasn't paid attention to the qualifications of its workforce. In the broader community, uh, I think it's a major challenge. I think the, uh, and having taught medical students and uh, uh, psychiatry trainees, there is not sufficient training in these domains in most curricula. Uh, and I think it requires um, a particular qualifications. And I think the only way that Defence and DVA can realistically de deal with this is to actually develop its own health services, which used to exist with the repatriation hospitals, which were venues where that training is provided. So we've actually gone backwards. Yes, yes, and I, and I might get you to uh, touch on that in, in, in a little more detail in due course. Um, but of course, we do have some good, good centres for the treatment of, of, of veterans within the community. There's the National Centre for Veterans Healthcare, um, the, the Jamie Larkham Centre, and then practitioners that we've heard from, like Go To Health. Um, that they all appear to do good work. Is there a question of linking up or what is the issue that arises? Well, look, I think the first issue about those centres is um, in isolation, they look like important resources and there's some very good work done by those uh, um, particular centres. However, they're not part of a system of care. Um, and um, I think the way in which they also are related to the other service providers in their regions is a, an area where there are many problems. I mean, I know that particularly with the Jamie Larkin Centre because I, in South Australia there's another network of private practitioners who are constantly highlighting the difficulties of veterans accessing the Jamie Larkin Centre so that you can have these pockets but unless you have a system of care, uh, they ultimately don't have a, a major impact on the general 
accessibility of services for veterans. For and, and, and tell me, what is the relevance of that system of care? Is, is it related to continuity of care? Is it related to access, both of those, and anything else? Uh, I think it's related to both uh, access and quality of care, but also opportunities for training um, and also for addressing the, the issue that there are, I think one of the things that the system currently doesn't uh, assess or understand is that often there is a progression of disorder. There are people, for example, with post-traumatic stress disorder who will respond well to fairly um, simple evidence-based treatments, but it needs to be recognised as a very significant cohort who've got chronic and more enduring conditions, and the system at present doesn't have mechanisms for identifying those people and then referring them into networks which will deal with the issue of treatment resistance. And I think when dealing with the issue of suicide, those people with the chronic and severe disorders who are the highest risk group. And, and I think we need to do a lot more work trying to understand those progressions, and that can only be done if you actually have well-structured um, specialist uh, uh, treatment teams that are part of a national network. Yes, um, and, and I'll, I'll come, to, come to that again, as I said, in due course, but uh, the, turning to the question of healthcare and defence that you addressed a moment ago, we, we have heard some evidence, in, certainly in this um, hearing block, about the relevance of clinical governance to the delivery of, of healthcare in defence um, and, and uh, various elements of clinical governance. If I could just address each of those and perhaps you can comment on them. Um, the first element of uh, leadership in clinical governance. Are, are you able to comment on the significance of leadership in the delivery of healthcare outcomes? Uh, look, I think clinical governance is a challenging and important issue and I think it's very important to separate administrative governance from the governance of clinical service outcomes. Yes. Uh, and Defence you know, talks about having quality improvement programs but they're often systems that you use in all sorts of settings like manufacturing motor cars and they don't really get to the issue of the quality of healthcare delivery and you need senior clinicians um, driving um, uh, quality improvement systems in healthcare that are based around collecting information about uh, the outcomes of treatment. You need to have case reviews. You need to have systems for identifying and investigating adverse outcomes and you need independent reviews. And that is essentially something that can only be done by senior clinicians. The problem for defence that it doesn't and well, until recently, for example, in mental health, hasn't had full-time psychiatrists, um, unlike equivalent defence forces like the Canadians or the Dutch. Um, and uh, I think that has meant that there actually haven't been senior clinicians who uh, are sufficiently ranked to speak to senior leaders um, who can equally critique a system and uh, without um, risk of being um, uh, sidelined. Yes, and tell me, we have heard evidence earlier in this commission from a Dr Jacqueline Drew who's spoken about the difference between leaders having generic management skills and having management skills with a focus on health outcomes. Is that why you say that? Look, I think that is an important issue within administration, but I think there is an issue beyond that, that ultimately clinical services need clinicians driving quality assurance because I think people who are not clinicians don't understand where the errors and the uh, misjudgments lie. You know, it is an area that demands um, uh, clinical expertise. And I think current health bureaucracies have really failed to grasp the significance of that. And there's some very interesting sort of examples in the public domain where bureaucracies have been alerted to major issues and the, the, the bureaucracies haven't responded to the real risks um, that um, clinicians have identified. I understand. Um, and, th and then separately, when you co come to leadership, say middle, middle leadership in, in command, is that where you would place that um, leadership with a, a, a health outcomes focus for, for those who are not clinicians but nonetheless need to have a, a mind towards issues? Yes, and I think it is the, 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 the openness to hear adverse outcomes because I think one of the, my experiences is that um, if you speak up about adverse outcomes, and I've done this in various domains, um, uh, you get positively attacked, despite 
you would think that being the primary responsibility of a clinician is to identify where errors happen in a healthcare system mm -hmm. and how you might want to uh, lead the change. Yes, yeah, so we've, we've heard evidence too of um, a restorative just culture. Are you familiar with that term? Yes. Um, and th that, um, as I understand it, is, is about openness when it comes to addressing problems and, and, and dealing with issues as they arise. Do you see a, a, a difficulty, a cultural difficulty, in having a restorative cult just cultural approach in an authoritative um, setting such as defence? Uh, well, look, I think there are real challenges. My experiences have been where ministers have asked to see me and um, the heads of health, uh, Joint Health Command have actively tried to stop the minister uh, receiving information from me. And I've also been... Uh, so, objection. The witness isn't responding to the question. The question is about restorative justice processes. Commissioners, I think he might be seeking to respond by way of example. That's right. I'm, um, I'm just going back reading over the question. Do you see a difficulty, a cultural difficulty, in having a restorative just cultural approach in an authoritative setting such as defence? I see the answer as responsive to that. Okay, please. I'll uh, overrule the objection. Um, and, uh, you know, and I would say that that is one of the things that I have found most difficult um, as a clinician working in the defence system is what I would believe was actively trying to help defence address some very real problems. Um, um, but if it is seen somehow to uh, identify areas which the uh, leadership, uh, and it's often the middle leadership in defence, I've got to say that senior, I've had dealings with two CDFs who have been remarkable in their support, who've actually expressed the difficulties they find with the middle level of leadership. So I think a restorative justice system, I think, has considerable limitations because I don't think it is agile enough or flexible enough to, uh, you know, address what challenges often clinicians face in very difficult situations that require sometimes fairly urgent intervention. Yes, but, but, but nonetheless, um, whatever phraseology or, or categorisation one might use to um, address the matter, you, you need to have openness, I take it, and a willingness to confront problems and address them without blame. Is, is, that, is that the heart of what you're saying? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think uh, I've, I've often been impressed by politicians equally who have wanted to understand some of these challenges and the steps to which the bureaucracies will go to um, uh, prevent either the minister being informed or even if the minister directs that they act on specific knowledge, they, they will actively subvert the minister's direction. Yes, um, and, and, and when you, you speak about this, it, I, I take it then that that mindset, i.e. one prepared to confront problems and address them without blame, is something that, not should, be, that should not be limited just to the clinical environment, but should apply to the, the cultural environment of defence. Uh, to the cultural environment, absolutely. Thank you. Um, on, on the, on the re retur returning or continuing the exploration of clinical governance, um, Governance frameworks are obviously a significant issue. We've heard evidence in this Royal Commission um, about the mental health and wellbeing branch that is being developed and some functions being transferred from JHC to that branch. Um, do, do you have any views ab about these moves to, uh, at all and, and that split between clinical and wellness? Um, yes, I think this is a major retrograde step. Uh, I was involved in, in the period from 2000 to 2010 um, in bringing the psychology services in defence into Joint Health Command. Previously they sat within personnel. The, the whole move in Australian health has been to mainstream mental health. I described before how um, mental health is very much delivered through um, general practice and the division between um, uh, mental and physical health is really quite erroneous and misleading me for, for many reasons, including the comorbidities. And I think putting um, uh, mental health and wellbeing into personnel uh, just fails to recognise the 
factual realities of how mental health presents and how it should be managed. Um, and uh, I have been involved in meetings in defence where uh, a number of senior personnel have been very troubled about that move that weren't able to speak up. And I, I think one of the other things that was very troubling about that move was that it's, it is not evidence-based uh, and it's very unclear who was consulted. I sit on a mental health advisory committee for defence, well, it's a mental health and wellbeing advisory committee, and that committee was not provided with information or uh, any indication that this was likely to occur or an opportunity to comment on it until it had, it had commenced. Yes, if, if, if that is the structure that is in place um, to ameliorate the, the issues that you have raised, I take it then that there needs to be a very close working relationship between that branch and JHC on the topic of mental health and wellbeing. Absolutely. And um, that th those issues of health, wellbeing and subclinical and clinical presentations cannot be siloed. Yes, and I think the other real risk, um, look, I think prevention, if it can be put in place, is invaluable, but the evidence that prevention programs work is minimal. If I can just uh, uh, point to two documents for the Royal Commission. Um, there was a paper uh, published by the um, uh, Wellbeing uh, Research Centre at Oxford University, this was a review in 2023, um, which reviewed wellbeing strategies in the workplace and it concluded there was no evidence that these strategies improved worker mental health across multiple employee mental health measures. And similarly, Nature Human Behaviour uh, published a paper um, by Dunn and uh, Falk uh, in 2023 which said there, there, were a very, there, there was a requirement for strong scientific foundations for happening strategies. Um, at, at, but they were completely lacking. So they were really saying that really there's very little evidence these strategies work. The US Defence Department uh, in uh, 2014 had the Institute of Medicine doing a review on this um, and they concluded that often programs are initiated without evidence and they concluded the only thing that they'd found that worked uh, was, was screening for mental health conditions. Yes, thank you. And uh, again, I might com come back to that in the context of the... Um, uh, the approach to healthcare that you raised earlier. Um, but be, before doing so, and just remaining with the topic of governance, um, another area of separation is, of course, defence and DVA. Um, there is being developed a, a joint mental health and wellbeing strategy, which, of course, arose out of the an idea promulgated originally by the, the Productivity Commission back in 2019. Are you familiar with that strategy or have you seen a draft of it? Um, and are you able to comment on it in any way? Uh, look, I'm uh, familiar with its development, but again, that is a, a document that hasn't been... I sit on an advisory committee in Defence on mental health. I sit on one in DVA. Those committees have not been engaged in the development of that strategy. I'm aware that it's uh, progressing um, uh, and I've seen some broad outlines of it, but I, I, I have many concerns uh, about the process um, and particularly its focus on measurable uh, um, endpoints. And, and, and what do you mean by that? Well, I think the critical issue in clinical care and mental health is whether the, the, care, the systems that you have in place uh, achieve their stated aims and one of the things the Productivity Commission highlighted was the lack of clinical outcome measures um, in uh, the care of veterans and defence members and to, to this point nothing has been done to change that despite m being raised on many occasions uh, from by clinicians about the importance of being able to measure whether treatments are working or not. Yes and, and as to the development of the strategy too and the, the involvement of yourself and clinicians more generally, do you, do you have a comment as to whether um, it is important in the development of such strategies to, to seek input and guidance from those who are at the coalface and, and, and treating um, defence members and veterans? Absolutely, and I've had the privilege of being a clinician who treats patients. I've worked in the health system in South Australia. I have have advisory roles at a state level. And, you know, I'm in, and I've also seen the same thing in disaster management where I've uh, been consulted about the design and structure of health services. Um, and I, th I think so often bureau bureaucracies ha have a, 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 a misplaced belief that these strategies have major impacts uh, in the layers below them. 
Um, and I think that they're, they're documents that are filled with good intent, um, but because they're not focused uh, at the primary endpoint of the user, the, 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 the person needing care, I think often they, they lead to very little change or effective care. Yes, thank you. Now, as for strategies and frameworks, and, and on, remaining on the topic of defence and DVA, um, as we understand it, defence has, in answer to a notice, indicated that um, there is not a, a, a joint clinical governance strategy. Do you, as between them, do you have any view on that? Absolutely. Um, look, I think from a broader perspective, and I've, I think I said this in my previous evidence, was that, you know, ultimately, I think one way of providing better quality health care for Australian defence members and veterans is to have one health system that deals with them, uh, that allows continuity, that would allow um, joint clinical governance structures, it would allow uh, clear clinical endpoints that are shared by the organisations, it would uh, allow uh, a better understanding of the difficulties of transition and the availability of health care, it would create a critical mass of, uh, of, of, of health services and I think um, whilst there are some differences um, in the health services that uh, defence provides, particularly in the deployment setting, uh, I think the similarities are far greater than the differences and I think a system should be developed that uh, has oversight of both systems. Thank you. Now, um, moving to another topic and that is continuous quality improvement and the use of data. You have touched upon that a little bit um, and that the, the way um, each of defence and DVA engage with data, how might, how might that be improved? Can you suggest, make some suggestions? Uh, look, I think the first thing is that the data which um, DVA and Defence hold um, is inadequate. Um, they don't interrogate the data which they do have. And f uh, for example, the 2010 Mental Health Prevalence Study and the 2015 Transition and Wellbeing Research Pro Program had a great deal of information uh, about pathways to care and treatment utilisation um, that could have informed... Um, uh, the structure and the outreach of health services. Um, trying to engage with both Defence and DVA about the interrogation of that data was extraordinarily difficult. Um, and it's because essentially um, these organisations have lost, particularly DVA, has lost uh, a body of professional knowledge and expertise um, of, uh, of epidemiologists and health researchers. So, um, you know, I think if you were uh, going to um, have, have, have uh, better uh, governance structures, data is absolutely the core of it. Yes. And as, as for engagement with researchers, how, how do you suggest in practice that might be improved? Well, I think, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 I think Australia has gone backwards since about 2010. Um, I think we had um, some very... Uh, uh, effective programs and relationships um, uh, in Australia. For example, um, the uh, what is now called Phoenix Australia was originally called the National Centre for, for War-Related PTSD. That was set up as an advisory uh, organisation for uh, defence, uh, well, particularly DVA, but also defence. Um, and, um, uh, and they also uh, had... Um, a, a research capacity. Defence then created the Centre of Military and Veterans Health, which had a research capacity. Interestingly, since 2010, though the relationships between defence um, and DVA and, and the academic community, I think, has become problematic because they didn't like the findings that were being found. So that I think, it, 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 and one of the reasons is that there weren't people who were researchers and understood the knowledge base and the value of the knowledge base within those bureaucracies. Yes, um, and again, I'll return to that issue. Um, but, but prior to doing so, the, you, you mentioned earlier the, the importance, well, let, let me say this, how, how important is it when it comes to monitoring and evaluating health outcomes, both for defence and DVA, are you able to, to say how that might be improved? Uh, well, I think um, one way, for example, that the Canadians have addressed this issue is that everybody who presents um, with to their mental health services has a three-hour assessment. 
um, and then they have a, a, a range of assessment tools that are then subsequently administered to the people within their system. So that they, they do map and identify their outcomes uh, and have clinical pathways to address people who are not progressing through treatment as would be appropriate. And I think these are the sorts of measures that should be put in place. Yes, and, and how does that fit in with the, the notion of screening tools and, and uh, are there ways to avoid, are there problems that can arise from screening and what might they be? Well, I, I, I would say that one of the uh, programs which the Australian Defence Force has put in place, which has had some very significant beneficial effects, is their screening programs. Now, look, there are potential problems with screening because people will under-declare symptoms. But uh, I think one of the reasons why there's been a greater uptake of health care mental health care in the Defence Force in Australia is because of the screening programs. It familiarises defence members with these symptoms. So even if they don't tick the box correctly, in their own mind, they're running through the checklist. Equally, screening in Australia is not just filling in a questionnaire. You actually talk to a mental health professional. And I think that has undone some of the stigma about seeking mental health care. So I think Defence has done a very good job in having those programs in place. There are problems that need to always be um, uh, addressed in screening programs, but I think their ultimate uh, effect has been a benefit in the Australian Defence Force. Thank you. Um, now, if we move to another topic, and we have touched on this a little, um, and, and that is the, the quality of the health care that is provided. Now, as we know, some 90, 95% of, of health care services provided by a third party contractor and has been for quite some time. Um, are you able to, to comment on the um, the adequacy of clinical performance and, and, and oversight? Um, well, look, I can comment on that uh, through my uh, roles within jo Joint Health Command on these advisory committees. The other way that I can comment on that more directly was that in 2017 I was one of five people um, who uh, was involved in doing the review of Special Forces Health Command. Um, and that was one of the matters that we very specifically addressed. Uh, and I think we might identified many deficiencies in the quality of um, that contract of health care. I've also been involved in uh, coronial inquests um, that have been an opportunity to uh, look at how that system has worked in specific cases and found many significant deficiencies. Um, in what way? Uh, well, I think the first issue is about the accessibility of care, that there are significant delays often. I think the second issue is the quality of the practitioners. Now, there's some extremely good practitioners, but I certainly know that because of the fee structure of the contracted services, many senior and highly experienced clinicians who are very devoted to defence have had to opt out of that system simply because of the inadequate um, uh, uh, remuneration. Um, so, uh, and I think the other issue is that it's very much a, 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 a contracted system of health providers rather than actual systems of care. It doesn't look at the issue of the uh, gr graded needs for services because of the lack of clinical coordination. Okay, thank you. Um, and it, again, when it, it comes to uh, the, the, um, the quality of clinical care, uh, the, the, health, the health practitioners are as good as the broader system from which they're drawn. I don't wish to be pejorative in respect of any of those practitioners, but there, there are, we've heard about pressures, work pressures, um, work, work skill shortages, I should say. Um, what, what measures might be improved, might be put in place to improve cultural competency, med medical competency? Uh, amongst practitioners? Well, I think that's uh, a, a fundamentally important issue. And I, th I don't think it can be assumed that that system has the same quality of care as the broader Australian health system, because essentially they contract the people who are willing to seek, accept the lowest fees and they're not likely to be the busiest practitioners. So, you know, I think there might be some questions about the general quality of care. Um, look, I think what might, how could you address this? Well, um, the simplest thing is to introduce a fee structure which is competitive. Um, but ultimately, I think what needs to happen is the system is of care is contracted, where you are not simply um, buying individual services, you're actually 
uh, engaging with health systems. The problem is that those health systems really don't exist in the broader community, and I think that's one of the uh, false assumptions um, that you can contract health ser services because I think often they don't exist with adequate quality or, uh, uh, or, or, or levels of competence. And, 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 and I think the issue is that it probably is going to be necessary for at least some health services to be reconfigured by the government and for the government to take responsibility. Because I think one of the other things that's really been lost with the um, outsourcing of a garrison health care is the role of the medical officer as being critical to the morale of a unit and linking leadership um, uh, to the welfare of defence members. And I think there are other uh, witnesses who have presented some excellent evidence about that uh, to the Royal Commission. Medical officers are a lot more than doctors. Uh, they play a critical role in the command structure um, and uh, in communicating matters to leadership in ways that get around some of the hierarchical leadership structures in defence. Thank you. Um, are you able to speak, Fez, Professor McFarlane, on the, you, you provide your general assessment of mental health care for veterans in the, the DVA system and what might be the main areas of success or, or inadequacy? Um, look, I think uh, it, there were some very good programs established by the National Centre for PTSD at Phoenix, which is the inpatient programs. The trouble is that they have largely been neglected. I think Open Arms is a service um, which has had many difficulties over the years, but I think progressively that's uh, a service that can exist and uh, and provide support and services, but it's very, it's, it has very limited area in the more severe ends of the spectrum uh, of mental health disorders, and that's really what's uh, lacking more generally. And I think one of the telling statistics um, is uh, that all in the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare report, the fact that um, uh, of uh, defend, uh, veterans who committed suicide, um, uh, that only one third of them were actually in contact with DVA health services, tells you the lack of availability or accessibility. I mean, another really important issue about the people who did ta tragically take their lives was that they, it was recognised that 60% of them had been prescribed a medication within the last year, but only 10% had any medication in their blood at the time of, of suicides. And it tells you there's been a very significant disengagement of those people from the service. And a, ser a service that is dealing with the more severely ill is a service that will have a, a very active outreach program. And they are the sort of services that just don't exist at the present time. I, I certainly know them in the USBA system, but we just have, have never given those sorts of thing, things a thought. And it, and it also astounds me that DVA actually haven't read the AIHW report, because actually I wrote a document for them about it, and addressed that question. Well, who are these people? Why aren't people using our system? Yes, and when you say an active outreach program, what would that look like? Well, it means that um, you should have a system that can identify people who are in crisis, in high-risk circumstances, and, and you create uh, a system of care which is not just about mental health care, it's about uh, an evaluation of their social circumstances um, and providing a, a whole range of services that go beyond the, their immediate mental health needs. Thank you. And tell me, are you able to indicate what role preventative health and wellness might play in DVA's approach to veteran health care and whether that could be improved in any way? Uh, well, obviously that has become a, a focus, but as I already stated, um, you know, the evidence that um, prevention works um, is, is, is very limited. And, for example, there was a recent pu publication on all the suicide prevention programs uh, that have been instituted in Australia more generally in the community, and it was arguing that there's been very little evidence that any of them have had any impact. And I think that's a real challenge for this Royal Commission because there's no point in recommending interventions or preventative systems without any real life evidence that they actually make a difference. The one thing that we know makes a difference is if you provide good quality mental health care and we know that mental health is in a crisis in Australia and that's something that we absolutely um, uh, need to address and um, uh, you know just again I, I find it perplexing um, that, that the available information that highlights these issues hasn't been interrogated. Thank you. Um, uh, and as to the uh, continuity of care between defence and DVA and how health care is provided, um, are, are there challenges that arise in, in, in transition, in the movement from one to another, and how might 
If there are, what are they and how might it be improved? Uh, I, and I'm sure that the Royal Commission is aware of the Productivity Commission's um, conclusions about that issue and I don't need to restate them. It is obviously the critical issue in my personal view is that's one of the strongest arguments for having the same healthcare system. Um, uh, I yesterday was had to sit in on the assessment of a patient who'd been a Defence Force member who'd M might I... The feed can come back on now. Y yes, it can. Thank you. Um, might, might I take that opportunity then to, to move to another topic? And, and that is the, 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 the quality of treatments for um, some of the most prevalent mental health conditions that you've indicated earlier. Um, are, are you able to comment on that and, and po the possibility of the use of alternative treatments in, in mental health conditions? Uh, I did uh, make a submission about treatment services um, uh, uh, to the Royal Commission and I summarised many of those issues. The evidence is that uh, a minority of people who receive mental health care get evidence-based health care um, in the general health system and uh, I think the quality of care is a, a, an area of critical importance equally addressing, as I stated before, people who don't respond to the initial evidence-based treatments need to be identified and referred to specialist services deal, that deal with treatment resistance. So I think clinical outcomes are not adequately addressed currently. Thank you. Um, moving then to a, a, another topic, and that, that is the environment for the delivery of care. Of course, having a safe environment is a critical aspect of good clinical governance. <coughs> Excuse me. You, is there anything that you might have to, to say in relation to that topic? Um, I think um, the availability of services um, is a, a critical issue. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure the, the, the extent to which your question takes us, but um, I, you know, I highlighted the, um, the accessibility issue is, is of primary importance. The other one is not to uh, make it easily identifiable which service somebody is seeking. So I think, you know, and uh, I think they are, they are critical issues. Yes, and it's that, 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 that latter point, of if, if we could explore that a little, um, what do you say about that in relation to the environment for the delivery of care? Um, well, I think it's one of the reasons why you should have any mental health service um, located with uh, general health services because people can't then be identified which clinical service they're seeking care from. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and then yet, yet a further aspect of, of uh, the delivery of, of high quality safe health care is the, the quality of the partnership with the, the patient 
um, themselves. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, and related to that is the quality of the information about the healthcare being delivered and that they are receiving. Yes. We accept that. And then, and, and that is, of course, health literacy. Yes. Uh, and do you, do you accept that health literacy depends upon, you know, sufficient cognitive and social skills to uh, that are sufficient to influence an, uh, an individual's motivation and capacity to access and understand information? Yes. And I think the Australian Defence Force should be congratulated on a number of the mental health literacy programs that they've put in place. And I think the greater uptake of care by uh, serving members is a consequence of those programs. Thank you. Um, and do, do, you, do you have a view that particular attention needs to be paid to the, the quality of health literacy, particularly for those who are in crisis and, and distress? And, and what would you say about that? Um, well, I think one of the really challenging issues is self-stigma um, because stigma programs generally appear to have had a beneficial effect. The interesting thing is that the people who are suffering from symptoms, significant symptoms or in a state of distress often uh, have a greater perception of stigma or of, uh, anticipation of stigma than um, uh, their colleagues who are not unwell. So I think the addressing self-stigma is, is a very important issue. I think one of the other things is to make sure that the health system paradoxically doesn't increase stigma. Uh, and, and that has sometimes been found to occur. I think another one, another issue here is that um, I, I've certain, there's certainly a literature and discussion around this, is that some of the wellness strategies that focus on positive <coughs> thinking paradoxically are creating new forms of stigma because they are a way of essentially blaming people by saying, well, you're not resilient enough, uh, you know, and uh, there's, there's a weakness in you because you're having negative thoughts. Uh, and, and, and some... Uh, uh, patient advocacy groups have talked about toxic positivity being a real risk as a consequence of wellness programs. Yes, and, and, and how might that that um, be addressed, and, and the the issue of self stigma be addressed? Um, look, I think self stigma is a very challenging um, question that um, I think is an area which we really don't know as much about as we should. And I think one of the reasons why self stigma is particularly challenging in the defence environment is because the very skills that make somebody a good soldier um, are people's ability to ignore their own suffering um, and fear and distress um, and focus on the task. Um, and, uh, and, and so the very things that often are part of the, the nature or the character of people in the Defence Force uh, are, are the very drivers of self-stigma. And, and I think it's a challenging question how to deal with that one. Thank you. Um, now, at, at various points in time you, 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 throughout this examination, you, you've spoken about the, the need to outsource a, a system of care as opposed to individual care, and you've also um, spoken in the context of um, research, for example. Do, 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 should that be joined up? How, what do you propose as an alternative model um, in the delivery of health care? Um, well... Uh, look, I, 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 that's a very challenging question. In that submission that I made, I did um, uh, set out um, some suggestions. Um, look, I, I think one of the the, the, the issues is that you, you can defence and DVA would never be able to provide the entire health care uh, for defence and DVA members. They they do need the services of the civilian community. The issue is to identify the high uh, demand areas. Um, and uh, I think to develop um, expertise and uh, clinical pathways in those areas. Clearly, you know, common mental health conditions like depression and post-traumatic stress disorder are one. The other one is uh, musculoskeletal injuries and pain. Um, and often those comorbidities go together um, so that I think one of the first steps would be to improve the intake procedures and then uh, have a... Um, clinical pathway for those uh, high prevalence disorders. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Professor McFarlane, in, in the course of this hearing block, Major General Jeff Singleman, who's a commander of Special Forces, gave some evidence in, in, in which he suggested a possible way forward to the National Independent Internationally Benchmarked Centre of Excellence. Are you familiar with that evidence? Yes. And do you have any comment in, that, that you might make in relation to it? 
Um, I think uh, General Singleman's evidence is extremely important because he is an individual who has uh, obviously experienced defence life in its, uh, uh, obviously as a, a frontline operator, um, but he's also had experience in command of observing how the system does and doesn't deal um, with the health needs of people for whom he's cared for. And equally, he's had the experience of trying to find information that will assist him. And um, I think him pointing to the importance of a national centre um, of excellence is, is um, ultimately, I think, the only real solution to many of the matters that, 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 that I've been summarising and focusing on this morning. And the tragedy is that Australia was heading in that direction, but for various reasons, um, those efforts were undermined. Um, heading in that direction in, 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 what, in how, how so? Well, there was the you know, uh, National Centre for War-Related PTSD, um, there was the Centre of Military and Veterans Health, um, and there were some academic consortia that had been created. And ultimately, I think the bureaucracies felt that they'd lost control of the narrative. And particularly when the um, Transition and Wellbeing Research Program results came out, they very actively tried to not address them. Uh, and you know, one piece of evidence for that would be to look at the press release that came out about the uh, uh, well, uh, tr uh, transition Wellbeing Research Program uh, and the lack of information in it. Yes. Now, just just when it comes to centres of excellence and and and, and the the question of research, what what role, if any, do you see for researchers in such centres? <coughs> Look, I think researchers play, <coughs> excuse me, a critical role, and ultimately, I think if you look at the uh, civilian health sectors where you have clinical excellence, where you have clinical academics in leadership roles. So th the health services are constantly engaged with the acquisition and application of knowledge. Um, and uh, I don't think it's actually the idea of having research centres and treatment excellence centres as, as being separate organisations. I think they have to go uh, hand in glove because it means that ultimately your research is then addressing questions that have relevance to the welfare and outcomes of the health of the people you're, you're trying to care for. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Professor McFarlane. Um, Commissioner, is that there the extent of the, the questions I have for Professor McFarlane? You may have some questions arising. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, thank you, Professor McFarlane. Um, it's always good to hear your thoughts. Um, I have a number of questions, but perhaps can I start with um, your suggestion about there needing to be um, a system for defence and DVA. Um, and I'm just wondering what that actually would look like. Because at one stage you talked about having a system and then at another time you talked about having oversight of both systems. So just wanting to understand whether it's actually the delivery or the procurement. Uh, look, I, I think it would be in the domain of procurement. Now, I recognise that it's not something that could be created in uh, a year, probably, but it is actually a, a longer-term project. How how I think that could be done is um, in, in, in council uh, pointed to s some centres in Australia that do provide very good health care. The issue is about how you create a national coordinated network of those centres um, and uh, it's also about um, understanding who are the populations that, that, that you don't get to, or those, those centres don't get to, and how you would structure a, a, a service network often coming out of those already develop, develop, developed networks. Uh, so I think it, it, it's, it doesn't require us to go back to, to scratch and start all over again. I, I think it's actually to recognise that we do have um, assets, but it's the lack of coordination of those assets. And I think that's one of the problems, is that uh, DVA so often is working under uh, Commonwealth procurement legislation that almost puts people in competition against each other rather than allowing collaborations. And that certainly happened in the research domain. The, the DVA would claim that they have uh, developed their research strategy because they can't have uh, preferred providers. Now, that's completely disruptive 
of, of actually building centres of expertise and experience. I mean, these are, to build groups, research groups, for example, um, who have got competence takes a long period of time. Um, and you can't have competitive tendering for that. You need to make a decision that you're going to have groups who are going to be doing this. Um, I think the other thing that is critical in developing a system of care is to understand the complexity of there being Commonwealth purchased services, there being state provided services, and there being privately provided services. And the, the disjunctions uh, between those services, I think, is something that often um, health bureaucracies are very bad at negotiating because they so often see health solely from their own perspective. And I think DVA and Defence are in a position to understand uh, uh, um, and work across those barriers uh, more, more effectively. Uh, and that, that, I think, would be one of the other sort of key oversight issues in, 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 in developing a system of care. It's how, for example, the Jamie Larkin Centre doesn't compete with the private practitioners in South Australia who have also got an inpatient program at the, uh, at the Adelaide Clinic. Ultimately, in fact, I once had a meeting with the South Australian Minister for Mental Health and, and, and Senator Fawcett about the idea of combining the budget for those two services. It's interesting the state and DVA couldn't talk to each other about how they'd do it. I mean, those are the sort of things that I think need to be addressed if you're going to create a system. Thank you. Um, can I ask about the question of mental health screening? Um, one of the issues we're grappling with is in relation to recruits. We know that uh, it's, a, it's a period of um, significant adjustment, often mostly in young people who, who go, uh, you know, they're, they're the bulk of recruits, the 17 to 25 year olds. Um, so they're, at, they're going through a whole process of developmental issues just by virtue of where they're at in their life stage. They go into an environment that's probably entirely different to where they've come from uh, at home. So, and they're subject to a lot of, um, you know, training and rigours, etc. So it's a stressful time at a, at a period of time when they may be vulnerable at any point in time. There is a process of psychological um, testing as part of the recruitment selection process. There's a, a medical assessment. Um, but we also know that there's quite a number of young people who um, develop suicidal ideation or self-harm ideation during that period. Some actually make attempts. There are a number of young people leave in that first 90-day period or, or even the first 12 months. We know um, or we have data that suggests that they're at a higher risk of suicide. So the question is, could or should more be done either in the screening process prior to recruitment or, you know, as part of the recruitment process prior to actually enlistment or in those early enlistment days? Or is it more about um, assuming there's going to be risk for many and having a better support system? So I'd value your thoughts on that. Uh, look, I think that's an extraordinarily interesting and complicated question because uh, inevitably people will under-report symptoms uh, or difficulties at the time of their uh, recruitment assessments. Um, um, and I'm not sure how one gets around that. Um, uh, I, it, actually, I had a woman, uh, 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 Dr Syed, who did a PhD looking on the looking at the childhood antecedents uh, of uh, mental health of members who joined the, the Defence Force using the 2010 uh, prevalence study. Um, and it certainly identified that childhood disorders were significant risk factors for difficulties in the Defence Force. Um, interestingly, um, uh, some childhood trauma exposures actually made people more resilient. And so it's almost like there was a self-selection group. People have been exposed to natural disasters and, uh, and other sorts of challenges in their childhoods may then have chosen the defence career. So, you know, one has to be sort of nuanced in the way you think about it. But the one thing it did show was, you know, that kids who have come from difficult families do struggle sometimes. And I think one of the things to do, probably, and one of the things that she wrote about in her PhD was about how you might identify that there is a subgroup of kids who come into the defence force 
who could benefit from um, uh, assistance in learning emotional regulation strategies. Um, and Dr John Lane, who I think has given evidence to this uh, Royal Commission, who's another PhD student of mine, ran, uh, developed this excellent program which had some very practical strategies for delivering emotional regulation um, learning to, to people. So that I think that's one of the things that could be developed. Now the challenge you're then going to have is in a recruit school where there's this a very strong sort of cultural identity and, and to become one, how do you find these people who need help and not then stigmatise them in those early days of training? So, you know, I think it's not a simple task at all. And I, I, and I think, but the, I think the other issue is that I think, you know, the military does provide a very important role in, you know, offering opportunities to people who've come from difficult family backgrounds. And I think the fact that, you know, the suicide rates are half in the defence force that they are in the general community says something of the benefit of defence as an organisation. And I think people can learn many skills in the defence force. Um, but the issue is how you provide them opportunities to access those skills without becoming stigmatised along the way. And I think I'm not sure that I, I have a simple answer to that one. Uh, well, in some ways I'm pleased to hear that because, as I said, we've been grappling with it. Um, and as you say, the, you look at adverse childhood events and it does, in some way, predict, it is predictive of potential mental health problems later on for some, but not for all. Um, and I think there's some US research that actually suggests that uh, it's not necessarily predictive of a, mm. uh, an adverse outcome in terms of a military career. And can um, I just add one thing? What she did find was that children who had had these terrible childhood experiences and developed an interesting childhood anxiety disorders so the intermediary ver issue was childhood anxiety symptoms. So that, um, you know, I think identifying childhood anxiety symptoms in recruits is probably the, the, the nodal point that you'd want to try and do something about um, particularly. On the, on the screening um, issue, again, the, as you said, Defence has implemented the mental health screening, uh, well, the screening continuum, um, and overall it's been a good thing. Um, there is the, you know, the, the POPs and the RTAPs and then there's the periodic mental health screen um, and uh, a, a commander can request a, a mental health assessment um, if, or screen if, it's, if, if they think it's required. Someone can self-refer. If there's a critical incident, we know there's a critical incident um, response. There are some cohorts that Defence has identified as facing um, potentially increased exposure to trauma. For example, intelligence officers or, you know, rem remote pilots, etc. cetera. Um, again, one of the questions we're grappling with um, is should there be additional um, screens or some other process in those cohorts who potentially are at higher risk through greater exposure um, and whether there's any evidence base to support um, such a, a thought. Um, look, again, uh, evidence that screening works is very difficult, even with things like brow, bowel cancer and breast cancer. To show that those screening programs change mortality is very difficult. So having, having evidence can sometimes be challenging. But I think as soon as you identify those high-risk groups, um, it, it, it's really about the system that you put around them. And I so I think screening is really only one part of a, of a much more general awareness and concern. Um, uh, I think it shouldn't be done too regularly because it becomes too, too sort of uh, easily um, dismissed, I think. One of the things that's critical with screening, though, is that it's done longitudinally. We, we were able to show in our data set it, uh, with uh, of, of people we looked at prior to and following um, deployment to um, Afghanistan, that um, even a symptom shift of two or three points on scales where you'd normally be looking for much larger shifts were predictors of later disorder five years later. So it's actually having a much more um, informed uh, analysis of people's longitudinal trajectories, I think, is what screening programs often miss. The other thing that tragically wasn't analysed properly because the budget was cut in that cohort study, we did a whole lot of measures of 
cognitive functioning using event-related potentials and, and, and their relation to inflammatory mediators. And we were able to show some very interesting shifts in information processing, and this is simply based on me measurement of EEG in relation to specific tasks. Well, you could show there were some shifts in abilities to screen early threat that predicted later symptom development. So the other one that I think Defence really should look at is the use of those sorts of technologies um, because I think they also point to the underlying mechanisms in symptom development, you know, which is about changes in attentional systems. And there are some interventions like um, uh, direct current stimulation and neurofeedback where you can retrain those systems to, to, to uh, um, uh, assist people to return their alert systems, their threat systems back to baseline. And, and, and essentially I think that's what screening should be about. It really is about showing when people begin to escalate and lose their regulation of threat detection, which I think really underpins so much of what goes on within psychiatric disorder. One of my other questions is in relation to um, the issue of having full-time clinicians in the in the defence force. Um, you spoke about, you know, historically there, there there hasn't been a lot of full-time psychiatrists. There's now a few, um, and, and you spoke about the benefit of having full-time clinicians and what they can bring to it. But I wondered whether you had any thoughts about the potential challenges for them as well, because. As full-time ADF members, they they become part of the system. They, you know, they have the the, the defence training, the military training, the military doctrine. Um, does that does that challenge a full-time clinician? <laughs> Look, I think that's a very interesting uh, question. Also, from an ethical perspective, um, you know, in at the time of the Vietnam War, there was a very interesting discussion as to whether the ethical obligation of clinicians was to the organisation that employed them or to the soldier who consulted them as a patient. And, you know, I think you're alluding to the challenge that the clinician who's working full-time in defence could almost become part of the group rather than sustaining their individual capacity to function truly as independent clinicians. I've, I've had some very close friends uh, who are full-time psychiatrists in defence forces uh, and I've really um, been impressed by how they have maintained their independence and, and have, how they have been able to function, uh, often expressing divergent experiences to leadership in their organisations. <coughs> and I think um, they've brought a lot more, <coughs> a lot more by being in uniform full time. Because I think one of the, one of the, the great challenges about being a, a reservist is you, you, you're never seen as part of the organisation. You know, you're seen as being a bit of an idiot when it comes to military procedure and I never knew quite how to fill the paperwork in properly and sometimes didn't salute the right person and, you know, and you can very easily be, be dismissed for not uh, quite knowing the system. So, so that I think, you know, th th those disadvantages are quite considerable if you're trying to come in and out of the system, whereas if you're really in the system, um, you know, I, I think you have a great deal to give. And, and both my, my well, two colleagues, I think, particularly one from Canada and another one from the um, Netherlands, have had also remarkable research careers along the way. So they, they, they've actually sort of sat in other communities apart from the defence community. And I think that probably has allowed them mm. to sustain their independence. Yes, I was just thinking that I think the, the, the network or support system for those individuals is probably very important. Yeah. Um, can I ask about clinical outcome measures? You stressed, you know, for example, that it's uh, apparently absent in what you've seen of the draft mental health and wellbeing strategy, um, but you also talked about essentially needing to look at outcomes to uh, determine when, for example, someone's not responding to first-line treatment and they need to be referred on for specialist treatment. So what does that look like in um, your head in terms of, the clinical outcome measurement that should be being utilised? Um, the, f the first thing is, as I said, it's having a, a very thorough clinical assessment at the beginning. And one of the reasons why that's so important is that we know that clinicians often don't adequately assess patients, so they might not necessarily be treating the right thing. So the first issue is, I think, having 
a, a prescribed structured assessment protocol which is includes structured diagnostic interviews. But equally then, I think there are some self-report measures that, you know, that have been extensively used. We've looked at their performance in the Defence Force, that are, you know, internationally accepted measures like, you know, the, you would know them, PCL, the, you know, the PHQ, et cetera. Uh, and I think you, you have a system where they have to be administered, you know, for example, every 12 sessions or every 10 sessions. And then there is some specific direction that if there hasn't been progression or change uh, or ad adequate symptom uh, re uh, uh, remission, that there is a designated requirement for a decision. Because I think so, much, so often um, therapists have one therapeutic skill they have and they think that if the screwdriver didn't work the first time, you just keep using the screwdriver. You know, you need to actually sometimes think, well, actually, I might need a hammer. Um, and um, the, the other one, um, uh, and, and I think, you know, you, you ask about the strategy. See, I think the strategy should include statements about things like the stage of disease. You know, the staging model is absolutely critical. You know, the way you get treated with early cancer is very difficult, very different from the way you get treated with a recurrence of cancer as against terminal disease. And psychiatric illness is the same. Um, uh, and uh, so that I think you need to have a, a strategy that actively addresses all the different stages of progression and how you addre address the points of progression. And, and, and the other, see, the other one is that I think the, the, the strategies, what, what they don't do is actually to really answer the question about who are the patients who these systems deal with. Uh, look, I know I got into trouble by giving a specific example yesterday, but uh, about what I saw yesterday. But um, um, th th what I find intriguing is, uh, look, I did a did a I was involved in a um, uh, uh, an inquiry for the, for the Western Australian Ambulance Service into suicide, and one of the suicides um, was a defence member, and the only reason I found that out was because th the, pa the the photograph of following this person's death. Uh, um, actually had her, a photograph of her being held by her brother holding her defence uniform. Now, you can see the health service that this person probably should have been using at the time was the health services associated with the ambulance service. So there are reasons why defence members may not want to use the, the veteran health service. They may have had a life outside defence that leads them into other... Um, areas of, of, of health utilisation. And see, I think DVA needs to find out, you know, the, 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 who are the cohort of people who absolutely should be using our services? How many of those people are able to access and use those services? And, and, and you know, it's a bit like the, the people who have been identified at the Institute of Health and Welfare have committed suicide. How many of those people, for example, were medically discharged with a known disability, how many of them had applied for a pension, had or had not been given it, or how many of them had had other intercurrent sort of careers that may have accounted for their suicides? And the point is you can't design a health service until you actually know where people sit in these different brackets of need. So um, I've got a bit away from the question, but, you know, I think with, with, a, with, a, with a health strategy, you absolutely understand, understand, need to understand the nuances of the populations that you're dealing with. And I think nobody's ever sat back and really asked those questions. And, and, and look, the point is DVA could do it. But the point is, and I've you know, occasionally tried to say, you need to find these things out. But the, and unless you're you know, got somebody who comes from a clinical background, the, I don't think the nuances quite mean anything. Ask you, you, you made a comment about the NEC system and the challenges that people tend to hide, um, potentially hide their symptoms because they have a fear of being downgraded, they want to be deployable. Um, but on the other hand, you also said it's really important to have a MEC system because it's important that people who aren't fit aren't actually deployed. Is there a way to improve on the current system? Because there's a real tension there, obviously. Look, I think that's a, an extraordinarily difficult question and there's no um, simple answer. But when I was involved in doing this review of the Special Forces Health Command's health service, um, you know, one of the things that I found really difficult was the, uh, I think it was uh, um, uh, two CDA, it was 
the, the, their motto, their battalion motto was a commando forever. Now, you see, you, can't, you can never be a commando forever. I mean, it's a bit like saying, I'm going to join the AF, I'm going to come play for the Sydney Swans, I'm going to be there playing when I'm 65. I mean, you'd think you're a lunatic if you said that. I mean, I think one of the critical things is to try and teach defence members something about the possible duration of their career in particular roles. And, and, and it's almost about how you then allow people to let themselves become part of the mech system. You know, the mech system is, is there for, for a good reason. You, you don't want to be deployed to then be to return from deployment because your, your mates and your colleagues know you're not up to the job. You, you know, and so that I think there's a whole education system that, that uh, about self-awareness and having proper sense of career progression. And uh, another issue, I think, with particularly with the special forces, I, I you know, they've removed military pensions. I think they should bring back the military pension schemes so that if you're in those very, very high risk areas, that you know you can actually say, I've reached a point where I know I can't do any more and you can go out without a financial disadvantage because the, the financial disadvantage of not deploying is very significant. So there's a real financial incentive. So I think if you could take that financial incentive away um, and, and, and look, you, you could see, I think actuarially, you could probably map the pr predicted career of a, of a special forces soldier. Uh, and, I, and there are all sorts of ways I think you could do that physiologically as well. Um, and I think that, that would be a way of sort of augmenting the mech system so you don't actually get the person to finally break. You, you try and pick them when they're sort of one deployment away from and say, okay, let's, let's, let's get you to do something else now. Just have a, a two um, last questions, and I'll, I know I'm taking up most of the time, but um, you, you, you talked about wellness programs and, and to some extent saying um, there's not a lot of evidence for them um, making a big difference, etc. But I guess you, in speaking about them, you were made references to strategies about improving happy, happiness, kind of positive psychology type approach um, from what you were saying is what I interpreted. But in my head, a wellness, um, well-being program is about focusing on what really matters. So it, it is more about the person and their sense of purpose and meaning, their values, their connections, being able to actually, you know, address some of the social determinants so that they actually have a, can live a fulfilling and meaningful life. Um, does, if I use that descriptor, does that change your view? No, uh, and that, that's very sad. I mean, but look, the Institute of Medicine really tried to look at that issue, that Oxford um, uh, review that I referred to, tried to look at that issue. You know, the evidence uh, just look isn't there that it really significantly shifts mental health. Now, I can see lots of reasons why helping people develop coping strategies is beneficial. The, f the idea that, that that then pre prevents mental health they're different things, aren't they? They are. They are. And I, and I think, I th see, I think you've got to, at, at the base of it all, accept that people's mental health is at risk because of the very job that they're doing. And it doesn't matter, you know, what you do, sometimes you've got to accept that that's the reality. And it's how you, you try and minimise that damage. And, 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 and look, I think giving people strategies for self-management of symptoms, well, there are all sorts of reasons why those are good ideas, but let's not do it if there isn't evidence. Because I think the problem is you take the budget away from the people who need the care and put it somewhere where there's not a lot of evidence and then it leaves the healthcare system falling down. Um, just one last question. In relation to um, assessing someone for PTSD and I guess trying to um, discern whether there may be some evidence of exaggeration of, of symptoms or I I even malingering. Um, one of the issues um, that I understand has been put forward is need to look at um, whether or not the person reports sleep disturbance or sexual dysfunction. And I'm just wondering whether that's actually, I mean, is that, is that valid? Is it relevant? Is it evidence-based? No, look, I think that's a very old-fashioned view. Look, if you wanted to really find out whether somebody's malingering or not, the, the psychophysiology of PTSD has been very well characterised. Back in, even in the, 19, the late 1980s, 
there were some physiological tests that had very good specificity and sensitivity for diagnosing PTSD. This is essentially looking at people's reactivity to traumatic cues. Things like startle response you can measure them. You know, I talked about EEG measures. If you really want to get around malingering, that you, you actually introduce physiological measures. Uh, and, look, and look, the other side of it, though, is if you've got a health system that has no malingerer in it, the criteria for, for accessing the health system are too high because you'll exclude about a whole group of people who very legitimately have difficulties. So, you know, I think it's really understanding that you are at risk of being fooled by malingerers, but not having a system that is so rigorous that you're, 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 you're really stigmatising people with very real difficulties and not allowing them early access to care. Thank you. Professor McCann. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Oh, Professor, thanks very much. Can I take you back to one of your earlier questions when you were asked to consider Major General Sengelman's evidence about centres of excellence or um, coordinated medical research in the military health area. We've been exposed, I suppose, to at least three different models of that. One is King's College London's, I think it's the Centre for, mental, for, for Medical mm. Military Research. And as I understand it, it's independently funded through the Forces and Mind Trust and regards itself and behaves as separate from the military. Another is a Canadian model, which is the Canadian Institute for Military and Veteran Health Research, which has about 130 medicos or scientists employed within the military who not only conduct research but also coordinate other research elsewhere in Canada to operate as a sort of hub. Another one we were taken to is the Walter Reed Hospital outside Washington, which combines what you referred to before as the research and treatment functions and is only part of a, a much larger medical hospital um, scheme or system within the States, perhaps a bit like our old repat hospitals. Do you have any views about the desirability of any such model or how a system within Australia would look best? Look, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, the Walter Reed is a very long established organisation and, you know, there have been many sort of distinguished researchers um, and clinical programs come out of that organisation. The King's Group, um, uh, and again, I've watched that organisation emerge and, and develop its research programs and I think they've been a highly effective organisation um, but there have been some uh, tensions between them and the veterans communities. They have been seen to be slightly within the hands of the government. Um, Even though being independently funded? Yes, um, because of some internal relationships um, and roles that they've played. Um, <coughs> But they have, uh, you know, I think delivered um, some very, uh, you know, good quality research programs. I was involved in actually advising the Canadians about setting up their institute. Um, and, you know, I think the advantage of that organisation is that it brings in resources across Canada um, and expertise across the organisation, uh, across multiple organisations. I think the one limitation of that organisation is that the central hub I don't think is quite strong enough. Um, it, it could, you know, because you, you really need to have culture carriers um, in the centre of the organisation as well as allowing those um, external collaborations. And um, so that, you know, look, I think in Australia, um, uh, the, I think the, 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 the answer to your question about, you know, what is the best organisation, I think it really depends on actually looking at, well, what the competencies and skills and the people we have in Australia and how could you best utilise them because uh, you know, th I think it's very difficult to recruit um, people into an organisation if they don't exist already within your community. So I think it, the way I would do it would be to um, uh, uh, you know, identify the, 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 the regions of strength in this country and how to... Um, resource them and, and also, you know, optimise their relationships with government and also with clinical services. And look, there are groups who I couldn't immediately think of. Thanks. 
Also, um, operator, could you please bring up SST.1001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0001.0
um, is an organisation that needs to be driven by knowledge and information uh, and understanding of medical research outcomes of veterans' health um, and needs to be run from a technocratic rather than a bureaucratic perspective. Um, so it's about ensuring that you have a body of information and data that can be properly interrogated and so that policies are driven by knowledge and that you also understand the international literature, you understand the health outcome data and you bring that all together and have a system that is responsive to change and need. And, it, and, and, you, and your service is thought about from the perspective of somebody who enters into that service and how they find their way through the services that you've contracted because that's essentially what's lacking at the present time. You know, the bureaucrats will have a narrative that's not about what's needed. So that's the first thing I do. Um, in defence, um, see, defence does some things really well and some things really badly, and I think that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. Um, I, I, I think um, the one thing that I think would probably make a, a big difference to defence is to re-establish... Um, a, a medical corps um, in uniform um, with full-time um, psychiatrists and clinically trained psychologists in, in, in that organisation and that they have a, a role that's linked to leadership because I've got to say one of the things that um, uh, 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 has been the experience of people who've worked as psychiatrists in the Defence Force, the Defence Force doesn't know how to use psychiatrists. In they think they're people who sit in consulting rooms. Look, my life hasn't been, a lot of my life hasn't been in consulting rooms. It's been trying to help systems understand and use what we know about people and, and mental health. So that I think re really building that sort of relationship between a full-time, in-uniform um, medical corps with leadership uh, would be important. Now, that's going to be expensive, but it, it's critical to do. The, um, the third thing that I would do, um, I don't, can't think of a third one, but I think that's where I'd start. That, that, that's helpful. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you. Miss Wright, any questions? Thank you, Commissioner. I have an application to make. Um, I request leave to very briefly cross-examine the witness on his independence. This arises from matters... Uh, first given in evidence today by the witness. The Commonwealth hasn't been told areas of specific interest in relation to this evidence, but we do understand from the public witness list that he been called as an expert witness and my application hinges on that. So if that understanding is not um, correct, then um, I might hear it from my learned friend. But where an expert opinion is taken in, then independence is plainly a key factor in assessing that evidence. The, an expert would have an overriding duty to the Commission not to omit matters, to state the factual basis. We'll hear basis. from Ms Rubavotti. Do you Sorry. oppose the application? Um, Commissioner, certainly it's the case that uh, Professor McFarlane has been called as an expert witness. It, it, not entirely clear right. the, the basis that gives rise for the, to this application, but but nonetheless, it, if my friend wished to make some uh, ask some questions, going to credit. I, I don't think we can stop her. No. Yes, Ms. Ryan. Yes, question. thank you. To correct, it's absolutely not going to credit. It's going to independence, if it pleases. Thank you, um, Professor McFarlane. Um, may I ask, do you have a clear understanding of the obligations of an expert in giving expert opinions in evidence in a legal proceeding? Absolutely. And thank you. Professor McFarlane, you understand that involves giving opinions based on your specialised psychiatric knowledge and experience, is that correct? That's correct. And... Professor McFarlane, you understand as well, do you, that that involves um, having a very high degree of independence with an overriding duty to assist the Commission? Absolutely. And, Professor
Professor McFarlane, would you agree that references to your personal experiences and your personal feelings, such as um, personally feeling attacked, are not consistent with providing a dispassionate opinion to the Commission? No, because I'm rep rep reporting situations that I think are very important for the Royal Commission to know about uh, in performing my role as an expert, how Defence has dealt with it, because I was being asked questions about um, uh, the use of information and the access to advice. And if the Commission is to explore the use of independent knowledge and information, it needs to know about how the system deals with it. And um, one of the reasons why it's important the Royal Commission understands these issues is because many colleagues have spoken to me about uh, these matters, um, but are too frightened to say things about the, the way that independent advice has been dealt with. Um, and uh, so that one level obviously is based on my experience, but it is not experience which doesn't have a foundation in fact. And it is about the role of an expert and how an expert can perform a role. Well, Professor McFarlane, you'd agree, wouldn't you, that you need to properly state the factual basis for opinions that you're providing? Uh, and I have provided extensive documentation of the matters uh, in the notices to give and the correspondence in the, that's the background to those, and I'm, I'm not sure if you've been provided with those documents, but I have further documentation if you would request it. And the answer that you gave to the, not the last question, the second last question, involved, didn't it, speculation and hearsay? Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand what, uh, when you say speculation and hearsay. Uh, you said that you've spoken to other unnamed colleagues who've expressed views to you. Uh, these are not matters that are speculation. I could give you the specifics if that would assist, but I, I would... Uh, uh, um, I would want to do it in camera. I don't have any further questions, may I please? Anything arising out of that, Ms. Rubavori? Um, no, nothing arising out of that, Commissioner. Um, but just one matter arising out of the, the previous engagement with um, uh, Commissioner Douglas. There was a reference to a John Lane program. Just for clarity, might you name that? Sorry, the. Um, the, the reference to, the jo to Professor John Lane's program. I'll join the STAIRS program. STAIRS program, thank you. Um, and I'm afraid I had one very short factual question I wished to ask Mr McFarlane that I didn't in relation to repatriation hospitals and just whether they treated both serving and ex-serving members. Uh, yes, to my knowledge they did. Thank you. And I, said I, I, I used to attend the repatriation hospital in South Australia, which is where I was aware of that fact. Thank you. No, no, no further questions. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Professor. We want to thank you for your commitment to the welfare of veterans and, and serving members over decades. Um, I want to thank you for the support of the Royal Commission's efforts over the last couple of years and thank you for your evidence today and the amount of preparation you've clearly got into what we said today. Um, if there's no other issues, witness will be excused from his summons to appear. Um, yes, certainly, Commissioner. You're excused from his summons to appear and thank you again. Um, we're slightly behind time, but if there's no other issues, we'll adjourn for morning tea. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 10 a.m.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Ms Longmutter. Good morning, Commissioner Caldas. I call our next witness, the Chief of Army, Lieutenant General Simon Stewart. May he be administered the oath or affirmation. Do you, Simon Stewart, swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, can the operator please display the tender bundle? Uh, commissioners, uh, the tender bundle occupies some three pages, but only the first page are documents that haven't been previously tendered. Uh, I seek to tender the documents in the tender bundle in the manner in which they are described in the list. Thank you. I'll be accepted on that basis then, Ms Longbottom, and allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Lieutenant General, you assumed the role of Chief of Army in July of 2022? Yes, Councillor. And that is one amongst a number of command appointments that you've held during your career? In your statement, you talk in some depth about the concept of command accountability. Yes, Councillor. Um, and you state that you are ultimately accountable for Army's people and culture. That's correct, Councillor. And you'd accept that includes their mental health and well-being. Yes, Councillor. And in turn, your commanders are ultimately accountable for the health, safety, welfare and morale of their people. That's correct. How do you hold your commanders accountable for failures of leadership? Um, there are a range of circumstances, um, but I'll describe it in a systemic sense as to say, I make clear what those command accountabilities are. Um, for example, when I appoint someone to command, um, I articulate their accountabilities and require them to acknowledge those accountabilities to me. Then through the Army operating system and our assessment of risk and performance, uh, I'm able to make judgments uh, about the degree to which those accountabilities have been fulfilled and where there are issues there are a range of uh, avenues available to me. Um, at the most extreme end, it would be to remove an officer from command, and that has certainly occurred on several occasions. Um, there may be other um, sort of graduated uh, responses depending on the, uh, the nature of the issue at hand. General, it might be helpful to examine this issue just in the context of a particular part of your statement where you talk about um, the accountability mechanisms for your command. I might just ask the operator to go to sst.1001.0001.0001 and go to .0017 at paragraph 59. While that's coming up, what would be helpful if you could illustrate for commissioners is, let's take, for example, that particular concept of the accountability of um, your commanders to create positive culture. Uh, in, in terms of these mechanisms that you've set out here, can you identify how you are able to monitor and where as part of that you would hold a commander accountable for failing to create a positive culture. Right, so, Council, can I just confirm my understanding of the question? The first is, how do I monitor? Yes. And the second is, um, how do I then take action if the, the results of that monitoring indicate a failure? Is that correct? That's right. A and the reason I'm asking it is, is this, you've annexed to your statement um, a number of instances where you've held commanders accountable for their individual 
failures. Um, and that's, that is a, that is an easier type of failure to see. Mm. Um, but this Royal Commission is examining culture and failures of positive culture. And it would be helpful to get an understanding of how you as a Chief of Army monitor failures of leadership with respect to positive culture and what you do to hold commanders accountable when they demonstrate that failure of leadership. Okay, thanks for clarifying, Council. Um, could I first um, point I would make is that um, I'd share what I understand or how I define culture in the Australian Army um, because it can often be a, an ill-defined term or concept. Um, I, I define culture in the Australian Army as um, how well we translate our values into words and actions on a daily basis. And, and if I can just stop you there, would you accept in terms of demonstrating positive culture, um, it is measuring rather positive culture. It's not just about um, taking particular actions, for example, reading out what defences, culture and values are, but you actually have to be able to monitor um, outcomes connected to there being a positive culture within, say, a unit. You'd agree with that? Yes, Councillor, I would. And I, the way I would characterise it is to say um, that certainly in an army sense, an army operating system and the risk and performance um, system we have in place to support it, I define it as measures of performance, so things you would do, and then measures of effectiveness, which goes to um, understanding um, you know, whether or not those, um, the things we're doing are being effective and, and actually having the impact that we are seeking to achieve. Yep. Does that make sense? It does. So please go, okay. so having defined then that concept of culture, if you could please go on then in terms of paragraph 59. Right. Uh, certainly. Um, but perhaps if, sorry, there are two, two things I think I need to um, answer. The, the first is how do I see what's happening in the army? And then the second is, how do I then act on that? Precisely. Yep. And in terms of the how you see, am I right to understand that that fits in 59B, your monitoring of execution? Yes. Those are, again, those are things we do. Um, but I, if, if I may, yes. I think the important part here is what is the system that we have in place to, um, through those events, if you like, those gatherings of, of people, um, how do I um, coalesce, gather the information that I need um, and how do I assure confidence in that information, qualitative and quantitative, to uh, allow me to make decisions or to understand what's happening. So I've laid out in, in my statement, as you're aware, the, what the Army operating system is, um, and then risk and performance. And the whole idea of that system is to connect what I am accountable for with what happens in the Army every day uh, in a way that um, allows us to drill down. So there are 16 results that form the um, Army Business Plan, which is a key artefact in the Army operating system. And then in each of those subsystems, people, preparedness and capability, um, there are results that relate to them. For example, result 15 is workplace health and safety. Um, so, and, and then sitting below each of those uh, is an articulation of the risks, an articulation of what we're doing about those risks, and then an assessment as to how effective they are being. 
So um, what's happening in our units and the, the indicators, the data that we are seeking to collect, analyse and understand feeds into, for example, the daily synchronisation briefs, the commander's update briefs and my senior advisory committee, which is entirely focused on risk and performance. And can I just particularly focus on culture for a moment? Yes. What are your principal data sources with respect to managing the effectiveness of culture? Yeah, that's, um, Council, I, I'll describe that and say that they, they are many and varied. They include qualitative and quantitative. So, for example, um, the Inspector General of the uh, ADF's Military Justice Audits are, are a particularly useful independent source. The Can I just stop you there? In terms of those military justice audits, am I right that they are done of a particular unit about every four years? How, f how frequently do those audits happen in a particular unit? I'd, I'd have to confirm that, um, but I, I um, think it is a, around about that sort of two to four year. Two to four years. Uh, okay, yeah. so that's one source of data. What are the other sources of data? Um, so if I can begin, on a daily basis at 8.30 uh, each morning, um, I receive a, a daily update brief. It begins with my chief of staff who goes through the uh, incident management system and what's occurred in the army um, over time, what's being done about it, uh, and that provides me an opportunity to then give any specific direction and guidance. Um, I'm just stopping you there. In terms of that particular data system, what, what types of things will it tell you as indices of culture? Um, it, it includes things such as uh, unacceptable behaviour, for example. It also uh, includes instances where our people have... Um, very positively demonstrated um, that they are living our, our values. So th th there's both ends of the spectrum, if you like. And what's the data source for the latter? Where do, how does that come through? So all of this is generated by reporting in throughout the chain of command. Okay, so it's independent of a system like a DIR, direct incident reports, that there, there might be sort of an anecdotal account of someone who is positively demonstrating army values. Yes, so for example, a, a week ago, there were some soldiers that um, um, lent in and assisted uh, members of the community in a, in a particularly difficult situation. So their chain of command recognised that sought to reinforce the positive display of values and, and brought it to the chain of commands and ultimately to my attention. Uh, so so th those sorts of things, but also incidents, you know, accidents, so anything that, um, you know, where, where someone has been injured or there's an accident, loss of equipment, uh, breach of security, unacceptable behaviour, um, sexual offences, domestic violence, uh, and those those kinds of things. So anything that is um, in accordance with my um, directed commander's critical information requirements. Now, th let's say, for example, um, we uh, we lose someone. Someone dies. Um, we don't we don't wait until the the eight thirty brief. That's an on occurrence report as soon as possible. Okay, so say you get a daily synchro so daily synchronization briefs are part of how you monitor positive culture. The other part is the fortnightly command update briefs. In what respect, if any, do they differ from the daily synchronization briefs focusing specifically on culture? Yeah, so the commander's uh, update brief is a every two weeks it includes my key staff and two star commanders across the army. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity um, to present the data across all aspects of, um, of endeavour. And during that, the chief of staff will present, uh, it's on a, in a spider graph format, each of the key incident reporting categories, which include 
um, the, the, the aspects of health and well-being, and and we look for trends. And will that snapshot include things like levels of unacceptable behaviour? Yes. So, if I might provide an example, Council. Yes, please. Um, so, uh, if I recall, um, on two uh, occasions in the last six months, we've seen uh, on, on that that uh, that graph a spike in um, one one was um, domestic violence reporting um, and another was unacceptable behavior sorry it was uh, suicidal ideation and I asked uh, for some further data and we also sought subject matter expertise from Joint Health Command uh, and also sought to correlate other data sources to create a more informed picture um, to look for areas, well, one, to confirm whether or not there was a trend um, rather than waiting for it to develop into one. Um, that, that's, to be honest, that's about the best we can do in terms of predictive analysis with the data systems and sets we have at the moment. Um, but but then to uh, correlate other data sources to try and inform areas where we can actually uh, take an action um, or to um, to recalibrate the data we're collecting to provide us some insight on those sorts of things. And in terms of that exercise you've just described, are you aware of whether or not that sort of trend analysis is something that was going on before your tenure? Or is it a particular initiative that you've introduced? Uh, the, in that format, that's something that we've introduced. When I began, I made some adjustments to the operating system uh, and to what we call the, the battle rhythm, which is that series of um, r routinely scheduled events, um, because I take in information in, in, you know, obviously different ways. So adjusting the system so that would help me to see um, to the best degree possible what's actually happening in our army um, and then to, to correlate. And then let's use that example you took um, where a couple of weeks ago you saw a, a spike in domestic violence incidents. Was that amongst a particular cohort at a particular location? Well, well that, uh, Councillor, for me, that, that's exactly the purpose of, of seeking that deep dive and further information. So you didn't know that at the time? N no, so what I had was presented was the, the, the raw data, so the number of incidents. So that's that's one useful data source because it points you in, in, a, in a particular direction, uh, but then it's necessary to correlate other data sources, both qualitative and quantitative. So to the, the, the example that you gave uh, in terms of is it a particular unit location demographic, um, but also through the chain of command. And I often use the regimental sergeant major of the army as my command team partner um, to do some ground truthing or sensing through the DRSM network. And if as a result of those endeavours, you identify that there is a particular unit that seems to have a negative culture um, and what steps do you then take to hold command of that unit, unit accountable for that negative culture? Well, um, if I may, Council, the, the first thing I'd say is um, the, the first order of business, the first priority is the health and wellbeing of people that may have been affected. Yes. So that's the first instance. Uh, can we identify them? Can we connect them with the support that they require? Uh, the second um, is is then to see uh, okay, what do we need to do to support that unit um, to understand and then remediate. In other words, uh, where there's a, a failure to live values, um, what are the underlying factors? Uh, and then what, what do we need to do uh, about them? And then the third order of business is, okay, um, 
how do we, how do we understand and apportion accountability for that? If there is a uh, you know an obvious or egregious uh, breach of trust or accountabilities, it, it may be quite cut and dried. In other words, the behaviour of the leader, the commander, the accountable commander, is not in accordance with our values. In other words, they have demonstrated through their words or their behaviours um, a gap between our values and 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 their um, actions and words. Then, as we discussed earlier, there are a range of options available. And they are some of the examples you've given in Annexure C to your statement. Y yes, Council, that's correct. And, and so, and then my question is quite particularly directed to when it is when it is less overt, but nonetheless there's been a failure of leadership with respect to creating positive culture. How do you then hold a leader accountable? There are a range of ways uh, south of removing them from command. Um, th there may be the requirement for, for formal counselling, the development of a plan with their sort of uh, their own sort of closer chain of command. So if we're talking about a unit level here, that would be either brigade commander, commander of the division or forces command or special operations command. Um, that would uh, lay out clearly what the the difference is between what's expected, what's been demonstrated, and then work with that individual to um, to to remedy those behaviours, and then seek to assess whether they have um, wh whether they have improved them sufficiently um, through our our usual reporting. But we might insert some additional steps. Um, and, and, and a timeline to do that. Um, and the, the other way, of course, is to record in their reporting so that when it comes to things like career management boards, the uh, assembled group who are making the assessment of relative merit would take those things into account. And in terms of that, that second aspect, sort of um, recording that for the purposes of decisions being made about promotion and the like, we've, we've heard some evidence about social mastery um, and the importance yes. of commanders having good social mastery. Um, would you accept that a failure to a failure of leadership with respect to positive culture is an example of a failure of social mastery? Yes, Council. So in. It, what is what what are the criteria by which you determine whether or not those kinds of things are recorded so they can be taken into account when that individual comes to be promoted? Why doesn't it happen as a matter of course? So to the just can I just clarify mm. cancel the, the second part of your question in terms of it So I understand you to be saying, there, there, there is a discretion that can be exercised as to whether to record that failure of leadership on the individual's personal record, is that yeah. right? Yes. Um, my question is, what are the criteria by which you determine whether or not to exercise that discretion? Okay, so th that, I, I don't think there's any discretion in terms of uh, capturing in the report the degree to which that officer has fulfilled the requirements or met the, the standards, that, that that is not discretionary. Uh, and the criteria that are covered in the report include um, the, the, the kind of unit climate, which is the sort of local expression of culture that has been created. And these things are measurable in, in different ways. Um, some qualitative, some quantitative. Um, so, so I don't think it's discretionary in terms of capturing the performance because the key aspect of command is leadership. So if there has been that failure of leadership, that information will absolutely be included in the commander's record? That is absolutely the intent, yes. Why do you say intent? Well, because I, I don't personally control what every assessing officer writes, um, but it's very clear it, um, in terms of the, the direction they've been given that that ought to be the case. But you've issued that direction? 
Yes, and so if I may give a yes an, an example, Council, the um, sitting at um, promotion boards, and we've just finished a series um, last month for senior um, leaders, both um, enlisted and commissioned, and. And it's a, it's a change I've observed over a number of years. There is, we have far more detailed discussion and far more focus on how people lead, their capacity to create those kinds of environments, particularly in adversity. Um, and so uh, I'm confident that we are focused on the right characteristics, demonstrated characteristics of our leaders today and those that I'm accountable for appointing to command. Now, can I shift to your own accountabilities for the discharge of your responsibilities? Um, you mentioned before the Army Business Plan. Is that the principal metric by which um, the discharge of your responsibilities for Army people are measured? Um, it, it's one contributor. So my accountabilities are uh, stipulated in my charter letter. Um, that's what I am held to account um, directly to the CDF for. The, the Army business plan uh, is, is a high level description of um, how I intend to go about achieving those accountabilities. And sorry. No, no, go yep. on. And, and then um, sitting uh, below that is a thing called the Army Order. What that does is it provides specific direction and tasking to my subordinate commanders at the two star level across Army and key staff um, with the resources that they, and the prioritisation they have to, to do those tasks. The important bit in terms of me understanding whether or how well we've achieved that is the um, is is our risk and performance system, which is um, which is um, uh, expressed in that army operating system and the, the the groupings of people that come together to analyse, assess, and then provide advice on what changes we need to make to prioritisation resources and the like. And if I could just unpack that a little bit in terms of your accountabilities. Um, so as we've discussed, you've got accountability for culture of yes. your people and for safety and well-being. Yes, yes. Council. Um, they are um, they are accountabilities that encompass a broad range of things. Um, my question is, what are the specific metrics by which the effectiveness of your discharge of those accountabilities are assessed. A and you've mentioned the business plan. We might go to that first of all. Uh, operator, please display def.1356.0001.0159. Um, and turn to the next page. This is no doubt a document with which you are well familiar, General. Um, on my reading of that document, it, it contains activities and priorities. So they're sort of outputs. What I'm interested in understanding is where in a document like that are the outcomes that measure the effectiveness of your performance with respect to culture, health and wellbeing. Yes, thanks, Council. Um, If I can refer back to, I talked about the risk and performance. Yes. So for each result, there is what's called a, a risk bow tie um, that lists um, f for each result what we're seeking to achieve, what the risks are, uh, what the elements of performance are, and then seeks to... Um, it, it outlines what we're doing about um, each of those. Some of them will have very 
clear metrics. So, he, for example, in a um, workplace health and safety, the number of accidents or incidents, etc. cetera. Um, others, when it comes to culture, uh, for example, m may be a mix of quantitative and qualitative. For example, the number of um, unacceptable behaviour instances, the number of unacceptable behaviour uh, substantiations, um, some of the um, uh, qualitative data that you get in the uh, Inspector General of the ADF in military justice audit reports where the, um, the, the, the survey groups, you know, by, by rank group, for example, provide exactly what our people have, have said. So it's the aggregation of a whole range of those measures to try and understand you know, that, that picture. That, sorry if I may, it's, it's just, right. it, it is, uh, we're trying to simplify the system, but this is how it works at the moment. One of my key challenges is there are many data sources um, and at the moment, my staff and the chain of command effectively have to manually bring that together to create insight and to help me and to help uh, accountable commanders see their organisations and see where the risks are in order to make decisions about how they change. But based on what you've said, th there is embedded in terms of your own accountabilities a series of measures that would let the CDF see how effective you are in terms of creating positive culture. That's a fair y assessment? Yes, Council. So through things like the Chief of Service Committee, uh, the, through the, uh, the sort of routinised uh, agenda items that deal with a a whole range of issues. There is data presented, trends discussed, uh, and then in some, in some cases direction given. I think we're a little bit at cross purposes. Mm. I'm specifically talking about those accountability measures you've just spoken about in yes. terms of they are they are embedded in this plan, but also in the documents that underpin it. Um, so there is the capacity to have those outcome-based measures of effectiveness with respect to mm. culture. You'd agree with that? Uh, yes, Council, apologies. No, 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 mm. that's fine. Um, and, and I would take it then you would agree that there, are, there is also the capacity to have those outcome-based measures of the effectiveness of your responsibilities for the health and wellbeing, including mental health and wellbeing of your members. Yes, Council. I, I would add that that's um, an area we are working to develop um, and and do better on. But but can it be done? Um, yes, and and we are doing it. The question in my mind, of course, is um, how can we do it better? Yes, and, and I'll come to that with you a little bit later in terms of the data sources that are available. Um, um, but c can I shift then to your role within the enterprise that is defence? Um, you describe that role as being part of a matrixed organisation, is that correct? Yes, Council. And would another way to be express that to be that defence is a federation of different groups and services but operating under a single enterprise? That's a fair characterisation, Council. Now, as you identify in your statement that the effectiveness of that matrix organisation relies on shared accountabilities to deliver its outcomes. That's correct? Yes, Council. Put another way, there are interdependencies between you and other parts of the organisation to deliver a shared outcome. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, Council. Um, and so in turn, that means to discharge your responsibilities, you're reliant on other parts of the organisation to do their bit. That would be a fair That's assessment. Absolutely correct. Now, uh, I want to ex explore with you how that operates in practice for the purpose of um, identifying the barriers and challenges um, with discharging particular accountabilities for your own people. Uh, and I thought it might be helpful to do that through um, the prism of respite. 
So uh, would it be fair to say that respite is part of your broader responsibilities in taking care of the safety and wellbeing of Army's people? Yes, absolutely, Councillor. And given the matters that you raise in your statement about hollowness of your work face, mm -hmm. force rather, would it be fair to say that respite is a live issue for you as Chief of Army? It absolutely is. Now, following the Afghanistan inquiry, an enterprise respite policy was developed. Are you familiar with that policy? Yes, Councillor. Um, now, that respite policy only applies to warlike service. Am I right to understand that? It was specifically in relation to matters arising from the Afghanistan inquiry, so, so yes. And, and so it has a confined operation in terms of the cohort who will be afforded respite under that policy. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, yes, if I can just make okay. sure that I've understood the question and I'm answering correctly. So the respite policy was to ensure that the risk of um, overuse uh, of any part of the army, in, in my case, um, was something that we were consciously able to uh, see, assess and understand. And the institution of that policy set out the principles uh, by which we would make those assessments. But importantly, it was explicit in needing to consider to consider that in terms of the way that we designed our operations, activities and investments based, sorry, if I may, just one more point. That's particularly important in terms uh, of its intersection with what I describe as hollowness in my statement. But those risks don't exist just in um, warlike service, you'd agree with that? N no, and, and my understanding of the respite policy is it's not just about warlike service, it's about operations. And we have people on more than 30 operations, activities and investments um, in the region, in Australia and around the world today, as well as those that are part of our, what we call contingency force elements. So those, those are units that are held at a higher readiness, and that may be hours through to days or, or weeks. So that policy um, also, um, in, in my application, covers that broader set of circumstances. Of operations. Yeah, so, Yes, but I think it's really important to understand that how we may have defined operations in the last couple of decades, particularly around the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, stabilisation operations in the Solomon's Oil Temple, is different to the nature of operations today. We have people on operations today. Um, they, um, they're different. Um, and it's routine for our people to deploy on, on operations. Um, so that respite policy, I think, has broader, certainly in the way we apply it in Army, has broader application um, to the circumstances of operations uh, and it, let's call them exercises and activities that we are doing uh, today. And if I may, just one more point of clarification here. It's those same principles that are focused my mind in terms of how we manage the impacts, the health and wellbeing impacts and the capability impacts of hollowness and tempo on our people today. And, and, and that's really what my question is quite particularly directed to. And I'm interested in that concept you've raised about um, how, you, how you choose to apply it in Army. But first of all, it's fair to say that respite policy does not, it, it, apl it applies to a sub-cohort within Army. You'd agree with that? Um, I, I, so it has to be someone who is on an operation as defined in the policy. Uh, so um, I, I, my answer to that question would be no, Council. Um, and if I may uh, explain why I say that. 
So I'm responsible for what is known as forced generation. The entire purpose of that forced generation is to ensure that Army can meet its accountabilities, I can meet my accountabilities, to assign forces or make available forces for, for operations. Um, but it's broader than just operations. It's operations, it's activities and investments. They're the sort of three technical terms that the Chief of Joint Operations um, is responsible for um, pr providing. So they're, 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 let's, for example, say we've got people working in support of the Pacific Games in the Solomon Islands. That was an operation. Let's say I've got some soldiers, a company, uh, working with their Indonesian counterparts or multilateral counterparts in South Sumatra. That's an activity. Let's say we're doing something like um, uh, Pacific Pathways, which is de delivering medical support um, to regional countries. That's an activity or an in investment. So it's a much broader definition than just a, a combat operations. Yeah. Can I just quickly stop you there? Are mm. you saying that this respite policy covers operations, activities and investments? That's the way I apply the respite policy. And that's, and that's really what I'm getting to. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking about how you apply it. Mm. I'm saying what the language of the policy captures. Right. M my apologies. I misunderstood. And, and that really goes to my point in, in that um, I'll suggest to you that that respite policy has a more limited operation in terms of its its actual wording than you've suggested. Would you agree with that? Yes, given its specific yes. purpose and its origin, yes. Yes. Um, and so, as you've just illustrated, there is a tension there between an enterprise level respite policy that has a more limited operation and your needs as a chief of army to deliver respite to a broader cohort of yes. your members, you'd agree with that? Yes, and can I just be very clear? Yep. It's to everyone. It's to all that are serving in our army. That respite, my accountability yes. for respite yes. as and part of, yeah, so it's not just limited to uh, any particular cohort, it's to everyone because the demands of tempo and particularly when you overlay the impact of hollowness affects everyone. And that is precisely the point I'm trying to engage with you about. That is the, the tension between an enterprise level policy that has a more limited a more limited application and your broader accountabilities to deliver deliver respite for Army's people as a whole. How do you resolve that? Is it as you say in your applicate your your electing to apply the policy more bright, broadly? How does that work in practice? So um, th that is one policy. There are a range of others. And I think it's fair to say that at the enterprise level, there's been um, a lot more focus uh, and a broader, much broader interpretation of health and wellbeing and all of the factors that contribute to it. I would describe it as a, um, as a work in progress. Um, but but I'm, I, I have had sufficient understanding about the pressures and the risks for my workforce um, to be able to use the policies that, enterprise policies that do exist, such as the respite policy, such as the other provisions that help us with um, health and wellbeing of our people. And is there another enterprise level policy that allows you to deliver the full scope of the respite that you've just spoken about? I, I would say generally there are no shortage of policies um, that are available to accountable commanders. Um, so, so I don't think it's, a, it's an issue of there not being the policy. What I... Could you tell me what that policy is or what those policies are? Um, look, off the, off the top of my head, I, couldn't give you numbers or, or names, but th there are there is um, direction, um, for example, on aspects of medical uh, of support for families, uh, on um, it, we've just discussed culture, positive lived experience, and the like, and and a, a range of other 
artefacts, if you like, so philosophical level uh, doctrine, which um, over the last two, three years, the CDF has made a priority in terms of culture, ethics, command and the like, which we are seeking to uh, embed and, um, and proliferate through the way we train our people and in particular our leaders. Can I just stop you there? I mean, you're talking about a number of sort of perspective initiatives. C can I suggest this to you? One, we've got the um, the enterprise level respite policy. You'd agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there is then an independent discretion that vests in career management agency or joint health command to give someone an individual respite as on a case needs basis. You'd agree with that? Yes. There's, there's um, policy that allows for that. But beyond that, there is there is no singular enterprise policy with respect to respite for army members as a whole. Not that I'm aware of. Yes. And, and I guess that really comes, and I think you've probably just illustrated that point um, through the examples you've given. Would it be fair to say then as chief of army to deliver that respite you need, you then have to try and look at different artefacts within the system that will allow you to discharge your accountabilities rather than there being an enterprise level policy that singularly addresses it. You'd agree with that? Um, yes, but if I might just, just add that um, it's a multi-factorial um, equation because um, while, while we, we focus on um, health and wellbeing, the way we're organised, the resources we have available, the um, the demand for um, for army formations units teams um, and uh, the management, if you like, of change across the organisation. They're, they're all, for example, factors that that feed into it. So it, I think it would be difficult to have one single policy. I do think, um, though, and uh, I know that. Um, colleagues and I are working to try and simplify and coalesce. I think that would be useful. But, but would you accept, let, let's take the respite policy. I mean, you've spoken particularly about how you apply it in the context of operations, activities and investments. Yes, Karen. Based on that answer, it would seem that there is no good reason why that respite policy could not be um, more broadly drafted. Would you agree with that? Um, I, I don't see there's any in, impediment in in um, in expanding its application. Um, but and, that's, others, and can oh. I suggest to you that's really a lost opportunity, really, too, then, in terms of having an enterprise-level approach to respite? Uh, well, I'd welcome the enterprise-level approach in this instance um, because I think it, it is very important in terms of how do we apply what we learnt through the Afghanistan inquiry. Um, by the same token, I, I didn't feel limited by it in terms of applying it more, the principles more broadly, if that makes sense. Yeah, you've elected to apply them more broadly, but yes. it would have been better if that broader application could have been embedded in the policy itself. Um, yes, I would agree with that. Um, now, in your statement, you emphasise the criticality of comprehensive, longitudinal and accessible data in reducing suicidality. Um, what data do you presently have at your disposal with respect to suicide and suicidality affecting army members? So we have um, the uh, AIMS reporting as the sort of the uh, initial um, re reporting of suicidality and suicide. It's a broad category that ranges from ideation all the way through to someone who dies by suicide. Uh, so that's something that um, is available to us. In each of those cases, there is uh, the IGADF has the uh, has to make a decision as to whether or not there is an inquiry. There may, in some instances, be a coronial inquiry um, or, or other investigations uh, that will seek to determine the 
causes and the circumstances and, and anything obviously that we need to learn f from that. But, but those processes, and we've heard some evidence about that, can take some time. Yes. Um, w w what I'm really interested in is those data sources that you have at your fingertips that enable you to identify where there might be a heightened level of psychosocial risk, um, suicide or suicidality. So could you, could you answer the question with those caveats? Yes, so we, we, um, we know the characteristics, for example, of those who are at higher risk. So, for example, and I think it's in my statement, uh, younger male uh, involuntary separated for medical reasons. Now, if we, if we break down those um, elements, it means we can then target um, our interventions or the way we do things in a way that seeks to reduce the risk in, in those sorts of categories. So, for example, in our ab initio training, uh, we have placed um, in the first week a wet suicide awareness, uh, culture, demand expectations, um, how you go about seeking assistance, how you go about making a complaint. So doing what we're seeking to do is reduce the risk um, of those likely young people who come into the organisation um, out, of, out of the society. Similarly, we've made a lot of changes over a number of years to how we actually conduct the training. My, my question, though, General, is, is a slightly different one. It's really, you, you've identified some pre-existing um, views defence has on where higher levels of psychosocial risk may lie. My question is more about the data sources that you have at your fingertips to identify where an emerging cohort of psychosocial risk. Okay, so I'll go back to the discussion we had around the, um, the work that um, our Chief of Staff does uh, with, with looking for and tracking trends. Um, that's the sort of the, the routinised, um, our routinised approach for it. But and just in terms of that work, is that based on aims or what are the data sources for that work? Uh, it, 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 is, um, it is based on aims. Um, but it also, uh, for me, in terms of my sort of close team, close staff, um, they are my mechanism for fusing a whole range of different data sources. Those data sources may range from, as, as we said, the IGADF reports. They may be independent land worthiness board um, assessments. They may, may be outcomes from the adjutant general of the Army, which is my internal but independent um, compliance, assurance and governance uh, mechanism, and they conduct a whole range of things. For example, WHS assessments of units on a two-yearly basis, or there might be a phone call from, let's say, the Commander of Forces Command to say, um, look, I've just become aware of this um, here's what we're doing about it and here are some things um, that I am curious about and we, we need to, um, to, to explore further to understand whether there's more to this, is there a trend, is there something else we need to be looking at. So it, there's a whole range of data sources. My point is that we need to better systematise that and, and actually use technology to uh, help us develop insight. At the Can I just stop Sorry. you there? Yeah. So in terms of that the systematisation, is there currently a system established whereby you regularly receive reliable data identifying where there may be a high number of incidents of self-harm amongst a particular cohort or in a particular location? I'd have to say no to that, Council. Yeah. So, so what we've done is we've built a system, but my point is that we need to resolve, remedy, fix our data system 
um, whether that's access, ownership, um, whether that's fusion um, into something. And, and we, we actually have, a, I think, uh, in my view, an excellent opportunity through the ERP or Enterprise, Enterprise Resource Planning Program. And so that's the enterprise level initiative to address the challenge that you've just articulated? Yes. In terms of the design of ERP, um, do you as Chief of Army or members within Army who have that expertise have input into the design of a system so you can be satisfied it will give you the functionality you need? Um, short answer is yes, Council. Um, and I would just, I think it's necessary just to add a little bit more to that. Uh, what's important from my perspective is to articulate the requirements. So in other words, I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, we have a, a proliferation of different systems. In some cases, we've designed the requirements for those systems and they work to help us to do our job. In other cases, we are limited because we either have to adjust the way we operate uh, or we are unable to use that tool for you know, the full purpose it might be designed for. So there's, the, you know, there's, there's some real challenges there for us. I think ERP is the opportunity at the enterprise level, but our what I, I'm very focused on is making sure we get the requirements right um, because if we don't get the requirements right, if we don't ask the right questions and set the right demand signal, then we won't be, we'll have a, you know, a, a, a better system, but it won't be based on the right questions. And I think it would be fair to say that this Royal Commission is similarly focused upon that system asking the right questions. In that respect, can you give me a specific example of, I think you mentioned circumstances in which you've been able to have specific input into design to ensure that it does that. Can you give me a specific example of that in the context of um, suicide and suicidality and ERP? Um, yes, I can, Council. So the we have it. There's a formalised um, working group that brings together all of the services and, and groups uh, for each of the modules. So, for example, in in terms of the case module, as it's known, which is really about we've heard a lot of people about case, yep. uh, data. Um, w Army has articulated. Um, what it believes um, it requires from from the case module uh, as part of, of ERP. This is, I think, one of the key enterprise level challenges is that if you just take the three services, for example, um, we, we operate in different environments. We are, our disposition is different. The experience and the risks for our people are different. So how do you design a system that is able to cater for those differences and, in, and therefore enable and empower accountable commanders to discharge their responsibilities? And, and are those differences able in point of fact to be accommodated by the ERP um, initiative? Um, that is my aspiration, um, but I think it, I, I can't give you a, a guarantee um, because I don't think we're there yet. Uh, can, can you just give me a, a, a simple example of what Army has asked for, specifically with respect to the ERP and suicide and suicidality? Um, what, what I would offer is that uh, we are seeking... Um, the ability to fuse and correlate the, some of the data sets we already have um, in a way that doesn't require people, staff officers, to spend inordinate amounts of time finding 
assembling, correlating, analyzing. Um, but you know, the, the system does that, and then we can better use the, our people's time, our staff's time, to do analysis and create insight for the purpose of um, assisting me to make better decisions. And have you been assured that the system will be able to accommodate that request? I haven't had an assurance, but I absolutely know from my engagement with the Associate Secretary that he is similarly minded, um, and that's that's where he is leading uh, that program uh, across the full range of uh, modules that that program will deliver. Can we shift topics slightly to the batters you acknowledge in your statement, but also in the round table um, you participated in before the commissioners about the duality of service. It gives you identify for some service is a positive experience, um, but for others, and I'm using your words here, you say it is a negative experience for whom the impact is pernicious, can be lifelong, can be life altering or indeed life ending. That's a correct recitation of your words? Yes, those are my words, Councillor. Can you um, expand upon those observations um, and how your understanding of the risk associated with su suicidality has evolved? Uh, yes. So, two points, if I may. The first is um, I, I think now it's fair to say that uh, – certainly from an army perspective, but more broadly across the ADF and defence, that previously um, th there was, a, I guess, a, a comparison uh, with, you know, who's accountable for what. In other words, um, well, the rate of suicide in service may be lower than what it is for veterans, so therefore that's something that we should be looking at under the auspices of Department of Veteran Affairs, for example. Um, I, I, I think that is um, very much a, a view that's in the past. And just in terms of that, what was, what was the catalyst for that view changing? I think there'd been a, a growing view, um, certainly one that I shared, um, that we really need to be looking at service from the point at which someone starts in our organisation, effectively to the, to the day they pass and, and looking at it as a continuum. And I would also say that you know, the focus that this Royal Commission has, has brung, uh, brung to, has brought to issues of suicide and suicidality has made it, um, um, I think, very apparent that that is indeed uh, and, in, nice. and in terms of that evolution of understanding, um, You've spoken about you've spoken about the historic distinction between defence's responsibility and that of DVA. A am I right to understand that evolved com thinking comes with an acknowledgement within defence that it can do harm to its members? Absolutely. And that that harm may manifest after a member leaves. Very, very clear in my mind. And so, therefore, it is incumbent on defence to do all it can to minimise that harm it, it could do. Yes, and I consider myself accountable for that. Can I, may I just, just add, you, your question was about what, what have I learned through this process. Can may I offer two other things? The first is my uh, initial focus was... Um, around suicides that, you know, had a nexus with operational service and in particular combat operations. And that certainly been my experience over the last decade or so. Um, and, and I don't um, diminish that and or nor suggest that it isn't an area of focus, but it is but one area of focus and, and clearly... Um, what the lived experience of our people, uh, regardless of what they're doing, 
in, in their service today uh, absolutely um, has an impact on their lives, but not just their lives, the lives of their families as well. And it's another area I think is, is worthy of some discussion. Uh, and in that respect, General, I mean, I think you just touched upon a sort of a, a view you had held about where there may be heightened psychosocial risk, and you're talking particularly about deployments in warlike environments. Um, can I just ask for your comment about this? Would you agree that defence can't accept that some level of mental illness in its members is simply accepted as the cost of doing business? Yes. Now you're going to, um, so you would accept then that defence efforts must always be to reduce the incidence of suicide and suicidality. You'd agree with that? Yes, absolutely. It must be proactive in that respect? Absolutely. Um, and it must proactively work to increase support and protective factors, even despite the traumatic nature of some of its work? Uh, yes, I think it's axiomatic that that, that would be, be the case. Precisely. Now, you, you said there was a second aspect of your evolution, and I stopped you before you had an opportunity to comment upon that. But the, the first was that whole of life, whole of service view. The second was... Um, Certainly, one thing I've learned is that it is obviously much broader than just combat um, related. Um, that was a, a bias from my own experience. Uh, the third is um, we are not going to solve, we Army Defence ADF are not going to solve this on our own. It's a societal issue that we face. Uh, I would like to think we can make a contribu contribution to that broader societal challenge, but we're also going to have to um, work with and rely on other aspects of the society we serve if we're to actually make a difference in suicide and suicidality. Uh, you, you talk about it as a societal issue, but you wouldn't cavil with a proposition, would you, General, that it is a, a heightened issue for those that serve. No, that's not what I'm suggesting. So, so what do you mean then by that concept of a societal issue that needs to be grappled with? Well, um, it, it, it is an issue in society and particularly, I think, among young people. Um, so, so we must be learning mm. as a society in, our, in academia, in our medical and mental health professions, uh, in the way that uh, communities are, are tackling this issue. H how do we, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is we, we ought not be proceeding in a way that is is isolated. It, in, in a way, sorry if I may just finish, but in a way that seeks to not only contribute to, but to benefit from what you might describe as best practice in each of the important areas that contribute to mental health and wellbeing. And would you accept, General, that while it, not, it ought not have come to this, it ought not have come to a Royal Commission to get defence to this point, you'd agree with that? Yes, but I'm very glad that there is a Royal Commission because uh, I think it provides us with uh, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to actually focus in and, and make a difference. And it is incumbent now then on defence to really lean into that opportunity, to be professionally curious, as you say, to go looking for the expert advice and data it needs to really properly grapple with this awful problem. Yes, and uh, I think that I personalise that, uh, that obligation and accountability. It's, it's my accountability. And uh, alongside that evolution of thinking about suicide and suicidality, General, we heard evidence from the Chief of Navy that he considered there's been a shift of thinking in defence from force design and particularly focused on platforms and systems to also emphasising the importance of people within defence. Put another way, Historically, defence didn't prioritise its people in the way it should have. Do you agree with that? Um, 
Oh, if I can speak from my own experience. Yes. Um, Prioritising uh, of people has always been um, at the forefront of um, of the way we've approached um, soldiering uh, and and the accountabilities of commanders. That's something that is instilled from from day one. Now, how well we've done that is is certainly you know a, a matter that we need to be introspective about because we have failed along the way uh, but I, I would I would offer from my experience um, an army is less of a I suppose a platform based organization and more of a people based organization and that's not for a moment to diminish the people in the other services that they matter but um, our, our focus and our capability has always been on on people and in every um, leadership, or development course I've done, either as a soldier, an NCO, or as an officer, that has been the central theme. And you've spoken about your experience, um, but would you agree that it is important now for defence as a whole to enshrine that priority on its people? Yes, again, I think the prioritisation of our people is axiomatic. Uh, now, um, I, I want to shift topics a little bit to talk to you about um, some specific aspects of the collation and usage of health data. Now, um, the Sentinel system is one means by which that information is collected, that's correct? Yes. And am I right to understand that uh, the purpose of um, Sentinel includes injury surveillance, is that right? I believe it does, yes. Um, and it's particularly focused upon um, notifiable incidents under workplace health and safety legislation. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, Council. Now, the Commission has heard evidence that Sentinel was built off a civilian workplace system. Are you aware of that? I believe that's the case. Uh, and so it wasn't designed to provide granular information about military injuries. Um, would you agree that, that it doesn't do that? <laughs> Um, bro broadly, yes, and I think it goes to the point we were just discussing about getting the requirements right to suit the nature of what we do rather than um, how we do things being dictated by the capacity or otherwise of a particular proprietary system. Uh, and in terms of that objective, would you agree that Sentinel doesn't do what you need it to do? Uh, I I would. Um, I think we need a system that does does more and better suits the requirements of service. In my case, in the army. And so, for example, would you agree that one of the things that Sentinel doesn't do at the moment is give you a complete picture of injuries that are actually occurring in service? No, we rely on pulling uh, from you know, a range of other data sources to better inform ourselves. So Sentinel doesn't presently provide that output. You have to go to disparate data sources to achieve that outcome. Yes. Um, are you able to get any regular information reports from Sent Sentinel to monitor trends in injuries, for example? Uh, yes, but I, I would just caveat that by saying we we, we do use Sentinel data, but we also use other data that's available to help us characterise um, injury, prevalence of injury, types of injury, um, and then to seek to understand causal factors and, and then do something about them. Um, and, and that might be an opportune moment, General, to take you to those parts of your statement where you talk about the potential opportunities to use data to inform Defence and Army's approach to health and wellbeing. Um, can I ask the operator to please go to sst.1001.0001.0001 and turn to dot um, And could you please expand paragraphs 184 through to 187 on the next page? give you an opportunity to 
if you're familiar enough to take part to this segment. Now, you say in paragraph 187 that there is a broad understanding of the key reasons that soldiers ac access defence health services, um, but I take it from that statement that there, there are some gaps in that broad understanding. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, Councillor. Can you explain to commissioners where those gaps are? I, I think, um, commissioners, that the... As I said in, in the statement, we have an understanding from the data that is presented to us where the key issues lay. But the way it's presented and the data that we have, you might broadly describe as flag indicators in terms of this is what has happened uh, and then I, you know, I and others can make decisions about what we need to do with that. One of the points I'd offer um, about a, an effective data system, and, and that when I say data system, that includes the application of analytics, um, is to be able to have a comprehensive data set that correlates all those various inputs that provides us with the opportunity to identify lead indicators. In other words, some predictive analysis um, that tools like artificial intelligence may assist us with developing uh, through analysing you know, the, the data that we do have. Because there's a huge amount of data, um, but it is siloed. Um, there are different access provisions uh, and at the moment, to, to get a fused picture, I've got people having to effectively physically assemble from a range of different data sources to try and help us fuse a picture. My aspiration is for that to be systematised and delivered digitally. That, of course, uh, going back to the conversation that Council and I had about requirements, needs to be informed by the thinking that we have done and need to continue to do to ask the right questions, to know what, what we need to be looking at. Now, I see that there's a reciprocal arrangement um, as we start to develop this system and what that, that fused data picture and the application of analytics will tell us in terms of um, insight into lead indicators. In other words, the analysis looks at the entire data set and then um, we, with the right questions is then able to help us see um, that as a result of what has happened, here are some insights into what might happen. And that then, I think, completely um, flips uh, on its head our capacity then to act um, on lead indicators rather than lag, lag indicators. So I hope that's a useful explanation. And, and so, General, when you talk about getting aggregated data to improve actionable insights, is that what you've, the explanation you've just given commissioners then? Yes, well, I think I probably expressed it better in my statement. Um, can I ask, in, in terms of that aspiration for the aggregated data you want, is that currently embedded into the design process for ERP? I, I believe it is, yes. Um, now, can I shift um, then to um, 194 of your statement where you talk 
particularly about um, improving health protection of your people. Um, operator, please go to dot zero zero four one, and you make some specific observations with respect to injury prevention. Could the operators please expand one nine four right through to one nine seven? While that's coming up, you talk in your statement general about wanting to improve the integration of research undertaken by scholars, um, defence science and technology group, academic and industry partners with respect to injury prevention. Can you elaborate for commissioners what you're talking about there? Um, yes, yeah, so and I, I guess if I just go back to the conversation that we were having earlier. Um, we don't need to be reinventing the wheel. Where best practice or better practice exists, uh, I would like to be able to access and apply that. We have uh, a range of um, relationships and, and partnerships, uh, and there are um, other organisations um, that have expertise um, and assemble data sets. So, for example, the AOHW, um, which is a data source that, that we use, but it obviously sits outside of defence. Uh, and going back to the conversation that Council and I had about, um, we're not going to solve this issue alone. How do we work, partner with others on this um, on this issue, how do we contribute in that partnership and how do we benefit from research that is being done um, in academic institutions by medical and um, mental health professionals um, and, and the like. And General, you also talk in that part of your statement about a lack of actionable data in respect of health and performance programs. Is that a slightly different point to the one you were making earlier about the other, the earlier parts of your statement? Just one moment. Of course. Yes, there, there is a... It's not separate, but it, there's a distinction in terms of performance, um, so human performance, as it relates to the jobs that soldiers do. And sorry, if I may, and, and this is particularly important in the most demanding of circum operational circumstances, and, and obviously um, you know, we are trying to prepare our people to be able to engage in in combat and in combat operations, which is a um, uh, an incredible test of anyone's physical, mental, and spiritual capacity. So it's a broader definition when I talk about human performance. So it's it's a it's a different outcome you're seeking, but from the same design of the ERP platform. Yes. So if it's going to be a truly enterprise uh, platform, it, it needs to serve the, 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 the various demands that we have to develop an effective force. And you might have touched on this before, but in terms of these design outcomes that you see are needed in terms of data, where are they formally discussed in the enterprise system? Is it in a particular committee or how in terms of the governance structure of defence are these issues escalated and resolved? The program itself, and, and I'm, I'm um, the, the Associate Secretary is, is, uh, is accountable and probably the best place to describe it, but um, I would offer that there is, the program has its own governance structure. Um, my um, uh, Deputy Chief, uh, and my head of land capability um, and their staff are the ones that participate in that governance framework, which includes the contribution uh, and discussion around requirements, um, but also the implementation plan, because we've been um, training our people uh, and setting conditions 
or the transition as each of the modules comes uh, online. So there's a range of other preparatory actions that are required that are coordinated through that program governance structure. Um, in terms of how progress is reported at the enterprise level, um, in some of the enterprise committees that I am a member of, such as the Enterprise Business Committee and the Investment Committee, there are updates on, on that program. I might take you then, if I could, to paragraph 188 of your statement at dot zero zero three nine. And if you could please expand that paragraph. Um, can I just get you to read the chapeau, please, General? For non-lawyers, General, that means the heading. I thought it was a hat initially. <laughs> Thank you. Only in French. Yes, Councillor. So you say there that that um, defence's view is in effect that universal measures are likely to provide the best protection. What's the evidentiary basis of that view? Sorry, Councillor, will you just point me exactly So to in the second sentence you say, defence has not sought to target any particular population subgroup with its suicide prevention initiatives on the basis that universal measures are likely to provide the best protection. I'm just wondering what, what's the evidentiary basis for the view that universal measures will provide the best protection? Uh, th that's my assessment of where we currently are. And uh, I, I think it, it's logical in terms of how do we get as the enterprise get the best uh, outcome um, uh, overall, but I think it's necessary for us to then um, progress those efforts um, by moving from, okay, here are the generic things we can do to improve uh, health and wellbeing and to address suicidality and suicide. Um, so just to stop you there, so am I right to understand that that statement reflects defence's position as opposed to an evidence-based view about the effectiveness of universal protections? I, I think, uh, and I, I, I don't know, but my um, understanding is that that approach is based on evidence. So I, in other words, the, the approach to say, well, what are the key factors that um, would be most effective, you know, to lift all boats, if you like, start there. But the point I'm making is that that's a good start point, but we then need to become more granular as our intelligence, uh, as our understanding and our business intelligence improves, to then be able to be more specific and to target um, particular subgroups. And we had a discussion about operations before, you know, for, for example. But, well, and that's sort of precise, precisely my point. I mean, I mean you, would ex you would accept that there are particular cohorts within army that are a higher level of psychosocial risks. I mean, one example I could give you is members who are injured during ab initio training. Yes. Um, so you would accept then, would you not, that there is actually a need for more targeted initiatives for those particular at-risk cohorts? Yes, and um, we, we are doing that, um, but I would, like, uh, I would like to see that um, as, a, as sort of an enterprise level uh, approach to things. In, in other words, how do we use the, the resources we have, the capacity we have, the ERP system, once it's delivered, how do we use that to understand where we, ne we need to target at a more granular level those areas that are at higher risk? And then going to the discussion we had with commissioners earlier, um, how do we get to a point where we can understand, we can do some predictive analysis, understand lead indicators, 
um, rather than be acting on lag indicators, what has happened to inform us. And defence as an enterprise is not there yet? No, no, we're not. Now, I, I just want to um, focus particularly on that issue of training that we've just mentioned um, and how physical injuries uh, levels are managed within training institution. Now, General, am I right that, that you have the somewhat rare experience within Army of being a graduate of both one RTB and RMC Duntroon? I, I don't know that it's rare, but, but yes. You I, have that I, experience. Yes. Um, just based on that experience, would you agree that training institutions play a critical role, particularly in the construction of military identity? Yes, Council. Um, and in that respect, that um, focusing on RMC Duntroon for a moment, training institutions such as that are instrumental in shaping the leaders within defence of the future? Yes, Council. Now, are you aware that Army training institutions have a higher rate of physical injury compared with other services? Yes. Um, do you have any insights as to the reasons for that? Uh, yes, and I, I think that that probably applies not just in training institutions but across um, the Army in comparison. Um, be because of the environment that we work in, the, there is a much higher degree of physicality. Um, the degree of what we call clutter in the land domain for land combat operations or land operations generally means that there is um, a myriad uh, risks um, to the health and well-being of our people. So I, I think it's, it's it's a factor of the environment. Um, and if you, you know, th there's a been I believe a fairly steady uh, percentage of, across our army of people that are injured or ill at at any particular time. In my own experience, I've had numerous uh, you know injuries over the course of my career, the, 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 the discussion I'm having with our people is that, is, that that's, that's a normal part of service as much as we continue to try and, and minimise it and we have made some good strides there. But um, the, the, the challenge for us in a psychosocial um, uh, way is to normalise in the same way as physical health is normalised mental health injury and illness and the way that we seek to one prevent uh, and, but two then deal with the incidence of that now general my question is a slightly different one but it is connected to psychosocial risk associated with physical injury um, and it is particularly focused on ab initio training mm. institutions because um, you would accept, would you not, there is a correlation between suicidality and medical separation for amongst junior ranks? Yes, I think we discussed earlier that the uh, one of the at-risk groups was, you know, fit exactly that description, young male, uh, early in service and separated involuntarily for medical. So going back and breaking down some of those factors, then... Um, injury and, and illness uh, are areas that we need to be focused on. And so an aspect of that will be, must be, must it not reduce the rate of physical in injury in those training institutions yes. leading to, to separation? Yes, Council. Um, and am I right to assume that the fitter trainees are before training, the lower the risk of physical injury they may suffer? I, I think that's one correlation yes okay. but I, I don't think it um, while it may while it may reduce it obviously um, there are fit you know people who are physically very physically fit um, who are injured and, and the reason I say that is because if you look at the incidence of physical injury in units in, in service that that, that is uh, that's a factor as well but I'm particularly focused on training institutions. Yes. In that particular at mm -hmm. cohort. Um, do you get reliable data on the level of fitness required to minimise physical injury during army training? Yes. There's been a lot of work done over 
probably the last couple of decades, there's a far more sophisticated and informed approach to how we design training and we understand the kinds of levels of fitness that people require and are able to specifically tailor the training to minimise risk of injury during that training by, by matching those standards. And is an aspect of those intervention me methods um, preconditioning programs you use for people who have been recruited to army? Yes, that's correct. Um, and do you have information on how those preconditioning programs impact uh, the risk of physical injury on army recruits? Uh, yes, um, I, I don't have the, the data uh, immediately in the front of my mind, um, but I, I am aware that those preconditioning programs uh, have been successful. In terms of reducing? Reducing risk, yes. And that's their specific purpose. Uh, and if I could focus particularly then on um, First Nations serving members, um, we've been told about a program called the Australian Indigenous Development Program. Are you aware of that? I am. And as I understand, the aim of that program is to support new members to prepare for service life and reduce the risk of injury. Is that correct? That's one of its purposes, yes. Uh, and can you give commissioners an oversight of the respects in which those programs operate and whether or not you are monitoring if they are effective to reduce the risk of physical injury? Uh, yes. Can I, if I may, commissioners, that, that is one of a number of programs we have uh, for Indigenous Australians to serve. Um, each of those programs... Uh, I would assess, and I, I think it could be substantiated, has been successful uh, in its aim. Um, there is obviously the issue of physical standards, but particularly when it comes to um, Indigenous soldiers, there are a range of uh, cultural um, considerations that need to be um, dealt with as well. So, if, if I may, so we, we uh, have had some uh, amazing um, success with bringing some young Indigenous Australians who at the outset meet no standard of entry into the ADF. Um, many of whom who come from circumstances that will um, reduce you to tears. Uh, we work with them in collaboration with others like educators from the Bachelor Institute, uh, cultural leaders, uh, our own NCOs and officers, trainers who have been selected for these jobs, um, to build their confidence by demonstrating what they are, what they can achieve and to, to build them to a standard where they can then undergo a preconditioning program. Well, it's important that that's done as a cohort and is done in a way that is culturally uh, appropriate and then um, ensure that the risk of inducting them into our training system, particularly at places like First Recruit Training Battalion, is minimised to the greatest extent possible. Again, I don't have the, the data in the front of my mind, but, but the success measured through measures of effectiveness, such as the number of them, the percentage of them that are still serving at sort of one, two, three, four year mark, and, and doing so successfully uh, is very encouraging. Can I shift then, General, to the role of um, the instructors or trainers that are at Army's training institutions? Um, that is a group you would accept at a high level of psychosocial risk just by virtue of their age and their point of transition from civilian to military life. The, the trainees, sorry, or the instructors? The, the trainees. 
Yes. In terms of the trainors then, you would accept that they need specialised skills to enable them to best protect the wellbeing of recruits? Uh, yes, and I would offer to you that uh, in the first instance, uh, we deliberately select for uh, instructors that have the right um, character and, um, and skills to be able to um, connect with coach, mentor and train ab initio uh, recruits. So that's one way of seeking that we um, reduce the risk by having the right people and then secondly, investing in them. We've had a long-standing um, thing called a recruit instructor development course. Uh, and, and can I just stop you there? Uh, I'm particularly focused on um, training with respect to mental health and wellbeing. A am I right that trainers at Army training institutions receive annual mandatory suicide awareness training? That is correct, yes. Beyond that, do they receive any specialised training to assist them with dealing with this at-risk cohort? Um, yes, they do. So we've developed, for example, a, um, a thing called a commander's guide to psychosocial hazards. That's been an effort um, out of our WH and S um, directorate. Um, and the, the issue of psychosocial hazards in particular is one that we have elevated in terms of discussion in, in our training. I, I don't for a moment suggest we are fully there yet, um, but it is uh, an element of focus along with physical risk. So, so you've spoken there about a commander's guide. Is there a specifically tailored program for trainers in dealing with mental health and well-being of new recruits? So as part of the instructor development course and the, um, the induction uh, of instructors at the uh, Royal Military College Duntroon, I, I'd have to get the detail of the programs, but, but yes, there are aspects of those preparatory um, measures that include th those issues, particularly Absolutely. around suicidality and suicide and how to deal with, you know, the, 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 or how to apply the policy to deal with those things. Aspects of preparedness around those matters sounds a little bit different from a specifically tailored program to address mental health and wellbeing, or am I wrong to take that away? Um, no, I, I don't. I wouldn't characterise it that way, Council. What, what I'd say is those uh, programs, those investments in our instructors and trainers, are specifically designed to ensure that they are best placed, if you like, to to uh, identify and deal with that elevated level of risk of ab initio trainees, and that necessarily includes. Uh, psychosocial hazards and suicidality as well. And can I ask, General, um, are there challenges in retaining um, trainors at training institutions? I, I would say that our challenge is, is more uh, in relation to attracting them to those jobs. I think it's quite the opposite in terms of retaining in terms then of attracting trainers to that job, um, is there in your view a perception that leadership positions at training institutions are not useful to career progression? Is that one of the barriers to attracting trainers? I think that used to be the case. Um, there's probably some, still some anecdotally, some residual there, but I, I, I do think that that, uh, attitude has substantially shifted, particularly over the last decade. So what are the barriers then to attracting trainers to training institutions? Well, I would characterise it, um, but particularly when we were very heavily engaged in operations, 
uh, as as one that was, that's where people wanted to be. They wanted to be in deployable units so they could go and do their job. Um, and that time in a training institution w would reduce their opportunity to do that. So I think that's probably how I would characterise the the incentive, if you like, in people's minds. I don't think that that is um, the case today. Uh, now, General, um, the commissioners have had engagement with um, the Five Eyes Nations in terms of the work of this Royal Commission, um, including a review conducted by the Honourable Louise Arbour. Are you familiar with that work? Oh, I'm not, Council. One of the things that was recommended was a specialty trainer educator occupation within the Defence Force. Do you have a view on the um, utility of such a position? Uh, we take a uh, look. I acknowledge it. That's one way of doing things. I, I'm not sure we are large enough, um, or um, or that would meet our circumstances. Uh, the approach that we take is that every NCO and officer is a trainer because you need to train your unit, whether that's a section or a battalion or a brigade. So we invest in the way that we educate, train and develop our people skills to be an instructor. So you may not be posted to a school as an instructor, but if you're an NCO or an officer in any unit in the Australian Army, one of your prime responsibilities is to train your people, both individually and collectively. Accepting that to be the case, do you see the usefulness of a particular specialisation for those ab initio training institutions? Uh, I, w the way I would describe it is that we need to uh, enhance the skills that those uh, NCOs and officers have already in terms of being trainers and mentors and coaches in a way that best meets the particular demands and as, as we've discussed, the risk the heightened risk profile of ab initio trainees. I would add we also have um, small group cells of professional training developers that uh, and subject matter expertise that is available in the development of and central to the development of curricula for uh, example. So that those aspects I think um, and, and the curriculum review board mechanism, I think, is is how we uh, apply. And I, I, my view is that that is that system, that approach, is fit for purpose. Uh, now, you spoke about the rest recruit instruction development course. Is that mandatory for all instructors at Kapuka and RMC Dunturn? It is. Uh, the recruit instructor development course is uh, pertains to. Um, Kapuka, the first recruit training battalion, because that's the recruit instructor development course. Um, the uh, just stopping you there. Is it mandatory for everyone yes. who's a trainer? I is there an equivalent course for RMC Duntroon? Uh, there, there is. And is it mandatory for RMC Duntroon? Yes. I'm sorry. Can I just clarify, no, Council? Sure. I'm not sure we define it or label it as a course at Duntroon, but there is a defined set of mandatory requirements for people that come in to Duntroon uh, who are going to be um, uh, in engaging with uh, and responsible for the coach, mentor and training of staff cadets. Now, am I right, just focusing particularly on RMC Duntroon, that there is a use of cadet hierarchies within that institution? That's correct. And so that means that um, those trainees that are higher in that in hierarchy have command and authority over trainees who are lower in the hierarchy. That's correct. Uh, Sorry, um, just to be very specific about command. They don't have command 
uh, authority, that command authority is vested in the commanding officer of the Royal Military College and then those that are he devolves command to. The purpose of the cadet uh, hierarchy structure is to ensure that these um, people who are going to be leaders and commanders in our units have some personal experience uh, of, um, of living, working and operating in that environment. And it's part of developing the leadership potential uh, of those cadets. Uh, those cadets are selected for their based, based on their character and performance and we invest um, prior to them assuming those appointments some additional training um, th that, that ensures they understand what their accountabilities are and the way in which they need to go about. Now, um, General, those cadet hierarchies of the type that you were talking about have been the subject of some criticism. I'm thinking particularly in the context of reviews of ADFA. You're aware of reports that have criticised the use of those cadet hierarchies? Yes. Um, and the particular risks that are identified in those reports are um, a power imbalance where there can be hazing and bullying as part of those cadet hierarchies. You're aware of that? Yes. Um, so, so given that, why are the use of those hierarchies appropriate in a modern defence force? Because uh, the, the entire purpose of um, the way we so, – so if we take uh, – and I won't speak to ADFA because I can speak to um, Royal Military College Duntroon. It, it is structured along – to, to um, mirror the environment in which those um, staff cadets are going to go and, and work and be commanders and be leaders. So what we're trying to do is ensure that their experience along with their training is um, best matched to what they're going to be required to do and the, op the environment in which they are going to be able to do it. Although, General, can, so I just, can I just stop you there? D do you have mechanisms in place to monitor those cadet hierarchies and assure commanders that they're not developing into negative subcultures? Oh, absolutely, and we've got a pretty long history based on some of those sorts of issues that you've mentioned, uh, Council. Um, I, I should have added at the outset, uh, so uh, forgive me. But all of that cadet structure is within the uh, context of the staff who, um, who are the accountable leaders. And for example, each company has an officer and a warrant officer, um, an officer commanding and, um, and a, um, sorry, a drill sergeant um, that is uh, the, the close day-to-day -day supervision and then there is the, the same sort of unit structure and hierarchy um, that you would find in any unit that oversees, supervises, monitors, counsels, coaches and mentors the cadets. So in terms of some of the risks that you've mentioned that have come in, in the past from, from some of these things, um, that that is the uh, that, that is the role of the staff that are posted to that unit. Now, um, General, we understand that um, as part of the training program, Army has a process to inform recruits of the supports that are available at one RTB. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, that applies at one RTB and at Royal Military College Duntroon. And I'll just add that we've recently redesigned the curriculum, modularised it and brought forward uh, into the first week a number of those aspects. So people understand or we explain to them what things like unacceptable behaviour are, how they would go about making a complaint, um, you know, effectively what, what their, their rights and responsibilities are 
Uh, there's also um, modules on suicidality in looking for signs and helping to develop um, these generally young people um, at a, uh, a vulnerable point. So we've moved that right up front to try and make sure that we are, as best we can, um, seeking to reduce some of those risks. And um, I think as you've touched on, they're young people. I imagine it's a time when they're abs absorbing a lots of different information about their new life within yes. the armed forces. Um, beyond just advising them of the fact of supports, are there proactive measures that are undertaken to ensure that um, recruits are leaning into these services? Yeah, so um, the, the staff, those recruit instructors, for example, um, part of what they do is, is effectively very closely monitor the group that they're responsible for, the section that they are responsible for, look for changes in mood or behaviour and, and, and the like, and lean in to asking, you know, questions, you know, are, are you okay? Um, how are you doing? What's on your mind? Because as you would appreciate, each of these people come from from a family or a circumstance and, you know, that, that doesn't stop when you join the army. So people will have a whole range of things going on in their lives or come from backgrounds that are particularly difficult. So they come with all of that uh, and then, of course, in, in a new environment, it, it, it's, it's challenging and difficult. And for some, you know, the combination might be um, particularly challenging. Um, so what we try and do is, one, arm them um, with some information, but also try and create in their minds uh, a sense that, hey, if I've got a problem, I can put my hand up and this is how I do it. This is, this is who I go to. So try and build that trust early in the, in the training system. Now, Commissioners, I was about to um, shift topics. Conscious of the time, did you want to ask any questions now or would you prefer to adjourn? I think Commissioner Douglas has one question and then we might break for lunch. Thank you. I only ask it now because it arises out of something said recently that uh, when um, Ms Longbottom assumed that your experience in being a graduate from Kapuka and Duntroon might have been unusual, I, I was told when we visited ANFA and Duntroon that the Duntroon entry composition was roughly one third from the existing ranks, the other ranks as they're sometimes called, one third from ADFA and one third from uh, graduates of other tertiary institutions. And I wasn't sure whether they might have been in the reserve or not. I was told that informally, it hasn't been put on the record anywhere, but is that roughly accurate? Uh, br broadly speaking, uh, yeah. So the percentage of um, serving soldiers um, who are um, s selected for officer training, um, in, it varies by class and, and cohort, but it's um, it's not in, insubstantial. I, I, around a third would certainly reflect, in my experience, some classes. Uh, in others, it may be a little less. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll break for 45 minutes for lunch. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 12.45 p.m.
Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Thank you, Ms. Longbottom. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Caldas. Um, Lieutenant General, I'm now going to change topics to health support. Uh, you talk in your statement about the importance and challenges of delivering health care to your members. Um, uh, would it be right to say that there are particular challenges in Army given the size of your workforce? Y yes, Council. I think size, um, disposition and dispersal. And so the disparate number of places where um, your workforce may be at any one point in time. Yeah, so Army's in 157 locations across the length and breadth of the country and 41 training areas, as well as the people we have um, offshore. And, and I think as you highlight in your statement, um, a number of those places are um, more remote or regional and so therefore not as readily accessible in terms of healthcare. Most are regional and some of the most remote um, places in our country. And General, you'd accept, would you not, that um, inadequate healthcare may be a contributing factor um, in medical separation of your members? Yes. And amongst the material um, that is included in the tender bundle with respect to one particular regiment, there's at least an anecdotal account of um, poor healthcare. Um, what information do you have as chief to monitor if your members are receiving adequate health care? Um, there are a range of metrics. Uh, for example, um, wait times for appointments that um, are gathered and assembled at the enterprise level and I have access to those. And what, so that's one metric, what does that tell you in terms of the adequacy of the health care your members are receiving? I, I would uh, like to improve the health care that our people are receiving. Um, I think amongst the evidence that the Royal Commission heard in um, Townsville from Brigadier Fegan was that there can be quite substantial wait times up to, I think perhaps I'll stand to be corrected, about a month to two months. Is that the type of data you're receiving about wait times? Yes, yeah, so the, the data I'm receiving, uh, sorry, uh, referring to, I, I can't give you the reference, but it um, categorises wait times for consultations uh, and appointments uh, by location around the country. And um, just to the best you can recall, can you give the commissioners an idea about um, the span of average wait times across the country? What is the minimum and what is the maximum? Um, pleasingly, the minimum was in the order of zero to one or zero to two days at the first recruit training battalion, uh, which I think is a, a, um, following on from our previous conversation about um, addressing the risks associated with ab initio training, it's a good thing. In other areas, and, and Council, I can't remember exactly the numbers, but you know, you be, could be talking anywhere between sort of 14 to 21 days. Um, and I mean, one wait time is one, as one in this year for you. Um, do you have any data that enables you to see if your members have continuity in their healthcare? Don't have quantitative data for that, but I have anecdotal um, evidence, if you like, and that's based on the questions I, I and the RSM of the Army ask when we um, get around our Army and, and talk to our people. And uh, if I were to characterise that anecdotal evidence, I would say um, it is generally the exception rather than the rule for someone to have continuity in terms of the treating um, doctor or professional when it comes to um, some of the specialist treatment that improves. Uh, and what about the quality of health care that it's provided to members? Do you have either quantitative or anecdotal evidence about that? Uh, again, uh, anecdotally, and I'm not a medical professional, 
Uh, but anecdotally, once uh, people can get to see, uh, you know, the right medical professional, then I, I think generally speaking, in in the conversations I've had, people are, are quite happy uh, for that. Can I just make one additional point, Council? That is that um, that's for the um, health of of the soldier. But going to your point about the disposition of army, is healthcare uh, and allied health care for families. That is another key um, matter of concern for me, but certainly uh, weighs heavily in the minds of our soldiers and their families. And in that respect, General, could you elaborate on what you see the particular, what, what the particular concerns you hold about adequacy, availability, continuity of health care for families is? Yeah, certainly. So um, for, for our families that are in um, a number of uh, regional remote um, areas, um, the, the services are generally not available or certainly not available in the same way as they are in the larger population centres and particularly those in the south of the country. Um, if you have a uh, and and if I can just expand it more broadly, it's it's it's, it's health and allied health. But it's also things like education. You know, for example, if you have a special needs child, uh, whether that's educationally or you know a family member has sp you know specialist requirements, it's often um, very difficult indeed to be able to source the kind of care you might need. Uh, and and again, that's a that's a key factor in terms of um, the well-being of the family and therefore the impact that has on our soldiers and the choices that they may make in terms of whether or not they wish to or they're able to continue to serve. So it goes to one of our key risks, which is hollowness, which is impacted by recruiting and retention. And I think you've just touched on it there as well. Um, it goes to one of the key matters that this commission is focused on and that is well-being of um, families and relatedly well-being of members. Um, would you accept that those pressures like um, availability of education, availability of health care are, are matters that um, can cause negative pressures on families? Yes, and I would add to that uh, separation from families, you know, in, in the south of the country mainly. Um, and particularly for those that have, you know, let's say a, an elderly parent or particular circum family circumstances uh, or where there is a, uh, a tragedy in a family, you know, th those kinds of everyday things are a factor for service. And I'll just add that all the conversations I have with our people in some of the most remote parts, there's never a complaint. It's just a very matter of fact, hey, this is our experience. I think we can improve that experience um, because we still need people to serve in these places. Accepting that, um, but as you've said, it, it, it can lead to pressures on families, it yes. can lead to separations. Um, you would accept that those separations in some instances can lead to relationship breakdowns? Yes. And you would accept as well, would you not, that relationship breakdowns is one of the factors we know that can contribute to suicide and suicidality? Yes, I, I understand from um, from summaries of associated factors that relationship breakdown is, is one that I would note um, is um, prevalent. Uh, now, just just coming back to um, healthcare. You've spoken about anecdotal accounts. Uh, are there any formal structures in place to feed insights from your members to you about their interactions with defence health system? Uh, yes, it is. It's an area of focus for the chain of command, um, and it is also uh, a particular area of focus um, as the RSM and I get around the army. Uh, to understand what people's experiences are. I can give you one example. We visited the um, our regional force surveillance units who are in across the north of the country in the most remote uh, parts. 
and we have a very good sense of the experience, um, and it differs depending on where you are. Um, and uh, th that was my priority in terms of which parts of the army I went to visit when I first started in the job. Um, and we um, put together an identification of the key issues and then uh, had um, my deputy chief um, at the time then start to develop and um, deliver what we could uh, with what we had um, and seek the assistance across the enterprise to try and address some of those aspects. So that is a real challenge, being able to deliver what you can with what you have? Yes. Uh, now, um, you make some particular recommendations in your um, statement about that. I, I might just take you to that if I could please, General. Operator, please go to sst.1001. Thank you. And please turn to paragraphs 13 um, through to 21 and expand them. Um, you hear talk, General, about um, a dedicated health and wellbeing capability brick to be delivered to the point of need within Army to improve outcomes. Um, can you expand on how you see that addressing the challenge you've just identified? Um, yes, thank you. Um, a capability brick is, is a team. Um, we, we design capability bricks for every aspect of our function. So, for example, a missile battery, an engineer company, uh, and, and the like. Um, so, what I'm suggesting is as we, uh, we take the same approach and design where form for those function for health and well-being. And I've laid out some uh, certainly not exhaustive su su suggestions as to what those uh, capability bricks may contain. Um, and in the heading of that section, I've described it as delivering uh, at the point of need. Uh, and I make the dis made the distinction also in the statement that the services are different. Um, and so a one size fits all in terms of delivering those capability bricks at the point of need um, w will not, in my view, address the issue. It needs to be tailored to the environment. So um, we just... Could you give a particular example of that, say, sort of in a remote area where army members serve? Uh, yes. So clearly there will be you know, resource constraints, um, but where we have you know, concentrations in Darwin, in Townsville, in Brisbane, um, for example, uh, delivering that sort of capability brick approach at the unit level is, is in my experience and my opinion, the most effective place to deliver it for a couple of reasons. Firstly, we expect to hold our commanders at the unit level accountable for the health and well-being of their people. Um, if, if I want to hold someone accountable for a task, then I need to resource them to be able to execute that task. What I'm suggesting here is that these health and wellbeing capability bricks are how we would resource for best outcome. And just in that respect, General, you talk in your statement about these capability bricks working with COs and providing services to members. How do you envisage that might work in practice? Look, we do have some experience of something like this. Um, when I was a commanding officer over an infantry battalion, I had as part of my unit, doctor, a nurse, I had medics, I had a physical training instructor who, who took care of rehabilitation and preventative training as well uh, and was the subject matter expert who actually um, reviewed all of the physical training plans to ensure that they minimised risk. Uh, we took out of hide, so to speak, um, command teams, so platoon commander, platoon sergeant and section commanders, corporals, to actually provide the the, the the leadership and the supervision for our soldiers that were in rehabilitation or, or you know various other 
stages that, that weren't able to, to be on the line doing their job and, and deployable. Um, and we also created um, uh, positions that um, were our point of engagement, continual engagement with families because um, families um, are an incredibly important part of any rehabilitation or any physical or mental um, injury or illness recovery um, process. So what we've tried to do is bring together all of that and the connection into allied health or specialist health so that the, the soldier who was injured or ill was at the centre of a multidimensional approach to their health and wellbeing. And am I right to understand from what you've just said, General, that that model doesn't presently exist within Army? Um, n no, it doesn't. It, part of it used to. It was a ground up and we shared best practice. It's where the soldier recovery centres um, originated from, but it was never by design and it was never resourced. And that's the key point I'm trying to make here is this needs to be by design and it needs to be resourced, not something that we expect our commanding officers to do locally. Uh, and and since I was a, a, a CO at that level, um, the way we're organised has changed. For example, um, th that medical capacity inside the unit is not there. We have a garrison uh, health model. And in terms of that um, absence of um, embedded health support, um, do you have any insights as to the reason for that? For example, is it a resource issue? Yeah, it, w it was at the time. That was a, it was a resource-related um, issue. A and in terms of this particular um, capability brick you've put forward, um, I is this an issue that you have raised with the enterprise in terms of wanting to input this initiative? Yes, I have had, had this discussion. And, and when did you do that or when did you start that? Um, over, well, since I've become a Chief of Army. Yeah. And, and what is the, who did you have it with and what was the response? Um, I've had it with uh, numerous uh, peers and senior leaders. Um, the response, generally speaking, I think was um, supportive, um, but I, I think... Uh, cognizant of the, the resourcing requirements. So, I, I know, and I am cognizant of those as well, but I don't think that that ought to be sort of the end of the, the, the discussion here. I think we need to uh, figure out how we can better use what we already have. Um, and in, in that regard, um, we've gone through some very significant organisational changes in Army as a result of the Defence Strategic Review. One of the last pieces that I am uh, holding off on making decisions about or recommending options for decisions about is our health capability, our second health brigade and our four health battalions because I want to integrate what we learn and potentially the recommendations of this Royal Commission into how we um, how we then evolve that part of our capability. Um, and in terms of that sort of design aspect, this really comes back to this concept of interdependencies amongst um, defences and enterprise. You'd agree with that? Correct, yes. So um, how do you escalate this particular issue within that governance structure and advocate for the outcome your members need? Um, the, the mechanism um, I will use is by the Vice Chief of the Defence Force who has accountability for, as the authority for force design um, and I would be seeking um, a, um, the term escapes me, but it's, it's along the lines of a, um, a workforce um, segment review of our health capability um, to, uh, it, which would be the mechanism by which that analysis and therefore design would be done. And am I right to understand from what you've said that you are holding off doing that until the recommendations from this Royal Commission come down so that it can be a single integrated piece of work? Yes, 
I think it's prudent um, to kind of measure twice and cut once, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, would it be fair to say, though, given what you've identified as being some of the gaps or deficiencies with the provision of health care, that gives you cause for concern with respect to your own accountabilities for the health and well-being of your people? Um, y yes, it does. Um, so what I've proposed for the Commissioner's consideration in my statement is, um, is what I think would make a difference in reducing the risk that I'm currently accountable for. Um, and the, the final thing I would add is that um, obviously um, I'm, I'm doing what I can with what I have now to address um, those risks, but I would like to be able to do more. And what I set out here um, has, in my view, at least the advantage of not only um, more substantively meeting my accountabilities to my people um, in, in a kind of fourth generation sense, but also it would make us uh, more effective operationally. Uh, and you touched on before, you know, the quite distinct natures of each arm of service. Um, and I think you spoke about you know, army being sort of very people and land based as opposed to systems based. Um, do you see this as being a particular solution for army or do you have views about whether or not it is something that would be apt for the other arms of service? Uh, I offer two points, Council. The first is to say I think the principles um, of applying the resource at the point of need. I think a multidisciplinary approach. I think the connection, the um, uh, persistent connection with families. I think they're all principles that would apply whether you're a soldier, a sailor or an aviator. Um, but I wouldn't um, suggest that the model and the the detail of what I've suggested that I think would be best in Army would work for Navy or, or for Air Force. Um, I think it is a completely different situation. It needs to be a Navy-specific design and an Air Force-specific yes. design. And I would just, sorry, just one final point, if I may. I, I, and I've, I think I've noted it in the statement. Even within Army, again, form should follow function. It won't be the same for everyone. Um, but the important thing is to understand what the need is and how to best meet that need in accordance with those principles. But for the majority of the army in the large troop concentrations, that is the model that I think is worthy of consideration and analysis, the design work, and, um, and then the obviously the prioritisation and apportionment of resources. Now, uh, I want to shift topics to Medical Employment Classification Review Boards. Um, in the context of talking about um, military employment classifications in your statement, uh, you describe defence as a service which means placing purpose and others before oneself. Uh, I want to explore with you about how that tension operates, particularly in the MEC Review Board context. Yes. Um, now, am I right to understand that a member who is injured will undergo a medical employment classification process known as a MEC Review Board? Yes. Um, and that board will determine their employment classification? And that employment classification will then in turn inform the member's ability to stay in their position or deploy and the like. That's correct. Just I'll just add that um, uh, obviously someone can be in a medical, uh, a MEC uh, categor categorisation, um, you know, for a period of rehabilitation and then when they have rehabilitated or recovered, be reassessed and, and placed in, you know, a deployable mech, for example. Now, uh, I just want to particularly focus on the procedure 
that's used by those boards. Um, am I right to understand that there are occasions when documents that are to be considered by a MEC review board um, are not always provided to the member? Um, look, I can't answer categorically, but um, that, that may well be the, be the case, yes. Um, and look, no doubt there may be sort of exceptional circumstances, but in terms of this concept of service over self, um, do, do you see any difficulty for that, for example, in terms of affording procedural fairness to an individual whose classification is about to be reviewed? I'm not sure if I understand your question, Council. Sorry. So, uh, is, it, is it in... Sorry. I can, I can yep. break it down. Um, if I'm a member who's about to go before a MEC review board, um, there may be a document that's going to go before the board about the assessment of my suitability for a particular mm -hmm. employment classification. Let's assume that. Um, that document may um, potentially lead the board to reach a negative view <laughs> about my current suitability and my current classification. Do you accept that? Yes, yes understood. Um, is there any reason why um, that process should not start from the position that the member receives that document, not just the board? Well, I think as, as a principal, I would, I would agree with that. And you'd agree that that's because um, these processes can have an incredibly important impact on a member's ability to serve? Yes. Uh, and by extension, has the potential to affect their mental health and well-being, amongst other matters. Yes. Uh, and therefore, as part of that balancing exercise of service and self, it remains necessary for the member to be able to fully engage in the process. You'd agree with that? Yes. Including by responding to material that might reach, might lead the board to reach an adverse conclusion about their position with respect to an employment classification. I think the principle of having the soldier at the centre of this process and uh, transparent communication um, is uh, are, are really important. And in terms of that concept of transparent communication, um, the Commission's been told that members are not ordinarily invited to attend their MEC review boards. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Yes, I am. And we've been told that the reason for that is that their presence may hinder, hinder rather, free discussion um, because the outcome, if it's a negative one, could cause stress to a member. Do you understand that as being the rationale? Um, I, I understand that. I understand the rationale um, you've presented. And instead, what happens is a member would ordinarily just submit a statement to the board. Is that a correct understanding of the process? That's, that's my understanding, yes. That, that's how currently the, the communication is presented. Yep. Uh, but could I ask you to consider the inverse of that proposition, um, particularly the fact of being excluded from that process might in and of itself be something that causes a great deal of stress to a member. You'd agree with that? I can understand that, yes. Um, and being excluded from that process might also cause um, concerns about transparency with that process? Yes, that would be an understandable outcome. A and in turn, that might diminish a member's trust in the MEC review board process. You'd agree with that? I, I think the logic that you've laid out makes sense. Um, given those matters, can you tell me if there's any good reason why members should be excluded from this process, albeit properly supported through it? Well, I, uh, if, if the proposition is that um, there's, you know, uh, are there any good reasons why we would exclude, then I, no, I don't think there are. The the mechanism for the best mechanism for doing that, achieving those principles of soldier-centric, uh, transparent and, in, you know, having a, an open line of communication, uh, exactly how we implement those, I think that's, that's the, 
the matter that we need to, to consider. Uh, now, the Commission's also been told that members who were unwell um, while protected, um, and I use that sort of in, in sort of parentheses, from MEC review boards, will still be presented with their discharge papers. Are you aware of that being a practice that happens? Sorry, if I've understood correctly, that a soldier might be... Excluded from the process um, of the MEC review board, but then presented with their discharge papers. Are you aware of that as a practice? Yes. Um, would you accept that such a practice might cause additional stress or harm to a member? Yes, um, I would also just note, Council, that if there was nothing, I, I would be one surprised and two disappointed if there was no d direct communication with that soldier between the outcome of a medical employment, uh, military employment category review board and a, a discharge. That, that, that it would not, in my view, be acceptable. Yes, and, that, and that's precisely the, the circumstance that I'm talking about. Um, I, I might move topics then if I could. Sorry, Ms. Lawton, Lawton, before we do, I just have one question on this point. Um, and my question would be, are there any moves or thinking, General, in terms of fixing or changing this procedure? Just in terms of natural justice or procedural fairness, essentially a group of people get together, discuss someone, make a decision about what's going to happen to them. Sure, they have paperwork, but the person who's not in the room he or she is not heard, heard. and I, I think we, you and us are on the same page in terms of it's probably not the ideal sort of way to run things. Is there any move to change that or, or to make sure that it's, it's, it's dealt with in a better way so that the person is in the room and heard, otherwise decisions can't be made without them at least getting a chance to say their piece? Oh, I'm, I'm not aware of a, at a particular uh, initiative, but it is a, a point that I and, and other peers, uh, including General Fox, had discussed. Um, and, and I think it would be a, um, a useful outcome. Thank you. I'm happy to hear it's on the table, but I can assure you it's been the subject of much anxiety and angst among people, including people who gave evidence here in public not that long ago. Thank you. I think it is an area we can, we can do better on, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms Longmore. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, General, I want to move to the topic of medical separations and I might just ask if the operator could please uh, display def.99.0164.00 34 and particularly depict um, what's described as table 12.5. While that's coming up, General, um, it's a fair proposition, isn't it, that there's been an increasing trend within the army of medical separations? Yes, Council. Um, have you conducted any analysis on what is causing that increase? Uh, yes. Um, I think um, from if I recall correctly, one of the factors is that uh, previously you could only have one mode of separation um, and there's been a greater focus on including uh, medical separation with, with the express purpose of um, best placing the soldier in terms of what that might mean in their future, the transition uh, that they go through, and then obviously um, their interaction with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And can you just spell out for me what those different modes of transition, give me an example of what those different modes of transition may be. Are you talking about the distinction between, say, a voluntary yes. separation and a medical separation? Yeah. So if I give you an example, uh, I know of one soldier that came to my attention that had been transitioned um, on the basis of a voluntary separation. 
um, some it, it became apparent that, that, it, that they'd had a number of medical issues um, and it would be um, and that that voluntary separation was less advantageous than if they'd been separated on medical grounds. So we're able to have that reviewed and and the basis upon that of that transition, the mode of transition change to medical. Uh, and just playing that out, I mean, obviously you're talking about a cohort who would have medical conditions that would lead to a separation, um, but previously have elected to voluntarily separate. So it's not necessarily the case that um, medical injuries causing a need to separate have materially changed. No, but I think the distinction is that the medical separations are because the medical condition, if you like, is such that it precludes them from continued service, whereas I will transition, you know, voluntarily, um, but I'll take with me a long list of medical issues. But they don't preclude me from serving today, but they will be sort of, uh, you know, features in terms of my relationship with the Department of Veterans Affairs in the future. Um, are there any other insights you have um, based on analysis about the reasons for the increasing level of medical separations? I, um, and, and it's, it's my, the inference that I've drawn from what I know around some of these data points is that we are having some more success with people putting their hands up and saying, hey, I've got this medical issue in the full knowledge that it may preclude them um, from continuing their current employment, um, but that they potentially have some more trust that one, they'll be looked after, or two, there may be other options for them to serve. And, that, and by that, I, I make the distinction um, which is one of the, I think, key features in our system that's changed is we look, look at it through an employability lens rather than a deployability lens. Uh, and in just in terms of that inference you're drawing, um, is there any sort of detailed analysis that allows you to reach an empirical view about whether or not, in point of fact, that is a cause for people separating at higher rates than they did previously? I, I don't have that in the, in the sort of front of my mind or the data immediately available. Um, those are the kinds of questions that we're able to to ask and and generally of um, Joint Health Command of uh, uh, DVA data also helps in terms of understanding what has happened um, and um, Defence Personnel Group and, and obviously the, the new Chief of Personnel Group. So those are the key areas where um, I and my staff would go to ask questions um, and to seek um, data that correlates, helps us to correlate. And so you would accept, would you not, General, um, that it is important to turn sort of assumptions into fact? Absolutely. Um, and so therefore, um, it wouldn't be prudent to operate on the basis of speculation as to the reasons why people are medically separating? No, not at all. Um, and so there needs to be systemic analysis undertaken to really identify the central causes for that medical separation. You'd agree with that? Yes, I do. And is that systemic analysis being undertaken at the moment? Um, I believe it is. Um but going back to our discussion about data and, and systems, I, I think there's, um, there's clearly some more benefit that can be gained. And, and where is that work being undertaken at the moment? Uh, it gets, as I understand it, it's done in a, in a range of areas. It gets done in Joint Health Command, in the Chief of Personnel Group and uh, in the Defence People Group. Now, the as the Chief of Personnel and Defence uh, People Group now work in a 
diarchy, um, exactly where those, uh, the parts of the organisation that do that analysis sit, I think is, is still a matter of, uh, to, to be, be settled. And in terms of the design of that analysis, do you have any say to enable you to get the answers you need to be able to address um, the reasons behind um, medical separations? Uh, my experience is that whenever we've asked, um, uh, we, we've, um, we've been supported. Uh, now, we spoke about this a bit earlier in the examination, but I want to come back to the topic of culture and how you manage culture within Army. You say in your statement that you are quietly confident in Army's ability to continue to positively evolve its culture. You recollect that? Yes. And you reflect on how much it's changed in your experience. But you go on to say that it is something that requires constant attention and regular investment and that Army has more work to do. What do you mean by that? Well, I describe it as it's leader's business. Um, and so as the steward of, of, of the Australian Army, as, an, as a national institution, as a profession and as a fighting force, I have a whole range of accountabilities uh, in each of those dimensions. And each of those dimensions has a past, a present and a future. So that, that's how I conceptualise my obligations and my accountabilities um, to, to our people and, and to our, uh, our army. Uh, a culture, uh, by the way I sort of described it uh, in our discussion earlier, is how well our values are reflected in our, our words and our actions every day. So it is by definition not um, homogenous, it is not even across all parts of the organisation because people are involved and circumstance and environments are involved. So we, we haven't, we, we've articulated our aspiration through our values, but the work of meeting our aspiration and through that meeting the obligation and the accountability I have to our people is is daily work, daily focus and it is a, uh, and needs to be a priority. Uh, and in terms of that daily work and that priority, would you accept that historically at least, um, defence reflecting on its culture has been in large part because of external reviews. So I can mention a few, the Child Abuse mm. Royal Commission, DART, the um, Elizabeth Broderick review following what occurred in ADFA, right back to, I think, um, before the turn of the century, the Grey Review. It, it's, been, it's been external people shining a light on problems with the defence's culture that have forced it to consider change. Would you accept that? I accept that, but I'll, I'll just in context, there are also some good and a recent example in terms of uh, what happened in the, our Special Operations Command post Afghanistan. I think you heard from um, Major General Retired Jeff Singleman earlier in, in the week. Uh, there's an example uh, of a leader who um, listened and was curious and acted. Point. So that was an internal kind of ground up. And I've personally experienced a number of situations where we've been reflective. Um, that's not for a moment to dismiss the point you're making, which I agree with. I just think it's important to notice that there is, there is both in our history. But also in terms of the evidence given by um, Jeff Sengelman, um, he had to push and that ultimately led to... Um, an external inquiry being undertaken by the IGADF. That's correct, and I think it's... I, I would always advocate that there is e external, um, independent uh, analysis or, or um, um, looking at what we... who we are, what we're doing, how well we're doing it. I think it's incredibly important. I think you also heard from the 
independent oversight panel for the um, the Afghanistan inquiry. Those are hugely valuable and necessary um, mechanisms. So I guess it depends on you know how you look at it. I'll always welcome external independent uh, analysis in terms of helping us to see ourselves, um, providing uh, you know a different independent perspective that's not anchored in any kind of bias, and um, b because. But being able to see ourselves uh, is the prerequisite for making the changes that we need to make. Um, now, um, in terms of the mechanisms that you have to actually monitor culture within the army, we've spoken about a few of them earlier today, um, but are you aware of the Enterprise Dashboard Culture Report that was made available following the completion of the Pathway to Change policy? I'm aware of it, yes. And we've been told that um, tailored dashboard reports on culture for each service were available upon request from the Defence People Group. Are you aware of that? Uh, I think so, yes. Um, do you know if you or someone else within Army had cause to request that tailored dashboard report? Um, if I recall, um, we, while that was the case, we didn't need to because they were provided. So I recall, and I'm not sure whether it's this or other data sets, but getting the comparative analysis across the ADF, uh, APS, whole of defence, and then getting a, an I think an individualised army report. Yes. yes. And, and to the if best it's of the same one. And to the best of your recollection, did army receive that individualised tailored report? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Now, um, I want to examine this issue of um, monitoring and addressing negative culture, um, particularly in the leadership accountability space through the prism of, of a particular military justice performance audit report, uh, I might ask the operator to please display IGD.0007.0011.5874 you are familiar with this report, General? Yes, Council. And it pertained to the 8th and 12th Regiment um, within the Army? That's correct. Now, I might just ask um, the operator to turn to the following page um, and expand paragraph 5 um, across two pages in respect of the issues that were identified there. You would accept, would you not, um, General, that there were some very concerning features of culture within that regiment that were identified? Yes, absolutely, Council. There were three uh, aspects that um, one, disappointed me and two, um, surprised me um, that related to the material deficiencies. The one was the one that you've got displayed there in terms of misogynistic behaviours. Um, the other was the lack of trust in the elements of the chain of command below the commanding officer and the third was the sort of more process orientated record keeping uh, and management but it was the first two that and I'll take you to your comments about this particular report that are contained in the document in a minute but but I particularly want to focus on those leadership accountability issues um, it would be fair to say and I think it's recorded in this document that before this um, audit report, the, um, the the brigadier who commanded the first brigade within which this regiment sat was not aware of or had any indication of the issues that existed that it identified. That's right, and I believe that's part of Brigadier Foxhall's testimony. Um, and in terms of 
those issues of monitoring in culture, you would accept that that is a cause for some concern. Yes. Uh, and, and I might just in that respect to give commissioners a context about the size of the regiment within which this was occurring, um, draw your attention to paragraph 15, um, commissioners, where it identifies on dot zero five eight eight five, where it gives you a sense of the size of the regiment in question. I won't. I won't ask the general any questions about it, but it gives you an indication of the size. Now, um, given the relative infrequency of these military justice performance audits. Um, did this give you cause for concern that you don't have adequate mechanisms in place to promptly identify where poor cultures exist within army? Answer that by saying I would like to have more and, uh, and more uh, timely, I suppose, ways of indicating um, and indicating not just to you but indeed to those lower down in the hierarchy of command who have more direct oversight um, of a particular regiment or unit that's that's correct yes uh, and would you accept um, general that this is an instance of where those command accountabilities broke down in terms of being able to monitor where negative culture exists um, I, I don't think there's any um, suggestion that those accountabilities are in any way diminished or skewed. They, they're extant. But in terms of their, uh, the ability of those commanders, the, you know, what mechanisms they had in, in place, and indeed I think um, reading through this report, and Brigadier Fox rules evidence to this commission, um, there were uh, mechanisms in place, but they didn't provide the indicators and warnings, if you like, um, at that level. I did note that, um, and, and I think the, the report, the IGADF report, um, notes uh, that there was confidence in the commanding officer but also that he had specifically asked them uh, to insert a question in their audit, in their focus groups, which was around confirming his curiosity that um, things were not making it uh, to him. So I think th that demonstrated to me that there was command curiosity um, and that either with or without the IGADF um, audit, I, I think, which I think was of great benefit, um, we would eventually have got to it. But eventually is not, not good enough. No, it was a lag indicator. And I think, and I mean, I can take you to it if it's necessary. I might just orient the um, commissioners. It's at dot five nine one five of the document, you're right. Um, the CO asked for a question to be inserted. Do you, ever, do you think everything reported goes to the CO or, get got, or gets blocked? To which the answer was given they believe there are blocks but unsure where there are and that others thought that the blocks occurred at particular levels of command. Yes. Um, and a second question was asked, do you think everything gets dealt with appropriately? And again, groups indicated that there were blocks and said, no, people don't report because it doesn't get taken seriously. Yes. So that was the insights it provided. Mm. I might then go to your own observations about this report, if I could, General. It's a dot triple zero six. Sorry, I'll give the whole document ID again. Um, it's DEF 
dot quadruple nine dot zero zero eight one dot triple zero one. And if you could then turn, please, operator to dot dot triple zero six and expand um, the bottom table. And I just will give you an opportunity, General, just to refresh particularly the, the observations you made in the second paragraph of that table. And that really touches on the evidence you've given earlier as you see this report as identifying two issues. One, an underlying cultural issue, particularly with respect to misogynistic behaviour, so you accept that. Yes. Um, the second aspect of that, though, was an expressed lack of confidence in middle management. Um, so a failure of leadership in respect of a confidence of reporting culture. You'd agree with that? Yes. Now, I just want to take you to the actions that were taken to remedy the issues um, identified in that report. For the purpose of getting you to articulate to the extent to which you can, those actions were directed to addressing the leadership failures that existed in middle management. Um, if the operator could please go to, there are a number of plans we have um, the first is def.1242.0003.0001. Um, Are you familiar with this document, General? Um, and if you could turn then, please, um, operator to dot zero one five seven and dot zero one five eight. Um, uh, and I suggest to you, General, in broad terms, the remedial action were awareness campaigns, training programs, some aspects of leadership um, development and resourcing. But can you identify for the commissioners where in there we find the action to address the middle management leadership failures? I think there's an element uh, amongst most of those areas um, and in particular in dealing with the, the specific rank groups. Um, uh, so the the lack of trust, the failure, as, as you've described it, in middle management council, uh, again, was not um, monolithic. So, for example, there were definite um, failures. Um, and I'll one, use one example I will use is at the one of the class two level. But there was al there's also uh, a note in the IGADF report about a bombardier, so a corporal level, who had done exactly the right things in addressing um, uh, a, a misogynist behaviour mm. in his team at the right time at the right place. Uh, so to, to, and accepting mm. that this is, as you say, not a monolithic yes. um, proposition, what I'm trying to explore with you is, you know, that, con that concept of how um, leaders are held accountable. We're here are there steps to address or hold accountable those middle management failures? Mm. Oh, look, I, what I'd uh, offer is it's probably not, it's probably not explicit in this document, but I know for a fact that that commanding officer, in terms of his counselling, training, mentoring of his subordinates, particularly at the battery level, had focused on, on those issues. The work that I'd referred to in or that was referred to in the previous document around my summary I had the regimental sergeant major of the army engage through the the um, senior enlisted um, community uh, on uh, again coming back to what their accountabilities are the degree to which they've done them and that 
process of counselling, uh, retraining and, and then monitoring and evaluation. And so would it be fair to say, General, consistent with what the evidence you've given earlier today about how cultural accountability is met out, um, we would right, be right to expect that include um, counselling and, if necessary, further um, sanctions with respect to those leaders who have failed? Yes, uh, I'm aware that there are two people who are no longer serving um, the detail of their separation is different, uh, but one in particular was as a direct result of failure. The other, I think, was associated with. Um, I think we discussed before the way that we report on people. I fully expect that's reflected where those shortcomings or failures have have occurred. And then, again, as we discussed those things are then taken into consideration when we are selecting people for subsequent leadership roles and that would be a discriminating factor. So there'd be those dual assurance mechanisms, one sort of direct action to respond to the issue that arose, yes. but the second being recording those failures in a mechanism which will be taken into account when, a, when the member goes to be considered for promotion? Well, not just promotion, but for other jobs. So, for example, that may not be the sort of person that we select to put into a training institution, that may not be the sort of person we would consider for a command appointment and, um, and later on. That document that you've spoken about where those matters are recorded, can, can you identify for commissioners what's it, what it's called? It's the, uh, the annual report. It has a different number. Um, form number, which I don't have in the back of my head, for um, for officers, it's it's uh, right, sorry, it's, it's they're colloquially known as a um, annual performance assessment report. They take different forms depending on you know whether you know it's for a soldier or an NCO or um, or a junior officer or a senior. Um, and and I'll be interested to get. Um, your answer about this. We heard evidence in an e earlier hearing block from a commander of SASR about monitoring positive and negative culture. And one of the mechanisms he suggested was an annual organisational reporting process to assess the effic efficacy of commanders against key metrics and which made transparent to the entire squadron or unit that performance. I is that currently incorporated into those annual performance reports that you've spoken about? I'd say it's, it's variable. So if I take my own accountabilities, for example, there's some very clear metrics in terms of um, landing my budget, you know, within a 2% range. There's very clear metrics around um, you know, some aspects of workplace health and safety, there are very clear metrics about capability, metrics, performance, schedule um, and resources. There's very clear metrics around preparedness and the outputs of the force generation requirements. Um, and there's um, a, a range of other metrics around the targets for things like um, participation of women and, and Indigenous uh, in other areas, I think it's fair to say we've we've more work to do, um, and um, and the, the areas that that this royal commission is is focused on are areas where I think we do have some more work to do to ensure we have the right data. Uh, we're focused on the right things, and we know what that data is telling us in terms of foreshadowing risk, uh, or. Um, uh, equally importantly, telling us whether or not the interventions and the policies and practices are uh, meeting their intended purpose. Uh, and do you have any particular views you would express about um, an annual organisation reporting process such as that, which was re recommended by the SASR commander? No, no I, th I think it's, it's more an extension of, you know, uh, information that's published, whether that's in the um, 
portfolio budget statement, whether that's in um, uh, how the results I'm accountable for are reflected against um, output 2.6. So um, I, I think that in consultation with um, some things like um, 360 degree reporting and those kinds of things, which are already limited features in our system, but how I, I and, and colleagues think we can potentially use those in a, an expanded sense to get a better output. And, and just sort of playing that out in terms of what that might look like, so you'd agree that 360 degree reporting is, uh, is a good tool to use? Yes. Um, you'd agree that it would be important that it has um, metrics specifically with respect to culture? Yes. Um, those metrics should be outcome based, not just activity based. Uh, y yes, and th and there are a there are a range of existing um, tools and mechanisms. The strength deployment index, um, for example, or instrument rather, uh, for example, um, and you you can take uh, qualitative data um, as well as quantitative data, and you focus in on areas where there are one or more standard deviations. So there is, you, you can apply statistical methods to the coalescence of both of those types of data to give you insight and then to focus attention. And you'd agree as well, would you not, that it would be ideal if those metrics were made transparent to the entire unit, for example, so that everyone knows the measure by which a commander's performance will be assessed? I think I think that's a it's a feature of our performance system in terms of the reports we write on people at all levels. Um, so I, yeah, I think transparency is a always a good thing. Uh, now I just want to shift then, if I could, to the topic of transition from the defence force. Um, we heard evidence earlier this week from um, the chief of personnel. Lieutenant General Fox about some of the initiatives she is involved in introducing to mm. ensure that transition from members from military to civilian life. You would accept, would you not, that that, is, that can be a real point of risk for members? Y yes, well, I think we, we all understand that to be one of the key a And so key in, areas. in terms of that time of risk, um, do you play much a role or, or does Army have specific programs in place to prepare members for life as a civilian or is that really now solely within the responsibility of the Chief of Personnel? Well, I, again, it's a, it's a good example of shared accountabilities. So within Army, the, the, the relevant chain of command has a role to play because they are still accountable for those people. Um, we've got some uh, organisational resources, um, generally experienced warrant officers in our areas of, of uh, troop concentration um, that um, assist people with, whether it's trade transfers, for example, um, but those are generally associated with a conversation about transition as well, because uh, it's often a, a soldier who's thinking about transition, um, whom their chain of command may have said, hey, listen, that's an option, but there may be some other options. Let's sit down. And it's not to um, to dissuade, it's just to make sure that that soldier is properly informed and armed with all of the information, um, including the capacity to make, you know, to include family, and to make, um, you know, to use things like, you know, conditions of service calculators to ensure they're making an informed decision. So there's that aspect within Army. There's the Joint um, Transition Authority, uh, which in my view has been um, uh, one necessary and two quite successful since its inception and particularly managing the, what was I think fair to say a gap between defence and DVA. And then, of course, I'm aware that uh, DVA are doing a, a range of things. So how does 
I think a really important aspect in supporting that sort of longitudinal view is is having the, the data available. And in terms of that data that is available, um, do you know if commanders or, or those who are wrapping around members as they're transitioning are given information from the transition preparedness questionnaire? I don't know the answer. Okay. Um, do you think that commanders would benefit from more information about the health and preparedness of members to transition to be able to really lean in and give them the support they need? Uh, yes, and I, I know that that does happen, particularly in relation to medical readiness and that we um, – the, the number 99 comes into my head in terms of the last – 12 months where we've retained people in service pending the resolution of specific medical conditions. And is that... Oh, sorry, can I just caveat that? That's yes. that's a recollection. I've, I've, I can't say that's entirely that's correct. That's fine. To the best of your recollection, does that have to occur with the consent of the member? Uh, absolutely, yes. It, it, it would um, necessarily require a conversation to ensure that that's meets the requirements and the wishes of that, that member. And I think one of the things that has been a theme of evidence during this hearing block are um, medical incompetence and broader Privacy Act um, obligations and how there is a tension between those in terms of protecting the confidence of the individual but the related risk that those responsible for their care don't have the information they need. Um, in the particular context of transition, do you have any views about where those gaps lie and if the balance is right? Um, look, I, I do mention in my statement this issue uh, around privacy. Um, and I think I'm based on the principle that soldier-centric, transparent and communication um, face-to-face -face communication, I, I think it, um, at what you've uh, identified, I think, correctly as a, a point of heightened risk, those principles become more important rather than less important. Um, do you receive any data about how former members fare during transition and after separation? Uh, not in an aggregated sense, mostly um, anecdotal. Uh, and in terms of those observations you've made more broadly within your statement about the benefits of longitudinal aggregated data, uh, do you think you would be better assisted to help members through transition if you had that information? Yes. I, I think understanding uh, the experience post helps us to analyse the effectiveness of the measures we put in place prior to and, and during uh, transition. Um, can I shift then, uh, General, to the topic of recruitment and workforce planning? Firstly, just focusing on the information that Army receives about recruits upon joining service. Um, are you aware of whether or not Army receives information about pre-existing vulnerabilities that a recruit might have, be they physical or psychological, when they enter an ab initio institution? Um, there is now, I think, as of quarter three or four of 2023, um, in the case where an ab initio trainee is subject of a waiver, there is some transfer of, I think, general information around the substance of that waiver that is provided um, to the recruit training battalion. But that's, that's only a recent step. And beyond that particular circumstance of waiver, mm. um, is Army provided with information about pre-existing physical or psychological um, concerns a, a recruit may have? Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. 
And do you know the reason for that? I, I think it relates uh, to those matters being in, in confidence, so medical confidence, uh, psychological incompetence, and and to your point about privacy. And do, do you have a view about whether or not a balance could be struck whereby um, Aboriginal training institutions don't receive necessarily granular level detail, but enough whereby they know where to lean in in terms of supports? Do you see the benefits of that? I think that's um, essential if we're to um, fulfil our obligations to their health and well-being and and um, again anecdotally the feedback I've had um, from our team at One RTB is that you don't need all the detail but if you know who and broadly speaking where to look then you can actually proactively lean in and um, and if you're aware of it you can then make sense of you know, what, what might occur during training with that recruit um, or you can proactively um, engage with them, uh, you know, without um, sort of producing a confidence. Um, but, but again, uh, it comes back to the principle of soldier-centric and transparent and the ability to communicate directly. Um, and, General, um, just focusing particularly on the mechanisms by which you manage that health and safety of members in ab initio um, training institutions, do you know if there are any um, current processes about analysing members' fitness or health conditions on recruitment against subsequent outcomes such as injuries or separation? So, sorry, Councillor, if I understand your question, it's about the the experience in training or prior to it's the, in, the It's the intersection between recruitment standards and then member outcomes, particularly with respect to injury and um, separation. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, can, can I ask, are you, are you referring to indexed entry standards and that approach? Yes. Okay, so if I may then, I'd offer a few points. Firstly, um, there is a, uh, a set of standards required for employment, so that's when the soldier or the officer is fully trained. Um, those, um, th those are uh, an example of where there's a functional requirement. They have not changed. What we decided to do in 2021 was a trial of what were called indexed entry standards where we changed the physical standards at the point of entry um, but used the training system to be able to invest in the physical fitness of those soldiers so they could meet that employment standard. Now, um, those standards um, were were changed um, in the in w with an assessment of risk. So they weren't sort of arbitrarily chosen. So, for example, the beat test um, was a requirement of six point one rather than a seven point five. For example, number of push ups. Um, that kind of thing, um, but always um, with the view that we would use the longitudinal sort of training system to apply one of our strengths, which is how we train people, to, to meet their employment um, standard. That has resulted in, in, to your point about recruitment and retention and the challenges we currently have, and I think it's seven, in the order of 778 soldiers that would otherwise not be serving in our army today. So I was just going to go to the point yes, about yes. Uh, then understanding, okay, um, what, what was the cost of that? What were the risks? Um, and um, I, I think it's in the tender bundle. There's, there's a, a report that provides some of those metrics in terms of presentation for a medical appointment, presentation for medical consultation, um, uh, 
prevalence of, uh, in terms of uh, separation in training and the, um, the difference between the, let's call it the standard population and those who came in on indexed entry standards um, is, uh, in my view, uh, sufficiently um, small to, to say that this is something that we um, would institutionalise. And when you say sufficiently small, um, do you mean that there has been an increase in those risks, so medical presentation or the like, but not enough to give you cause for concern? Or what, what do you mean by that? So the, the advice that uh, I received that accompanied that report was that the variation was not statistically significant. And I think one of the... Um, just trying to think what the metric that's in my mind. There's, there's basically a two percent difference, and that was a two percent increase or decrease. Two percent above, yeah. yes. Um, just going then back to those indexed entry standards. Uh, did you have input into um, how those were altered? Was that before your tenure as chief of? Uh, it was before my my tenure, but I do know that. Um, that there was analysis done and, and obviously you need subject matter expertise um, to, to make those kinds of decisions and set those standards. So I know for a fact that the physical standards um, were the result of um, doing a risk calculus to ensure that we didn't inc incur um, the, you know, the additional risk on the individual, on the soldier, but also on the institution. And beyond what you've spoken about in terms of the report that's in the tender bundle, do you know if there's ongoing monitoring of those standards to ensure the risks don't increase? Yes, there are. And there's a longitudinal monitoring of those initial cohorts that entered and are serving. So that those, I think it's 778 soldiers who are currently serving, there, there is, as I understand it, um, a an ongoing plan to continue to monitor their outcomes um, as compared to uh, the standard population. And, and that, um, those indexed entry standards are one example of how Army has um, tried to address, would it say, workforce hollowness? It's a mechanism to ensure you get more recruits. Yeah, how, how do we... How do we, the, the terms we use are reduce barriers to entry where it makes sense and where it, you know, we're not in increasing um, the risk for our people. Um, and General, you'd be aware, no doubt, that following the Defence Strategic Review, um, there was an accepted workforce recommendation to develop and change policy risk settings to improve recruitment targets by 2024. Yes. Um, are there any other particular adjustments of policy or risk settings that you can speak to arising out of that particular recommendation? Um, there's, there is one um, uh, that I think is a good example and, the, and I think my colleague General Fox may have um, addressed it with you. And that is um, young people who, you know, were mo most recently high school students uh, who have sought throughout their education to seek support, uh, either from a school counsellor, from a psychologist, uh, through family. Like, in other words, those who put their hand up or been, uh, you know, encouraged to put their hand up and seek help. Um, and have um, used that help to succeed in their in their secondary education. Um, I think the the way our system worked previously was that that would be a barrier to entry. In in other words, you have had mental health, you know, support or, or issue. Um, there's almost a perverse logic in that. In that these are exactly the kinds of behaviours: the self awareness, putting your hand up and saying, "Hey, I need I need help." Uh, just in the same way as you would if you, um, you know, twisted your ankle or broke your leg. Um, they're the kind of people we do want.
and and particularly if we can bring them in, um, and um, that's that's normal for them, then th they're our future. They're our future leaders, and that's how you start to normalise that approach. So that that's one one example that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, finally, General, um, you spoke earlier about the the role this Royal Commission has played in terms of your evolving understanding of suicide and suicidality. Um, could you give commissioners, to the extent you haven't already, any principal learnings and takeaways you've had from the evidence that's occurred across the course of the last couple of years? Certainly, thank you um, for the opportunity. Um, I've already um, offered what I think I've learned personally, and obviously that then gets applied in uh, in my obligations. Um, looking at this um, in terms of my obligations to everyone who's serving in our army today, I've laid out in my statement some areas that I will seek your consideration of because uh, that that is delivering. Um, health and wellbeing support at the point of need, resolving our data challenges to harness the true insight that they will give us and ensuring that there is proper resourcing, additional resourcing to uh, ensure that your recommendations are feasible for people like me and, and my service chief colleagues and others to implement. And so I, I would seek your consideration in, in terms of uh, helping me to uh, do a better job in Army of, of those specific recommendations. Uh, those, of course, will sit within a much broader set of ADF, Department of Defence, DBA and, and broader um, recommendations because I know that you're looking at this through a, a government and a community lens um, as well. So I would, would just um, seek your consideration of those specific uh, measures um, to, to be taken uh, forward in your consideration. Thank you. And so, General, I understand you to be saying that um, you see adequate resourcing to be one potential challenge in terms of implementing the recommendations of this Royal Commission? Yes. Uh, as one of my specific um, points of recommendation to commissioners, um, look at things through a strategic lens. Uh, a st strategy has an ends, ways and means. I think the ends are very, very clear. The, the ends are we don't want anyone to die by suicide. Uh, the ways uh, have been, I think, um, certainly the subject of our discussion today, um, uh, but over the years that the Royal Commission has been um, in effect, um, I think we're all uh, far better informed in terms of how we start getting after these challenges. Um, uh, that. So I think we're we're good there, but the the means, the resources, will we'll need to be analysed. Uh, as I said in my statement, we'll probably need to use some of our resources in different ways. Um, but but given our uh, current set of circumstances, uh, it's hard for me to see a way ahead for a successful strategy without having it properly resourced. Thank you, General. Thank you, Commissioners. I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms Longbottom. Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, General. I, I've just got a few questions, if I could. You talked um, earlier on about uh, there being a change over a number of years in the leadership focus and now focusing more on how you lead and creating that positive climate and a positive environment. Can you describe to us when you think that change occurred and why? That's a good question, Commissioner Brown. Um, in, in my experience, um, I, I'd say it's a, a generational set of changes. 
uh, the army I joined was the sort of post Vietnam era armies. Uh, so my generation took um, a lot from what was invested in us, the good and the not so good. And uh, you, you learn as a leader through experience. And that's one of the strengths, I think, uh, of our army and the way we, we not only train and educate, but experience our leaders so that you are not coming to a leadership or a command position, you know, uh, you know, from a, a zero a baseline. You, you've had foundational experiences. You've learned uh, through those uh, experiences. And for each generation, it's been, it's been a little, little different. So we built on what, what has come before us. Um, and y y no leader cannot be influenced by the people that they are privileged to lead. And it's that um, insight, the humility and the empathy, those qualities that I think have, uh, have grown and we now directly seek and insist upon in our leaders that has potentially been the biggest change ac across generations and that ought to continue. And I appreciate those comments, um, General, but what it suggests in the way that you presented it is that it's inherent on the individual and their capacity for reflection and self-awareness and, you know, kind of awareness of those around them rather than a deliberate um, change in the approach of defence. Would that be an accurate...? Um, I, 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 I think in one sense that's, that's a fair observation, but I, I would also offer that... There are, so people like me, I'm, I'm accountable as the steward of our profession. Um, w we have um, looked at aspects of our profession, um, but this year we are going to do a, an assessment of the state of our profession. And I've just in the US in the last couple of weeks and they, uh, the US Army uh, do this in a very structured um, and routine way. And so I was very fortunate to convene a panel to, to discuss our approach uh, to doing this. And, and, and why do I think we need to do this? Well, there are three things that shape the landscape and the environment that our army operates in today. The first is the ongoing impact of the war in Afghanistan. The second is national defence, the Defence Strategic Review, which is, I think, of the same generational uh, weight as the 1987 white paper. And the third is this Royal Commission. So we need to deliberately understand the environment in which we operate, where we've been, where we need to go, and where are we today? What is the state of our profession? How does that impact on our culture, our ability to do our job, which is to prosecute land operations as part of that, that integrated force? Um, if you look at the work that the CDF has commissioned over um, the last few years in terms of prioritising and um, effectively demanding in a focus on making sure we get the, the foundational philosophical doctrine right for command, leadership, ethics, because that is the wellspring of um, all of our training at all levels across our organisation. So how do you make a strategic impact? So um, there's, there's a bit of both, um, but strategic leaders institutional leaders have, in my view, an obligation to take uh, an institutional and a strategic approach to things like our profession, like our culture, like our ability to fight and win our nation's wars. Um, General, I've, I've got a few questions. I want to try and get through them quickly. I'll so try I'll and be a bit <laughs> briefer, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, you talked about the um, need for better predictive analysis, particularly around health and wellbeing. Um, and, I, and I think I know the answer to this, but just so that I'm absolutely clear, um, in terms of the ERP, that is still not going to draw upon data that sits in the ex-service experiences, so the DVA data. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, Commissioner. 
Thanks, Steve. I, um, sorry, a, a platform that does allow the integration across departmental boundaries, I think, is... The DSEC. Important. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know whether there was any input? We heard this morning from Professor McFarlane, who talked about the importance of uh, clinicians having input into um, not only systems, but particularly data collections, etc. Do you know whether the health clinicians have any input into the development of the ERP? Uh, yes. So the Joint Health Command is part of that um, uh, ERP governance group, as I understand it, and sits around the same table as the services and the other groups in terms of uh, requirements. With all due respect to um, Joint Health Command, can I just check whether it included frontline service, people who are predominantly frontline service delivery people as opposed to, I know, clinicians, perhaps like myself, who operate more in the administrative sphere than the frontline sphere? I, I don't know, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, you talked about, uh, you, you, Council asked the question about the skills and qualifications of um, those who undertake the training in the training institutions and whether or not they should be, in a sense, professionalised. Um, and you indicated that, you know, there's a need, I guess, for everyone to learn to be a trainer and, and to have those skills. Um, but you do have some professional educators who help do the curriculum review. I'm just wondering whether you had any thoughts about whether maybe a hybrid model might work in the training institutions because, you know, I appreciate the need for everyone to learn but what you're essentially saying is you learn and then you do very quickly and then you go and do something else um, as opposed to having that, you know, ex that, that real expertise um, in doing it. I mean, I'm a medical practitioner specialising in psychiatry. Um, I wouldn't go and try and do any surgery these days, you know, like, um, although it's a very bad analogy, I know, but, um, you know, like, why not have some professional educators training your recruits? I guess I would offer that when we train people, so any promotion course has a significant component on teaching people how to train, increasingly how to, to mentor and how to coach. Um, and the skills that they are training are the skills that they have mastered. Um, so they're, they're teaching you know, from a position of, of strength because they, they have those skills. Um, so there's that internal uh, requirement. The other um, operational application that we need to ensure, and we have soldiers um, who've, who've done, you know, been trained how to train, um, out, who have been out teaching Ukrainian civilians how to become soldiers. So we do a whole range of work with partners around the region and around the world where all of our people need to know how to teach, train, coach, mentor. It's part of our operational requirement and, and so that it sort of reinforces the internal training requirement. It is, as you say, though, informed by um, professional educators when it comes to curriculum and designing the train-the-trainer packages and the like. Um, you talked about the issue of healthcare and other supports for families, but if I focus just on the healthcare for families, particularly in those remedial, uh, regional or remote areas, do you have a thought about how that could be addressed? For example, uh, should we move to a US model where in those settings defence actually provides the health care for family members? I think that would be an optimal model. I, feasibility, I guess, would be the, be the question. Um, you know, one of the things I've asked my team to look at is you know, we have some phenomenally um, good medical professionals that serve in uniform, many of them, you know, part-time. Um, how can I harness them and move them around to our, where our people are to deliver those uh, services? Now, there are some uh, policy and sort of, you know, legislative um, things that need to be uh, addressed there, but I think we need to be creative 
in those solutions. And if I may, sorry, just use this opportunity. It's not just uh, the access to healthcare, other there's some very um, important things like, and I would use childcare as the number one example of something that could make a difference for our people, uh, particularly those that are serving, you know, sort of above the Tropic of Capricorn in what um, professionals who know about these things have described as childcare deserts. Mm. That's one of the key challenges for our our families because if you can't get childcare, um, you can't get respite, but you could also mean that partners can't work. If you can't work, that has all sorts of implications as well. Um, and look, uh, just one last question. You talked about the obligation you have um, to those who are serving today. Um, I just wondered whether you would offer a comment to about your obligation to those who are now ex-serving members of the Australian Army. And I guess I'm thinking there, because uh, the Chief of Navy spoke about his views, about his responsibility in that space, but I'm particularly keen to understand your views about where there have been past wrongs. Um, and I'm aware of a particular instance where I know that you've taken an intervention, um, someone I saw um, and who outlined to me the action that you took, which was life-changing for them, um, dealing with a past issue. But just if you have any comments. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think I described in the discussion with Council that the way I conceive uh, of our army is as a national institution, a profession, a fighting force with a past, present and a future. I consider I have obligations and accountabilities in all of those dimensions. Um, and as the professional head of the organisations, um, I, I do feel I have an obligation to our, to our veterans. Now, what I can practically do about that uh, obviously is subject to some limitations. Um, the, the engagement you, you spoke of is, is one way of, of doing that. Um, I think there are not enough hours in the day and I'm not even going to permit to do that for everyone. Um, but in terms of setting the conditions and the way that we view our responsibilities and connecting or remaining connected with our veterans, providing that opportunity for connection is something that we are working on. Um, and in on Army's birthday this year, on the 1st of March, the message I sent out to our Army is um, reach out to a veteran and share their stories of their experience and share yours with them and create that connection. Thank you very much, General. Thank you, Commissioner Bangless. Thank you very much, General, for your evidence. Apropos of Commissioner Brown's last question, a fairly common theme amongst people talking to us who are veterans is the abrupt um, way in which access to bases ceases as soon as they retire or, or transition. And I gather that was brought in as a security measure post 9-11. Is there any thought about um, enabling some access of veterans, at least for a period, back to see their friends on base? Um, short answer, I don't know, Commissioner, but certainly take that away. Thank you. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask was about uh, your views about delivery of health and wellbeing support at the point of need and you said that uh, to advance it you'd argue through the vice chief of the defence force for a segment review would that then need to go through the committee structure to be approved or could that be approved simply by the vice chief no, that, that would be approved by the, the vice chief so previously that function occurred in the services uh, with the organisational changes to get commonality and an aggregate view of force design, that now resides with the Vice Chief 
uh, and then in terms of use, you know apportioning our people against the CDS priorities against that design, mm. that's the chief of personnel's role. So that's that's how that works now, okay. rather than those functions being in the services. So it wouldn't even go through the chiefs of service committee. Uh, no. Thanks. Thank you, General. I just have three quick issues I want to get through. Um, you talked about the things that um, impact and affect the environment, the operating environment at the moment. One of them is the impact of the Afghanistan war and no doubt the inquiries that followed it. Um, and we've certainly heard some evidence uh, about the issue of continuous or rather uh, numerous multiple deployments where people have had to go back again and again and again. And it, we've also heard some evidence that there was a strong focus on sending those from special forces rather than infantry or any other group. I just wondered whether you felt that was the case and whether you think that could have perhaps been handled better and if there's any lessons learned out of it. So there isn't that focus. We've heard a lot of evidence from special forces, uh, members and families and former members, about the impact that those multiple deployments, 9, 10, 11, 12 deployments, has had on the individual and their families. I, look, I, I think um, it's well accepted that that the, the situation that you described, Commissioner, is uh, is indeed the case, and and we had the discussion earlier about the respite policy as one example of how uh, what we've learned uh, has been applied. Um, there are a whole range of other uh, factors. From from my perspective, uh, again, I have an obligation to ensure we learn the right lessons from that war and the other operations that we were involved in, they fall into three categories. One is our failings as a profession. Uh, two are, you know, how do we look after the people that have been damaged and their families? Uh, and three, obviously, are the, the, the legal processes that are at our arm's length, but they will continue to impact over the coming years. We learned a lot operationally. Some of it will be very useful in our future. Some of it we will need to consign to the past. I appreciate that and I appreciate you were not in the position you're in now through most of those conflicts in the Middle East, but um, I just wondered whether you want to express or can express an opinion about whether the leadership of the ADF at the time should have said no, there's too strong a focus on special forces. We're flogging them, basically, and we need to look at the alternatives. And there were apparently alternatives that could have been utilised. Did you have? You want to express a view about that? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, but Commissioner, I, I, I don't think as a as a general principle, um, I, I think it's important to learn from, um, but but I'd be pretty confident that the people who had the accountabilities at the time did what they thought was right at the time. So I, d I don't want to sit in, no, in, I understand. in judgment I'm not of, pressing you on that. of that. No, I understand. Um, just two other quick issues. We've heard also some evidence about reservists being treated or feeling like they're second class citizens in terms of entitlements. And, and in fact, I think we've discussed a bit of that today with um, uh, Professor uh, McFarlane. Um, I'm just wondering whether, do you feel that is the case? Is there something that could be done in terms of ensuring that reservists are treated? I mean, if you're a reservist or a full-timer, surely if you break a leg or uh, get injured in some way, it shouldn't matter whether you're a reservist or a full-timer. The treatment, you would think, would be the same. Uh, I don't use the term reservist. So if you, you if you wear our uniform, whether it's part-time, full-time, you're an Australian <laughs> soldier, full stop. We have the policy, it's called the Total Workforce System, the Service Category System, that supports that view and it's about how do we value that service. Um, so, it, therefore, my answer to your question is I think that's a... If, you, if you're injured in the nature of in, in rendering service, I don't think your service category ought to matter. Okay, no, understood. Um, the last thing I just wanted to raise, and uh, you may or may not want to have a look at your statement, perhaps if we can pull it up, it's SST Sierra Sierra Tango dot one zero zero one zero zero one sorry triple zero one dot zero zero two eight. I think it's page twenty eight of your statement. 
perhaps if we could expand the um, points 112 to 116, perhaps, or 117. Um, I, I just want to make it perfectly clear, General, this is not in any way a criticism of you or the other service chiefs. You've inherited a lot of this stuff, and I understand that. But um, So here you're discussing um, the diversity and inclusion and your efforts to attract and support, retain and support women, and, and then later on you go on to initiatives in relation to attract, retain and support Indigenous uh, members to join. Um, it just struck me that there is not one mention, and it's across the ADF, it's not just Army, of anyone from a non-English speaking background or a culturally and linguistically diverse community, Calb as they call them. And it's absolutely no criticism of you, but it struck me as an anomaly in 2024 that a major government department, and it's, as I say, it seems to be across the ADF, it's not just you, there is no mention of anyone from a non-English speaking background. If I could just add one other thing before you give me your views. Um, you'd be aware that in the, out of the last census in particular, I think in New South, New South Wales, some, somewhere between 30 and 40, and I'm happy to stand corrected on a percent of the population, is in fact someone who uh, has either one or both parents born overseas or speaks another language at home, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly Australia is a very diverse society and it will continue to be so and probably grow. It just seems an anomaly at a time when the ADF is struggling for recruiting, that no one is targeting that, that space or thinking about that space or talking about that space. Um, a lot of the emergency service um, organisations went to South West Sydney and continue to do so and ran recruitment programs that have yielded very good results. But I'm, I'm happy to be corrected, but I could not see one mention in efforts in diversity and inclusion about anyone from a diverse background, a non-English speaking background. No, I think your observation is correct, uh, Commissioner. I'll just offer a couple of things. Firstly, um, uh, th these are areas of focus uh, and my understanding is that um, they were deliberately chosen as the areas of focus to try and focus effort rather than to try and do everything. Let's do some things well as a starting point. Um, but they're not meant to be exclusive. And I sit before you today um, as the Chief of Army who comes from uh, a diverse ethnic and cultural background. So, um, and, and if you, uh, and I know you've visited some of our units, if, if you look around, um, that is, as you say, an increasing um, aspect. Um, could we uh, do more? I think. The answer is is yes, and we've always got to be um, engaged with and representative of the society that we serve. Uh, thank you. I, I guess, I mean, I don't think anyone's sort of getting up in the morning and saying we won't focus on these communities, but the, the end result, if, if, if it's not being discussed and not being you know, prioritised and, and talked about, um, that, that what may well be the outcome. We've covered a lot of ground today. I don't propose to go into a lot of the nitty gritty, but there were just some uh, broader picture issues that I'm happy to have discussed with you. Thank you, General. Uh, could I add to the conversation that actually um, Lieutenant General Fox told us the other day that just under a third of the services are culturally and linguistically diverse. Mm. So and accepting that it's a volunteer thing is that no one's obliged to uh, nominate their background. But Thank you. But I think your point about could we be more deliberate is, is a valid one. And we, we actually have in some particular aspects of our groups. Thank you. Uh, Mr Berger, are there any questions you wish to raise? Thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to check with General Stewart whether there was anything else you wanted to tell the Commission that hasn't been covered today. Um, thank you. Um, if I may, um, firstly, I, I just wanted to go to um, and, and acknowledge the, the courage in particular of the lived experience witnesses you've heard from um, and, and the many others um, that I and, and other senior leaders in the Army have engaged with outside of the, the Royal Commission. I think it takes a lot to, to come forward publicly and I, I just want to acknowledge that courage. 
The other thing I want to do and to put on the record is as the Chief of the Australian Army, past and present, I offer an unreserved and sincere apology to everyone whom we have failed. Thank you. I haven't finished, Commissioner. Take your time. Um, I want to thank you for your service and uh, and to let you know that that your courage will make a difference. The second group of people I want to uh, to address are the nearly fifty thousand Australians who are serving in our army's uniform today around our country and overseas and their families and to thank them for the phenomenal work that they are doing to build trust in their teams, build trust with the community we serve and build uh, trust with the government that we serve. I'm incredibly proud of you um, and I'm incredibly proud to have the privilege to be um, your leader, your chief. Uh, can I also thank the Royal Commission to the commissioners, to council assisting, to all of the team. This is difficult work, really difficult work. Um, so thank you for for what you do and the difference that your work uh, will make. Um, and I, I don't think there's uh, any of us that will walk away from this experience uh, without being um, indelibly impacted in some way, shape or form. And if I can finish just by saying that um, to the point that commissioners are, um, are seeking an assurance about ownership, I can give you that assurance. I own this problem, we own this problem, and we are committed to doing something about it. As I said, there are three generational influences on the today and the future of the Australian Army. One is is the um, what I call the long shadow of Afghanistan. Uh, the other is our um, defence policy as articulated through the strategic review. And the third is this Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. Thank you. No further questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr Berger. Ms Longbottom. Nothing further, thank you, Commissioners. May Lieutenant General Stuart be excused from his summons to appear? Certainly. General, we just want to thank you for your evidence today. We want to thank you for your cooperation and assistance over the last few weeks and months uh, in helping us gather information and gain access to you and others to discuss issues. Uh, as someone who's been involved in dealing with traumatised people and victims for decades, I can, t I can assure you, uh, a heartfelt apology will go a long way and I hope others take note of what you've said today. You're excused from your summons to appear today. And thank you. If there's no other issues, we might just adjourn for 15 minutes. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 3 p.m.
The Royal Commission into Defence of Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Ms. Benton. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Commissioners, this afternoon we have Mr. Gregory Bynes, the CEO of Comcare, and Mr. Justin Napier, the General Manager of Regulatory Operations of Comcare. I understand my learned friend would seek to... Yes, if we could take appearances. Commissioners, I appear with my learned friend, Ms. Goldstein, on behalf of Comcare, Mr. Vines, and Mr. Napier. Okay, sorry, your name for the record? Enbom, E-N-B-O-M. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I ask that Mr. Vines and Mr. Napier are administered an affirmation, please? To you, Greg Vines, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. To you, Justin Napier, solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Vines, would you please state your full name? Uh, Gregory Joseph Vines. And your position? Uh, Chief Executive Officer of Comcare. And Mr Napier, would you please state your full name? Justin Boyd Napier. And your position at Comcare? General Manager, Regulatory Operations Group. Thank you. Uh, Mr Vines, you've previously given three statements to the Commission. One dated 11 August 2023, one 31 August 2023 and one 27 October 2023. Are there any changes that you wish to make to any of those statements? No, there's not, thank you. And are the contents of those statements true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, commis commissioners, I would seek to tender the tender list. Operator, would you please display the list? And I would seek to tender the documents on the list on the basis on which they're described in the list. The tender list is three pages, commissioners. Thank you, Ms. Patton. So it'll be accepted on that basis and allocated the next lot of numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first topic that I would seek to address is just briefly um, clarifying Comcare's role and Defence's scope of responsibility. If I could start with confirming Comcare's role, um, Mr. Vines, I'll direct most of my questions to you, unless it's um, obvious that it's something that um, for Mr. Napier, as the Commission understand it and uh, understands it. Part of Comcare's statutory responsibilities under section 152, subsection two of the WHS Act include to monitor and enforce compliance with the WHS Act. Yes, that's correct. And to provide advice and information on WHS to duty holders under the Act. Yes. And the, I'll just refer it to the WHS Act to be more efficient, but the WHS Act imposes a primary duty of care on a person conducting a business or undertaking to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, a physical and psychologically safe and healthy workplace. Yes, that's correct. And in this case, defence is the person conducting a business or under undertaking? Yes, the Department of Defence. And approximately how much of Comcare's regulatory business does defence take up? Uh, we estimated around 20%. So would you agree there is benefit to both Comcare and Defence in Defence focusing on more prevention efforts with an aim to reduce demand in the long term? Uh, yes, absolutely. And as we understand it, Comcare works on the basis of a cost recovery model? Yes. Operator, would you please display COM 0001-0028 Zero zero one at zero zero three seven, Mr. Vines the, at paragraph. So at page zero zero three seven, and if we could please expand paragraph seventy, Mr. Vines, this is your statement from twenty seven October twenty twenty three, and in the second sentence there, you've stated, in order to accommodate any expanded regulatory role in respect of the ADF additional resources would need to be cost recovered or funding sourced from the Department of Defence. Alternatively, Comcare would require an appropriation from the Australian Government 
for the purposes of resourcing any additional regulatory role in respect of the ADF. The Commission understands this to mean that where further initiatives or action is needed, Defence can be responsible for funding the required resources. Is that correct? The, under the cost recovery model, there is a, an automatic funding for the specific work that we do. However, for some of our larger PCBUs, we do enter into uh, what we call a regulatory program, which will be a more targeted, uh, a more focused program to meet the needs of that particular PCBU, and uh, we cost recover for those. Um, does Comcare proactively identify further initiatives or action that would improve Defence's compliance with the WHS Act or improve its ability to ensure the health and safety of ADF members? Uh, yes. Do we, in a general sense, do you mean? Yes, yes. yes. And to your knowledge, has Comcare requested additional resources in terms of cost recovery funding from the Department of Defence? Not to my knowledge, no. And have you sought an appropriation from the Australian Government in order to increase um, Comcare's regulatory capacity over defence? No, we haven't because we don't really get an appropriation for our regulatory activities. And in terms of what you said before, in terms of a, a larger program and you have arrangements, um, can you just very briefly explain how that works and whether you can lean on that to get more funding for more initiatives? Uh, well, there, these um, regulatory programs are by agreement between Comcare and the relevant um, PCBU and so the uh, costing arrangements for those, the funding arrangements are part of those agreements uh, and we will work with those um, organisations to identify what the priority areas are, what the scope of that uh, relationship would need to be and, and then um, uh, cost it accordingly. Operator, would you please display COM 0001 0021 at 0017. This is your first statement, Mr Vines, dated 11 August 2023. Sorry, 0017. Sorry, that was my... That was not clear. At paragraph 48. Just while that's coming up, this paragraph is directed to what a PCBU needs to do in a practical terms to discharge the duty to ensure risk to psycho so psychological health and safety in the workplace are eliminated or minimised so far as is practicable. Um, you set out the elements there, but in summary, a PCBU needs to identify reasonably foreseeable psychosocial hazards assess the psychosocial risks, control the psychosocial risks and review the effectiveness and revise control measures. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then over the page on 0018 at paragraph 51, um, you also emphasise that PCBUs are required to be proactive about um, preventing psychosocial hazards and risks. That's yes, that's correct. So the key point is that defence needs to be proactive in identifying and mitigating psychosocial risks and hazards. Yes, that's right. Do you think that there are any features that limit defence's ability to be proactive or more proactive in this space? No, I don't think there are any restrictions on their capacity to um, be proactive. I think in any large complex organisation, there are always challenges in translating that proactivity into action, if I can use that expression. Um, and I think particularly in an organisation like Defence, that, that can be a barrier to embedding a lot of these proactive practices uh, into general management practices, into, into general workforce practices. So from your perspective, there's no issue with um, culture in terms of de defence being more proactive in terms of psychosocial hazards or risks? Uh, I think culture is part of that complexity of large organisations and I think the uh, culture in defence is um, undoubtedly a, a contributing factor to uh, the capacity for proactivity and effective work health and safety management as well. And, and what about data limitations? Is um, the data that def defence has, is that 
a limitation on being more proactive in this space? Um, I can't comment specifically on the nature of the defence data. I'm not um, personally exposed to it. However, I would say generally that uh, for organisations within our jurisdiction, data is a challenge, um, both the collection of it, but I think more importantly, the analysis of that data. And, and indeed, it's a problem for Comcare itself, uh, both in terms of our capacity to gather that data from our PCBUs. And I would again imagine, due to the complexity of defence, it would be even more an issue uh, in that environment. Um, and the final issue I wanted to ask you about in terms of um, potential barriers to being proactive is defence's capacity in terms of expertise or personnel. Um, are you able to comment on that? Do you have any insight into defence's expertise in this? On WHS issues, do you mean? Particularly psychosocial hazards and risks. Uh, no, I can't comment on that. I think they have um, a reasonable level of expertise in WHS generally. Um, and I think like many, many organisations, the uh, capacity on psychosocial is evolving. Um, there are, would be very few organisations that could claim to be on top of that as an issue uh, and defence would be one of those. Mr Napier, I understand that you're at the coalface and you attend a lot of meetings directly with defence. Um, do you have any insight into um, what you've seen in terms of defence's understanding or expertise in relation to psychosocial hazards or risks? Well, I would comment that the nature of the work that defence does has a number of, if not unique, certainly challenging psychosocial issues that it must respond to, which can differ from your average workplace. Um, I am aware, however, that defence is embarked on a program to improve their assessment of risk and has uh, engaged a range of resources to assist in that regard. Can you just clarify which program that is that you're referring to? Um, well, there's a range of programs over um, a number of years. Thanks for answering that. Um, can I turn to the topic of officers of the, the PCBU? They're keen to clarify exactly who in defence holds the responsibility to ensure, as far as reasonably practicable, a psychologically safe and healthy workplace. Operator, would you please display section 19 of the WHS Act, which I take it you're both very familiar with. Um, the, the part that I wanted to emphasize is a, a, a PCU, BU, paraphrasing, must exercise due diligence to ensure the person conducting the business or undertaking complies with that duty or obligation. And then um, if we could please also expand paragraph, subparagraph five, which is over the page. Um, that's, oh, sorry, that's not the right paragraph. I can take that down, thank you. Uh, what, what we would like to bring up is the defence due diligence policy, which is DEF 12880020392. Uh, is Comcare aware of defence's due diligence policy? Um, is this something that you see in the course of your interactions with defence? It's not something that I personally see. I could defer to Mr Napier on that. I think I became aware of it through the tender bundle. Okay relatively recently. What we want to ask you about is how defence has described the responsibility for officers. So if we please expand paragraph one. Um, and it's, so defence identifies who they've designated in the organisation as officers. And then the way that defence frame the obligation is that they must exercise due diligence to ensure that their workers comply with the Work Health and Safety Act. And if we could please keep that up, but also keep up paragraph as section 27 of the WHS Act. What we're really trying to understand is whether um, Comcare has a view about whether defence's policy, sorry, um, section 27 of the Act, sorry. Thank you. The 
we could expand sec tw section 27, subparagraph 1, and also expand paragraph 1 of the policy. Thank you very much. Um, the Act uses the language an officer of the person conducting the business or undertaking must exercise due diligence to ensure that the person conducting the business or undertaking complies with that duty or obligation. So what we're trying to understand is whether defence limiting it to their workers, whether mm -hmm. Comcare views that as um, consistent with the Act or whether Comcare has an issue with that. Uh, I would have to have an issue with that because the um, the duty of officers is is much greater than just simply to ensure their workers comply with the Work and Health and, Saf Health and Safety Act. Uh, they have to ensure um, the officers themselves, the PCBU, the empl the managers. So it's it's broader than I would have thought just the uh, workers complying. I, I think it's a slightly different point. What we're trying to understand is whether the obligation of the officers applies to the whole of the defence organisation or whether the obligation of a particular officer only applies in relation to the workers that they are, um, their workers. Okay, I see. Uh, I would say to both. Um, I think that the, uh, looking at the list of those officers there, I would assume that uh, um, those officers would be comprising, for want of a better term, the executive of the uh, PCBU, so they would all have a PCBU-wide responsibility because they're making decisions for the PCBU as a whole. Uh, but then from a practical point of view, um, the uh, areas like the groups or the personnel, like the group heads and the service chiefs, are going to be closest to their area of responsibility, so they would also have responsibility for their group or their um, service. So I think it's a it's a combined responsibility they, ha they have to the PCBU as a whole and then to their specialised area uh, specifically. But is it just so that I'm clear, if, if a person is an officer, is your understanding of the Act that their obligations apply to, um, their due diligence obligations apply to the PCBU as a whole? Yes. Or does it depend on their level of seniority? No, I don't think it uh, depends on their level of seniority. When we look at the definition of an officer, um, we find that it's uh, any person, uh, uh, an officer is a person who's involved in the decision-making for the organisation, and I, I don't know that that's necessarily um, both a legislation level specific. I think naturally it would be, but um, I don't think the, the responsibility of an officer varies depending on their level of seniority. Can Comcare use its information compulsion powers under Section 155 of the WHS Act to obtain reporting and governance documents for the purpose of assessing officers' accountabilities? I would ask Mr Napier to respond to that. Yes, we could. And can you just clarify for the Commission, um, what level of oversight or consultation does Comcare have of these individuals, these officers? in their role as officers as of, of the PCBU? Uh, only in a general sense. Are we, um, well, th th there could be matters that come to our attention through a notification and the like that uh, we, uh, in the consequence of the inquiries that we make, we might seek information as to who are the relevant officers and what control and due diligence did they exercise over that activity. So in terms of how Comcare ensures that officers are complying with their duties, um, you just mentioned a notification. Is, is that the only way you ensure compliance or are there other ways as well? Well, a notification offer triggers what we call a monitoring compliance um, activity or an investigation. So as a consequential to those inquiries, we can and do assess officer duties. But absent a no notification, there's no other way of and knowing whether an officer is complying with their due diligence obligations? I, we could at any time yep. seek information in relation to that. Whether we have in relation to defence, I'm not sure at this okay. point. That, that, um, just to understand. And does Comcare have measures in place to, ass 
to assist and educate officers about their duties and what's required by the role? Uh, yes, we do. We have quite a significant education program. I'm sorry, you just didn't... We have quite a significant education program available to officers and uh, other persons in the scheme, in the jurisdiction. And is that, is that jurisdiction-wide or is that um, specific to the officers in defence? No, no, jurisdiction-wide. Um, so is there any um, guidance or education available that is sp specifically for ADF or defence officers? Uh, defence itself may well have uh, put that information together, but from my understanding, Comcare has not done it specifically for defence. And in terms of the um, training that you do offer um, that defence officers can participate in, um, does Comcare assess the effectiveness of the training? No, not that I'm aware of, unless it became part of an investigation. Uh, or an inquiry of some form, um, but no, we don't monitor the impact of it on specific PCBEs. And um, does that does the education that you do offer does that co cover the consequences of non-compliance for individual officers? From what I understand, our training goes but to both the obligations, the responsibilities, and the uh, consequences. Thank you. Um, can I turn to the topic of notifiable incidents? A defence is required to notify Comcare of notifiable incidents under Section 38 of the WHS Act. Yes. Okay. And defence's obligation to ensure, so far as is reasonably practicable, a physical and psychologically safe and healthy workplace is much broader than the matters that are notifiable incidents. Yes, that's right? correct. And notifiable incidents, as I think you said, before Mr Napier, are the primary mechanism through which Comcare becomes aware of incidents, is that right? Correct. Yes, that's right. But psychological injuries rarely meet the threshold of a notifiable incident reportable to Comcare because of the way the notifiable incident test is currently framed. That's correct. So the Commission's aware of recommend tw recommendation 20 of the Boland Review, which proposes to amend the definition of notifiable incidents to trigger a notification trigger for psychological in injuries. Um, but as we understand it, that recommendation has not been implemented as yet. Uh, it's not been implemented, but it's certainly been worked on through uh, Safe Work Australia. Um, but it has been for some time. Yes, but the getting closer to the end of the process, we hope. Um, you would agree that Comcare cannot have adequate oversight by primarily relying on notifiable incidents for awareness and enforcement in relation to psychosocial risks and hazards? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, aside from notifiable incidents, how does Comcare identify the psychological risks to health and safety in defence and the measures defence has to manage those risks? So is that, how do we identify? Yeah, yes. how, how do you, I'll do it in two parts. First, how do you identify the psychological risks to health and safety in defence? Uh, we would identify that um, through our, uh, through the various inspections that we do do, through our general knowledge of an organisation like Defence, through the various um, forums that we have uh, in, uh, for discussion with Defence. Uh, we may have them referred to us um, uh, by complainants. Uh, we may be alerted to them through the media. Um, there's a number of avenues that we get that sort of information. And, and indeed from Defence itself will raise issues with us to seek our advice or support on issues. And are they the sec same mechanisms by which you, um, by which Comcare is aware of the measures Defence has taken to manage those risks? Yes, I'd say so generally, yes. Okay. And how does Comcare know whether Defence has taken adequate steps to identify the psychosocial hazards and risks? Uh, I guess we can only be fully satisfied of that if there is an occasion for us to uh, undertake a, a formal inquiry or investigation. Um, or we can otherwise uh, base that on is the uh, provision of their policies, the understanding of their approaches. But um, I guess in an organisation like Defence, our concern is always the difference between the policy that sits on the bookcase and the work that happens on the ground. Um, op 
operator, would you please display COM 0001-0028-0001 at 0042? Um, Mr Vimes, this is your third statement again. And could we please expand paragraph 93? You state there an unresolved challenge in respect to the notification requirement for latent psychosocial hazards is that it is difficult to pinpoint the precise point in time at which exposure to the risk would require the PCBU to notify the regulator. Mm. Um, are you able to um, tell us what are, are the barriers and challenges with identifying latent harm? Um. I guess the, by the fact that it is latent, that it can um, not appear for many months, in some cases many years after the event or events that uh, led to that, um, led to that uh, harm or that injury. Um, and so uh, uh, quite often it, um, the cause of that might be lost in time or the evidence to, su to support the uh, cause of that may be, may be lost or no longer existing. So what the Commission is particularly interested in is how can Comcare support or better support defence with identifying latent harm, including by helping defence to navigate the complexities of doing this? Uh, look, I think it's a, again, this is a, an area that's, that really is evolving. I don't think that there are any perfect practices around how we address um, this issue of, of latent harm associated with psychosocial hazards. Uh, we try and undertake research, we'll partner with organisations, we would encourage Defence um, to join with us in a lot of that work to specifically look at uh, these you know, enormous risks um, for their workforce in, a, in, in that proactive way. Uh, there's no easy answer to that. You referred to research and Defence joining with you. Does that occur at the moment or is that something that you're looking to do in the future? Uh, a bit of both. We, we do have a project that um, we're seeking funding through, uh, through government at the moment around um, psychosocial uh, health, which, uh, or psychosocial hazards, which Defence is a partner in together with a number of other of our PCBUs. But I think there would be opportunity for us to uh, par partner more directly with Defence to look at uh, Defence-specific defense challenges in, in this area. Would there be benefit in engaging an external consultant to work with Defence and Comcare to develop a strategy for analysing psychosocial harm data to inform prevention and early intervention, including with respect to latent harm? Oh, I'm sure there would be enormous benefit in that, yes. Um, Comcare also has limited visibility of claims data for the ADF because claims by ADF members and veterans are managed by the Department of Veteran Affairs. Yes, workers' comp claims, yes. Yes. And so is it correct that this means that Comcare doesn't have the benefit of claims data to identify the psychosocial hazards and risks faced by ADF members? Not the... No, that's right. We do not have the workers' comp-related data. Are you aware of any constraints imposed by the Privacy Act on accessing claims data from defence? Uh, yes, there would be, and indeed we have that in relation to our own claims data in, in uh, Comcare. There are privacy issues around that that we do try and, and overcome. And so they can be overcome? Uh, in some circumstances, I think they can, clearly with the agreement of the person whose privacy is at, is at stake. Um, but there is uh, um, soon to be a review of the... Uh, our legislation that covers workers' compensation and, and um, uh, that capacity could well be part of that review. Okay. Um, do you know when that review is taking place? Uh, it's due to take place over the next 12 to 18 months. And, um, but, that, but sorry, but that wouldn't affect ADF, of course. That wouldn't, uh, uh, because they're not covered by our workers' comp legislation. They're under the DVA legislation. Um, are there... A privacy Act constraints in relation to accessing data from DVA, Comcare accessing data from DVA? I would imagine there are, yes. Um, are uh, well, it would depend. It would be a question of whether we're after data on specific claims, the way individuals are identified, or general 
uh, statistical data. In the in the latter case, probably not. That, that's what we were interested in. So, are, are the privacy issues overcome if the claims data is aggregate and de-identified? Would you expect a lot of? Yes, I would have thought so from a privacy point of view. Yes. Um, can I turn to a related topic of service nexus determinations? The Commission has heard evidence regarding how defence determines whether or not an incident does in fact arise out of the conduct or undertaking of a duty holder, and this is often referred to by defence as determining whether an incident has a service nexus. Are you mm. familiar with that terminology? Yes. Um, earlier this week, um, both Ms Perkins, the former chair of the WHS board, and Mr Love, the assistant secretary, sorry, I've got his title right, sorry, of the, of the WHS branch, accepted that it is fair to say that there is some confusion and uncertainty over how to accurately determine service nexus for psychosocial incidents, and in particular suicide. And is this ComCare's understanding? Yes, it is. We acknowledge the complexities in determining service nexus with respect to psychosocial harm. And in, on Tuesday, Mr Love told us that defence adopt a, if in doubt, notify policy in determining service nexus. And we understand that Comcare has a, a similar policy that it, if a duty holder is in doubt, they should notify, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, do you accept that given the complexities of suicide, that there will always be an element of doubt as to the cause and connection to the workplace? Yes, if not always in the vast majority of cases, yes. So does it follow that is it Comcare's expectation that Comcare should be receiving notification from defence of all suicide of ADF personnel in light of defence's if in doubt notify policy? Um, yes, probably, unless it can clearly be excluded, uh, without doubt be excluded, yes, I think it, that would be the end result. And um, what are the steps that could be taken to navigate and provide better guidance to alleviate any confusion in defence? I think to state it that simply. I think it just needs to be that simple explanation that if there is any doubt, any doubt whatsoever, notify it. Can I take you to a specific amp example? Um, operator, could you please display transcript day 61, T61, 6987, and expand from lines 18 to 46. Um, this was evidence given by a member of defence in relation to the issue of service nexus. say the reference again and it comes up in queue. Um, T61 and we certainly don't need anyone's names. Thank you. So if it could be done in a way that we don't see any names. So it's from line 18, so if we could please expand from 18 to 46. Um, I understand that Comcare um, um, reviewed this in the past, but we'll come to that. So th the question was, what do you mean by a service nexus? And the answer given was, so that they weren't caused directly by their service, that there were other factors being either well, primary factors being alcohol relationship issues are probably the most predominant issues that we saw. And then um, at line 43, um, do you make for the purposes of reporting to Comcare, is it assumed that there is no nexus unless it is proved that there is? 
or is it assumed that there is a nexus unless it is proven that it isn't? And the answer was, no, no, it was the first. And, and as I understand Comcare's position, that is not a correct interpretation of arising out of the conduct of the business or undertaking. I'm just working through the double negatives, but... Um, uh I think the point that I was making was that, that we have to assume there is a nexus unless it is proved that there is not one in some, in some of these cases. It, um, uh, you know, it, it is very much dependent on the, the nature of the work or the work environment, but I would have thought, um, and as you know, we have seen in uh, defence, I think the assumption is that there would be a relationship to the work environment unless it could be shown that there wasn't. There may well be other contributing factors that were shown on the previous slide, but that does not, um, that does not deny the, the work relationship or the service nexus as it's referred to there. Do you accept that this evidence indicates that there is confusion amongst defence members as to when they are obliged to notify a Comcare of an incident? Uh, yes, I do. And the Commission understands that Comcare raised this evidence at a meeting with defence and following the meeting, Comcare wrote to Defence seeking assurance that the views expressed were not representative of Defence's view of the incident, notification requirements under the WHS Act. Yes, I'm aware of that exchange. And Defence advised Comcare that there is no internal Defence policy guidance or training which supports the commanding officer's views and referred to its WHS incident reporting and policy guidance. Yes, I'm aware of that, of that response. Did Comcare take any other action in relation to this issue? Um, I, won't, I don't know if it was specifically in relation to that exchange, uh, but I know personally that I have been involved in discussions with senior defence personnel about uh, the notification requirements, and I know Mr Napier and other colleagues uh, have this discussion on a somewhat regular basis. And have Comcare given Defence any practical or specific examples or training on how Defence should understand the service nexus requirement? Well, I think from the point of view of the people who we engage with, I think we put it as simply as we've been discussing here this afternoon. If in doubt, notify. Um, that doesn't turn it into a notification per se or a notifiable incident, but it at least lets us get in and see whether it is... Uh, and, uh, you know, a work-related issue and, and make that um, determination. And do you agree that as a form of external assurance, Comcare could review a sample of suicide-related incidents deemed by Defence in the first instance not to have arisen out of the conduct of the ADF's business or undertaking? For what purpose, sorry? To, to see if there is an accurate understanding of the service nexus determination? Um, I guess we could, yes, yes. So the purpose of the review would be to identify where ADF has misunderstood or misapplied the notification? Yeah. Yep. Yes, that would make sense. And seem to express that with hesitation. Do you have a hesitation about that? Uh, I just wasn't sure what... I, I don't think I fully understood your right. question when you first put it. Sorry, I beg your pardon. And Comcare has power in Section 155 of the WHS Act to require a person to produce documents, including where Comcare believes the information will assist it to monitor or enforce compliance with the Act. Mm -hmm. and could Comcare use that power to request information that would inform its regulatory approach to latent psychological harm? I would probably need to take advice, but my immediate response to that would be yes, I'd assume we could. And could it use that power in Section 155 to request information that would inform its regulatory approach to ADF compliance with effectively managing psychosocial hazards? Yes, the would give the same answer, yeah. And is the process for issuing notices under Section 155 lengthy? Uh, from my understanding, no, not particularly. 
and you may not be able to answer this question, but are you able to give the Commission an, an indication of the average time frame it takes for defence to produce information where such a notice is issued? I might need to defer to Mr Napier for that. Uh, there is no specific time frame. It would depend on the quantity of material sought, perhaps the complexity of the material. It could be two weeks, it could be a few months, something in that range, it would be normal. And, and do you agree that the review, so talking about the review we referred to earlier of um, the ADF determinations would be of use, um, would be, a, sorry, I'll start that again. Um, such a review, do you agree such a review would be a use of Comcare's existing inspection powers to ensure ADF is complying with its incident notification obligations? I'm sure the, our powers would extend to uh, doing that sort of review um, in accordance with our legislation, yes. And do you agree that that could lead to better compliance with the notification obligations? I think it would certainly help inform that. I think it could be part of a, an approach to take. And does Comcare accept that this would be a reasonable and proportionate use of Comcare's powers of information compulsion and inspection? Uh, without without being able to quantify what that resource use would be, look, I, I think it would. I think it, you know, this is such a serious issue in, in the work environment that it's the most appropriate to send the use of our resource to prevent, to get whatever information we can to prevent um, injury and death of working people. Can I turn to the topics of the way that um, Comcare intera interacts with Defence, um, and as the Commission understands it, Defence and Comcare have three main avenues or formal avenues of communication, and they are the WHS Board, the Comcare Defence Liaison Forum, and the Suicide Self-Harm Forum. Is that yes, right? That's correct, yes. Um, can we start with the WHS Board? W what is Comcare's role at the WHS Board meetings? Um, again, Mr Napier can probably go into more detail if you want it, but uh, um, my understanding is that we participate in those meetings or part of those meetings, not full meetings, we don't attend the full meetings, as an observer uh, to provide an update, to provide advice if, if required, um, and to share information with Defence. But as I say, we only participate in that as an observer. Uh, we're not a member of their board and we only participate for certain parts of the meeting. Um, is the WHS board meetings an opportunity to monitor and enforce Defence's compliance with the Act? Oh, I don't think so. It's more an opportunity for exchanging information and us to becoming aware. It's not, it's not an enforcement body from our perspective. Um, you referred to the fact that you're not a member of the board. Does Comcare receive all the board meeting papers? No, only those relative, relevant to the parts of the meeting that we attend, from what I understand. Is that your understanding, Mr Napier? Yeah, we don't receive all papers, I think. It, it may vary meeting to meeting, depending on what's involved, but there are certainly circumstances where um, all papers have not been provided. Okay. As a matter of course, though, is it usually the, the case that you get most of the meeting papers? Or is it only relevant, you only get the papers relevant to the part that Comcare attends? Uh, I think it's the latter. The, the, I'm, I'm hesitating a bit because the arrangements have changed over time. So um, uh, certainly in recent times, I think I, I can say that I don't get all papers. Um, we heard evidence earlier this week from Defence that um, Comcare do get all the papers apart from the defence legal paper. From what you're saying, that hasn't that's not quite accurate. Um, I certainly don't get the defence legal paper. There may be occasions where I haven't received other papers that they've determined. Yeah. Um, does Comcare receive papers in relation to identifying hazards, psychosocial hazards and risks? I think uh, we receive papers that are related to the safety management system and how that uh, assesses psychosocial risks and puts in place controls. Um, if your question's in a sort of high level generic sense, we do. 
if it gets to more granular assessments of risk, um, perhaps. Okay, that, yeah. that's fair. The, uh, hypoth hang on, that's all right, I'll let it. Um, the meeting minutes, and I think you mentioned this, um, Mr Vines, the meeting minutes of the WHS board indicate that Comcare only attends um, for a certain part of the meeting, is that right? And as we read the minutes, Comcare only attends to provide an update on Comcare's priorities. Is that primarily what occurs? That is, uh, yes, occasionally I'm asked to offer an opinion in relation to something on the, in the papers, in the vision. Um, so what impact, if any, does Comcare think its attendance at the WHS board meetings is having on Defence's WHS controls in relation to psychosocial risks? Um, I think having the, a representative from the regulator in the room certainly has a, a, a deterrence impact, impact, perhaps, and reminds uh, the PCBU that uh, they've got duties and obligations. Um, I get, uh, I find the meeting useful insofar as it gives me high level, and I stress high level oversight of the risk management activities, the risk identification activities that Defence is undertaking. And among those risks are psychosocial risks. Um, do you think could Comcare use the WHS board meetings more effectively to monitor Defence's compliance with controlling psychosocial risk? Um, if I, 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 I'm hesitant here because if we were to apply that, that service across our jurisdiction, that is an enormous workload. Um, so uh, in, in theory, we could offer more advice and guidance, but um, as we've discussed in terms of cost recovery, we probably need to consider those issues. Um, and would we be in a position to offer it to all of the PCBUs in our jurisdiction? Certainly not with current resources. That, it's a cost recovery, so if Defence could pay for it, you could do it, potentially? We could, we could consider that, yes. I am, I am conscious of uh, what's known as regulatory capture as well. So there is, um, uh, whilst we can offer advice, guidance, assistance, um, we don't want to be endorsing and approving any risk assessments or risk controls necessarily, as we may subsequently, if a matter comes to our attention, need to assess that from a compliance perspective. And we, we may need to make a decision as to whether the organisation has complied. So there is a, a fine line there between our assistance and guidance and us endorsing or becoming um, a participant in the risk assessment and risk control process. I understand. So you, you wouldn't be comfortable signing off on it, but you could certainly provide advice to improve. Is that fair? I think that's right, yes. Um, can we turn to the Comcare Defence Liaison Forum? And operator, would you please display COM 0001 0020410 at 0415, paragraph Thank you. Would you please expand? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this paragraph summarises the purpose of the Defence Comcare Liaison Forum, which is to enable information exchange, discussion, consultation, advocacy about key WHS matters, issues, resolution and determinations and forge a relationship between Defence and Comcare to identify and address emerging or actual WHS risks on a strategic level. Uh, what the Commission is interested in is, does Comcare consider the forum to be effective in addressing or emerging or actual WHS risks on a strategic level? 
I, I think it's a, an effective forum in that it provides uh, an opportunity for both Comcare and Defence to bring forward, as it says there in the terms of reference, key WHS matters issues, uh, perhaps resolution and determinations on some in some circumstances. It is uh, predominantly an information exchange and it's an opportunity for both Comcare and, to def and for Defence to highlight any activities that are relevant to the other party. Um, that's the issue that we wanted to ask about because based on the minutes of the, of the forum meetings, the meetings appear to the Commission to be largely a forum for providing updates between Defence and Comcare rather than addressing emerging or actual WHS risk. Do you, do you think that's a fair interpretation? I think that's a fair interpretation. Um, can I turn to the third formal mechanism of communication, which is the suicide and self-harm working group? Operator, would you please display COM 5000 0001 0001 at 0032, paragraph 123. This is the statement of Sue Weston, the former CEO of Comcare, dated 7 April COM 5000-0001-0001 at 0032 and it's paragraph 123. So I'll read it out in the interest of time, sorry. Um, Part of, this, part of the second sentence is Comcare and Defence will convene a working group to explore any efficiencies that can be implemented, acknowledging the small available data set due to the limitations of the WHS notif requirements as relevant to psychosocial issues and psychological harm. The working group will consist of members from Comcare's inspectorate team and representatives from Defence's WH branch and regulatory regular relations team. It is intended that the working group will work together on agreed reporting requirements, improving the quality of information requests and response, and address any information gaps to support Comcare's inspectorate to achieve an improved and more consistent response to self-harm matters. Um, I just wanted to establish that that's essentially the purpose of the working group. I think that was uh, perhaps right at the time. I think it might have evolved a little since then, but certainly that was that was correct at the time, yeah. And in terms of its evolution since then, is it correct that the focus of the forum has narrowed to defence suicide and self-harm outcomes? That's correct. And um, can you tell us what data or information does defence share as, as part of that forum? I'm trying to recall. Um, there's often there are updates on activities and measures that are being implemented by defence or uh, work that Comcare is doing to assist in the assessment of psychosocial risk or management of that risk. Um, I think your question related to data. Yeah, data specifically. Yeah. I, I can't, I, there's not a lot of data exchanged, I think I, it's fair to say. Um, operator, would you please display COM 0001-0018-1148 at 1154. Um, these are the minutes from the August 2022 Defence Comcare Suicide and Self-Harm meeting. Um, and if we could please um, highlight the dot points under site access challenges. Uh, sorry, just down to the, just the first black dot point might make it 
figure for everyone to read. Under site access challenges. Thank you. Um, we understand at the time of, the, of this meeting, so this is August 2022, there were some challenges between Comcare and Defence, specifically in relation to Comcare's investigation of self-harm and suicide incidents. And um, the dot points, the three dot points under site access challenges um, refer to issues with um, Comcare accessing the site. Um, the question for you is, do those, is Comcare still experiencing those type of issues? Uh, they haven't been brought to my attention if they still exist. Um, so in recent times, I don't recall them being brought to my attention. Um, there's also on page 1155, if we go to the next page, thank you. Um, under the site POC establishment, the third um, dot point in, Defence advised that more notice is needed of Comcare's visit. Defence was notified of Comcare's intent to visit with only two business days notice. Um, this again was an issue in August 2022. Are you aware whether this still continues to be an issue now? Again, nothing in recent times that's been brought to my attention. Um, and it also states um, further down the page under continuing barriers, Comcare, sorry, right down the bottom in part five, um, Comcare advised this in investigation has also encountered some issues for inspectors in obtaining fact finder information. And there's also a reference on the next page to concerns regarding unpleasant interactions between parties that can be a barrier in getting information. Um, are you aware of issues of this kind continuing? I think we do have some continuing issues of this nature. Um, and does that, does that create a barrier to Comcare effectively investigating um, psychosocial incidents? Uh, in the short term, probably. Um, in the medium to longer term, no, we will find a way to gather the information. This is in the context of the Suicide and Self-Harm Working Group. Um, are you able to tell the Commission whether that working group has resulted in any systemic changes? Um, I, I wouldn't attribute it entirely to the working group, but I'm aware of a range of measures introduced by Defence in relation to data um, in relation to establishment of particular functions and teams that are looking at some of these issues. Um, there's clearly a correlation between the issues at the, that, uh, that committee and that work, but I couldn't align the two directly. Can I turn to a new topic, which is how Comcare currently regulates defence, um, and in particular, incident of the Sydney University Regiment at Holsworthy Army Barracks. How was Comcare made aware of the allegations of bullying and harassment of officer cadets at those barracks? Uh, my understanding it was from media reports. Operator, could you please display COM 0001, 0029, 0001? This is the incident report for the Sydney University Regiment Holsworthy Army Barracks. And as the commissioner, commissions understands it, Comcare inspectors attended the barracks and other sites to conduct the inquiry. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then um, paraphrasing paragraphs six and seven, and perhaps it would be helpful um, if we could please try and expand both paragraphs six and seven. Um, we understand the inspector formed the reasonable belief that defence contravened sections 19 subsection 1 and 19 subsection 3 of the WHS Act 
the regulation 55C of the WHS re regulations by failing to undertake risk assessments and implement controls in relation to psychosocial hazards that can cause physical and psychological harm to workers involved in the delivery and undertaking of the Officet Cadet training course. That's, a, do you agree that's a, what happened? That's what the inspector formed the view of? That's right, yes. Um, does Comcare only become aware of whether or not defence has undertaken a risk assessment if Comcare is informed of an incident and investigates the incident? Primarily that's the case, but uh, we could, on our own initiative, seek information if uh, we had reason to do so. And what would you give you reason to do so? Oh, um, media reports, tip-offs, concerns raised through other channels. Um, just a general safety concern that wasn't associated with a notification under the, under the Act. And does, um, has Defence had those general safety concerns in relation to psychosocial risks and hazards at Defence? such that it's sought information of its risk assessment policy? Has Defence sought it? No, has Comcare. Oh, sorry, sorry it's not. probably me, sorry. <laughs> um, I'd have to check that, but um, this was a circumstance where we've done that, um, where the matter came to our attention through a non-notified channel. Can we now turn to the verification report, which is at CON triple zero one double zero two nine triple zero nine at um zero zero one zero have, have you had an opportunity to review the verification report for the Hosworthy barracks yes I have excellent um and as we understand it the inspector did not identify any non-compliance with the WHS act or the regulations Subsequent to defence undertaking a number of activities um, aligned with an improvement notice, yes. And the Comcare inspector determined that a site visit was not necessary, but noted that they had reference to two policy procedure documents which addressed improvement notices issued to defence. That's correct. And as we understand it, the um, investigation was closed on the basis that the that policies and procedures were in place. That's correct. Um, does Comcare evaluate the effectiveness of those policies or procedures? Uh, an inspector in undertaking their inquiries needs to assure themselves, the term in the act is form a reasonable belief, that no safety concern is ongoing. In this case, the inspectors um, satisfied themselves that that's the case. So as part of that, do they evaluate the effectiveness of the policy? Uh, no two inspections are the same, so I need to start there. Um, there's nothing limiting an inspector making those inquiries. And as we understand it in this case, that the, there was no evaluation of the effectiveness of the policies. It, it was more that the policies were put in place. Is that your understanding of this particular inspection? That's a high level understanding. I've not reviewed the materials, um, but I, I wonder whether the second document referenced there um, wasn't uh, a record of measures being put in place. And, the ins and I wonder whether the inspector reviewed that to assure themselves that the safety issue has, was being addressed. Um, as we understand it, this um, verification report was undertaken three months after the initial um, investigation report. Um, are you able to comment on whether that is too early to verify whether the policy was effective? You need to weigh up or balance the need for effective and timely action as an inspectorate with the need for an organisation to put in place those effective controls. Um, I, I assume that in this instance the inspector uh, settled on three months on the basis that 
he, he needed assurance that those safety issues were being controlled in a relatively short period of time and then uh, he had an opportunity to review uh, the implementation of those controls a, a, you know, a reasonable amount of time later. But you'd agree that the fact of having the control is not the same as the effectiveness of the control? Very much, I agree with that, yes. So would you accept that in this case it was about compliance with the WHS Act and was not based on verifying whether the policies and procedures were effective in practice? I, I don't have that detailed knowledge. The inspector is the appointed officer. Um, the inspector has responsibilities under legislation to um, form that reasonable belief. and. Um, uh, we have a range of quality assurance measures within our um, group to um, uh, develop and, and sign off on whatever the proposed regulatory response is. So uh, I can only say that uh, that would have happened in this instance. Um, but do you agree that um, shouldn't Comcare be assessing the practical effectiveness of Defence's policies and procedures? because this would support Comcare's statutory responsibilities under the Act to monitor and enforce compliance with the Act? We have a range of programs that we've put in place that do exactly that in relation to um, high-risk hazards inside defence where we've undertaken um, an inspection and required of defence measures to address the risk. Um, and as Mr Vine said earlier, um, we need to assure ourselves that any system doesn't just sit on the, sh on the shelf, that it's actively being implemented in the field and applied and, it's a, and is effective and is subject to ongoing review. So we do have programs that test exactly that. Um, and, and for, uh, just as a general question, for every inspection conducted by Comcare where non-compliance is found, does Comcare issue an improvement notice to Defence? Sorry, could you I'll just get, <laughs> make sure I've got the question right again? So for every inspection conducted by Comcare where non-compliance with the Act is found, yes. does Comcare issue an improvement notice to Defence? Uh, I don't believe that every non-compliance necessarily has an improvement notice, but I will say that every non-compliance, it's a requirement in our processes, that there's a follow-up verification inspection to assure ourselves that those issues that were identified have been addressed properly. Uh, can I turn to the topic of whether Comcare could do more to support defence to ensure a psychologically safe and healthy workplace? Our first question is, what factors are needed for Comcare to proactively support defence to ensure such a workplace, so psychologically and work, healthy workplace? Um, look, I think the overriding uh, requirement is, is um, a full buy-in from the relevant PCVU uh, that we'd be engaging in, in particular projects on. Um, uh, that if we're to put resources and time into addressing specific issues in a specific PCUB, we need to make sure that uh, uh, the work we're doing there is going to be received and acted upon and not just uh, window dressing, if I could use that term, uh, would need a strong commitment uh, and be satisfied that there was a genuine um, desire to, to participate in, in a, you know, an expanded project with us. And so from what you've said, is, is that the current working relationship between Defence and Comcare? Is that always the case, full buy-in and collaboration? Uh, look, I'd say at a general level, um, through the various uh, mechanisms that we have, yes, I think there is a, a strong uh, relationship between Comcare and Defence. Um, I, my observation would be, and it's quite similar with uh, other la large organisations as well, is that as you get lower down into organisations, um, uh, there is not necessarily the same level of buy-in, and so a major part of uh, support for the for specific joint projects needs to be uh, that commitment to embed what comes out of these right through organisations, and that's um, best embedded by leadership from the top, 
and ensuring that uh, it, it gets exercised at all levels in an organisation. Um, Defence has told the Commission that it sees and engages with Comcare as both a regulator and a partner. Mm. Is that how you see the relationship? Um, certainly as a regulator, I'm not sure that partner is necessarily the right term. Um, we are there uh, under our legislation where we're there to support and provide advice um, and to work uh, to assist the PCBUs to meet their obligations. I guess you could call it a partner, um, but I see it uh, even though the primary duty sits with the PCBU, we have a, a, a strong role to be there uh, supporting them to the greatest extent that we can. And, and where we can do that in a collaborative sense, um, that's far more effective for prevention than a regulatory sense, in my view. So just to be clear, do you, would you characterise the relationship as collaborative to ensure that defence meets its obligations under the WHS Act? Yes, not, not necessarily always or in all things, but at a general level, I'd say, yes, it is a collaborative and constructive relationship. But, but we are the regulator. We have to be able to regulate, and as Mr Napier said earlier, you know, we have to be cautious against um, regulatory capture and those sorts of things, uh, but certainly our priority is prevention rather than coming in at the end of the day after the accident or illness has occurred. And is there anything that you, you think could occur to encourage full buy-in 100% of the time or, or with everyone that Comcare deals with in defence? Look, I do, it's a, it is a case of, of um, the message being repeated over and over and over again, uh, that it does, doesn't get spoken about at the top tables, it gets drilled in right throughout the organisation, that it becomes embedded in training programs from the first day of a new recruit through to their promotional training. There's, it just needs to become part of the culture and awareness around workplace health and safety, particularly around psychosocial health and safety. There's no switch we can flick. It's got to be a day in, day out d demonstration of, of what good practice looks like. And when I asked you before about the factors that are needed to proactively support defence, you referred to the relationship, but are there particular steps that defence could take? For, for example, greater education and awareness or better use of data, are, th are there more things that Comcare could do to support defence in that regard? Uh, w certainly in terms of providing advice to them, as, as I indicated earlier, I think there are opportunities for us to uh, do um, specific program, regulatory programming with uh, defence. We spoke earlier about opportunities for joint research, for joint work around data. I think there are those sorts of opportunities that um, can be explored and uh, the possibility of, of encompassing that in a, in a you know, quite a broad program of um, joint activity. Um, we understand that um, Comcare did an evaluation work in relation to high risk hazards in defence. Um, can you just confirm with us whether um, Comcare has done similar evaluation work in relation to psychosocial risks and hazards? We've, um, we've undertaken some assessment work on the available data that we have, noting that, generally speaking, psychosocial matters don't come to the attention of the regulator through, through the limitations of the notification provisions. So we've undertaken work in that space. I think our strategic partnerships and engagement group is also um, involved with defence in relation to some research activities. So there is... Um, there is work that has been performed. C can you just give us further detail in relation to the assessment work on the data that you've done, please? Um, in my group, we've considered if there are correlations or patterns, if you like, in relation to uh, suicide and self-harm matters that we are aware of involving defence personnel. correlations between the incidents, is that Yes, to see if there are patterns, if you like, or um, factors that are common in relation to what we understand to be some of the causes of those, or some of the, um, some of the circumstances that were involved in those matters. 
And has that information or analysis then been fed back to defence? We have shared that with defence, yes. And do you know what's happened as a result of that? It's relatively recently we shared that with defence, so we'll be following up in due course. Excellent. And does Comcare consider that defence is active and involved enough in the psychological, psychosocial harm in this space and making active attempts to learn and improve? I would say that yes, it is, um, possibly at relatively early stages, but I do think it is taking appropriate steps and if we can support them in accelerating those steps and making those steps larger, we would certainly be um, willing to do that and, and eager to do that. In Comcare's view, are there any specific impediments to Comcare effectively performing its role in monitoring and enforcing defence's duty to manage risks associated with psych psychological hazards at the workplace? Uh, I would say just the ones that we've identified um, in the discussion this afternoon. Um, the report that you had on the screen earlier indicated some challenges um, uh, in access and those sorts of things, which, as, as Mr Napier said, are, uh, seem to be being addressed because we haven't had more recent reports of those. Um, but I also think a, a challenge is just the, the sheer size and complexity and the nature of the work that is performed uh, in defence. It's not a solution that you can you know, just buy off the bookshelf. It's something that, that we've really got to do work on. I think there's, I know there is some work done in defence at looking at uh, other international practice around this. I think there's probably opportunities for uh, for further development on that. But I think it's also important to note that um, it, the development generally about us understanding psychosocial hazards as a workplace risk has been very, very slow. And I don't mean, I um, certainly don't mean just in defence, I mean globally. This is a big issue that, that we as regulators, as workplace health and safety um, specialists are trying to catch up with. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I wouldn't criticise defence at this stage, but I would encourage them to certainly accelerate. Um, that brings me to the next topic, which is understanding Comcare's current approach to psychosocial risk. Operator, would you please display COM 0001 0002 um, This is the compliance and enforcement policy, a policy for Comcare's compliance and enforcement activities. And if we could go to page seven of this document. Might not have the right, right reference, sorry, but I'll read it out. Um, the, the extract I wanted to take you to was planned activity by Comcare's psychosocial risk regulation team and as part of its psychosocial proactive inspection program are in early stages of development. Comcare describes its provision of information and advice as the core activity for achieving its vision of a jurisdiction that is well informed, engaged, equipped to comply and committed to best practice. Um, and it, there's also the, the sentiment um, Comcare explains that as we progress towards our vision, the balance of our activities will shift towards the more proactive enabling measures. Over time, our need to call on sanctions and compulsive tools should be reduced. Um, we'd just be grateful if you could um, elaborate on Comcare's aspiration to be more proactive in this area. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and indeed, uh, just in the last, over the last three months and, and work that I've been doing since my appointment has really been trying to focus um, Comcare's work, its strategic approach, its strategic direction and we have just um, in the last few weeks settled on a very simple uh, two priorities. The first of those is the prevention of harm to workers and the second of those is uh, to getting people back to work in the event they have suffered illness or injury. And in both of those two priorities, uh, we have with a particular focus on psychosocial. So um, that's what our aspiration is, is to be uh, known as preventing these things happening in the first place. Um, we look at the, the work that we do in assessing the personal cost, the, the financial cost, the uh, organisational cost. It, it is our number one priority, the prevention of, 
injury and illness to working people. The extract, extract that I read out referred to planned activity by Comicare's psychosocial risk regulation team. Um, is that team and the psychosocial proactive inspection program still in the early stages of development? Um, no, uh, it's now in the stages of um, active work, I would suggest. Uh, on the um, proactive inspection program that's known as the pilot, I think, in that document, um, we are just going through a formal independent evaluation of that. Uh, it was done on a trial basis with three PCBUs. However, I was sufficiently satisfied with the early responses that we had to that work that I've now um, confirmed that unit within... Uh, Comcare, we're waiting on the outcome of the evaluation still and that will help form its um, uh, future direction. So that's um, very much a key part of our work, as is our, our um, psychosocial uh, team in general in terms of the um, both the advisory work they do, the data analysis work they do, the educative work they do. So these are still in development but very much part and parcel of the, the work that we're doing and aligned very closely with our number one priority of prevention. And can you just comment briefly on the level of expertise the um, Comcare's psychosocial risk regulation team have, um, particularly in relation to assessing the maturity of duty holders' systems as they relate to psychosocial risk management? Uh, my observation, and, and Mr Napier might be able to give uh, more detail because they report to him directly, but uh, my observation of the colleagues working in that area, uh, a number of them highly qualified psychologists from what I understand, certainly the quality of the work that they've presented to me has been uh, of a very, very high standard. Um, they're developing, they're doing some cutting edge work in this area, but I think it's got a, a huge um, future benefit to, to Comcare and more importantly to those organisations who, who rely on our work. And, and do you know whether any of that work has been done in a military specific context? N not at this stage, no. And you just um, referred to the psychosocial proactive inspection program. And as I understood it, it was done in a pilot and you were satisfied with it and it's going to um, be rolled out. Could you just clarify what the purpose of that program is? Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, the main part of it is is in the word proactive, so that we go in, we have a look at the systems, we have a look at the operation of those systems um, with that, you know, before incidents occur. Uh, it is a quite a different approach because we, um, uh, in those interactions or, or in those um, programs, we speak to the to the most senior levels of organisations. We speak to those people with the workplace health and safety uh, responsibility, the human resources people, but importantly, we speak to the uh, workers within those organisations as well. Uh, the health and safety representatives in organisations that have them, uh, the trade union representatives in organisations and the workers. So that we get a full 360 view of not the, just the policies and the uh, programs that are put together, but their application. We then assess those and we'll provide quite a detailed report back to the PCBU of those areas where uh, we identify as needing um, additional work. So it's done as very much as a preventative. It can do, or it could lead on to regulatory aspects if we find that there are gaps that are significant enough for us to then take for more formal regulatory, but it's done very much on a, a proactive preventative basis. And, and the reports that you produce during that process, are they publicly available or are they just... No, no, they're, they're specifically provided for the PCBU and then we will um, monitor the uh, their action on filling those gaps that have been identified. As I understand what you've said, Defence has not participated in this program as yet. No, they haven't. It's, it's, there's only been three organisations that were in the first pilot. We're doing two other organisations now and it's just really to, to get the methodology right at this stage. Um, but we would certainly be willing to uh, engage with Defence on this as part of that broader regulatory program that I spoke about before. Are you able to give us any indication of when the program might be ready for Defence to participate in? Well, I think it, it, it they take a little bit of time to set up, but you're talking weeks or months, not, not years. Um, so uh, if there was a willingness, a, a, an interest, a preparedness from Defence, I think we could 
um, commence this sort of program as soon as we had uh, the, the staff um, available to do it. That, that was another question. Is, is Comcare resourced to roll out the program to Defence? Uh, this would need to, it would need to be funded by Defence as part of a, a regulatory program um, uh, and they're the discussions that we would have with them. But when we look at the, when we look at the cost of injuries, when we look at the cost of illness, when we look at the personal costs in the most serious cases, um, you know, the cost to get this work done is, is negligible. Um, what would you need from defence, like you said you you're willing to roll it out on them, what would you need from defence for this program to be effective? Um, we'd need them to uh, um, be prepared to support this right throughout the organisation. We'd be pre we would need them to be prepared to give us uh, full access uh, to the areas that, that we um, identified as a priority. Uh, we would need to agree on those areas of priority because it would be impossible to do a single program covering the whole of defence. We would need to look at it on a in a programmatic sense. Um, we would need to be assured of their, their assured of their cooperation uh, the whole way through, uh, together with a commitment to, um, uh, to act on whatever came out of this. Um, because it, would, it, it involves change, it involves a, a lot of change if, if it's to have the impact that we want these uh, programs to have. So from what you said, you would need a commitment from them to act on and implement whatever you found through that process. And, and I take it that that means to meaningfully implement change? If that's yes, that's right, yes. Okay. Um, I think you referred to earlier of um, Comcare's knowledge of practices and systems used by other PCBUs. Uh, could learnings from other PCBUs potentially be beneficial from defence, particularly in relation to psychosocial hazards and risks? Uh, yes, I think so. I think there would be a lot of lessons that would be as applicable in defence and ADF as they are in other organisations, but that there are also very specific needs of, of a, of a defence military organisation. So that yes, there would be some that would be uh, applicable but would not necessarily be the solution. I understand that, but um, you've expressed the difficulty with psychosocial harm and hazards and particularly the latent harm. So we just wanted to understand whether there's things that other PCB do, use are doing that um, Comcare could potentially yes. bring to defence to help improve their um, processes yes. and approach. You mentioned the Australian um, Federal Police. The, the Commission understands a key difference between the Australian Federal Police and Defence is that the AFP is heavily uni unionised with a very strong voice for safety outside of the hierarchical structure. Is that fair? Yes, it is fair. Um, but notwithstanding that, are, th are there learnings from that AFP partnership that could apply to Defence? Uh, look, I think there are. I think we have... Um a similar sort of engagement with AFP as we do with uh, defence in terms of a number of, of different um, formal mechanisms. Um, we do see that there is a, generally speaking, a high level of commitment uh, in defence working with similar, uh, sorry, within AFP, working with similar challenges. Um, we do feel we have quite a uh, um, open access to uh, dealing with AFP. It's certainly not to suggest that they're perfect. Um, but you know, the discussions that I've had with the Chief Commissioner that we've had with other um, uh, senior people is I believe there is a high level of, of commitment to addressing similar sorts of issues in AFP. Um, I, I was going to mention the, the service chiefs, that Defence obviously doesn't have a union, but it does have service chiefs who have a legal and moral duty to ensure as far as reasonably practical a psychological safe and healthy workplace could, could that, that obligation be better leveraged, do you think, to um, ensure a safer workplace? Oh, yes, I, I think so. And we, we saw from the information that was on the screen earlier about their duties. They have a duty uh, to do that. Um, in some cases, they might need more support. They, in some cases, they may need more commitment themselves to do it. Um, but I think in, in any uh, hierarchical or military force, the fact that you have such a, a structured hierarchy, a rigid hierarchy, 
uh, that's based on orders from one level to the next level, it's very hard when you're trying to put that in reverse for people down the bottom of that hierarchy to, to have an influence and to express their concerns going back up uh, the ladder. So I think um, there needs to be a, a, a receptiveness and openness, as you say, if you compare it to AFP, they've got an independent um, outside voice through their, through their union to raise concerns that individual officers might not be uh, comfortable raising up the system. Um, unfortunately, defence doesn't have that mechanism, so I think one of the things is to look at how they can introduce something that gives workers in defence a similar voice, a, a similar protection if they're raising issues of, con of concern. And until they have that, from what I understand you said, because of the hierarchy in defence, the approach really needs to come from the top down. It needs right? to be demonstrated from the top down, yes, that's right. And I think you mentioned earlier um, opportunities to learn from other jurisdictions. Is that one of the things that you said could be done for defence to improve its um, practices in relation to psychosocial risks and hazards? Yes. Do you know if that's currently being undertaken? Uh, in some of the documentation I've read in, in preparation for um, this commission, I've noted that they have uh, sought information from other um, internet, uh, from other foreign um, defence forces. I don't know to what extent or what sort of information, but again, that would be something that we could we could work with them on. And is Comcare also considering the work of other jurisdictions in this space, and particularly, for example, the work in Victoria? Around psychosocial, yes. Well, we deal regularly with our counterparts in each of the uh, states and territories in Australia. Um, we take note of international developments uh, around this work as well. So, yes, we have a close engagement. Um, the, the final um, topic that I wanted to cover is data. Um, at the moment, do you consider that Comcare uses data adequately to identify risks? Uh, no, we don't use it adequately at the moment. This is um, one of our, well, I told you earlier, we've re recently renewed our strategic priorities. Uh, data is one of our three in-house priorities um, to get better at capturing it and, um, and analysing it and sharing it. And, and that's in relation to um, um, Comcare, and I understand you made a comment before that you don't have um, a lot of insight into what data defence has, but are you able to comment on whether um, at the moment defence adequately uses data to identify risks? No, I'm not able to comment on that. Um, would any data analysis undertaken by defence on so psychosocial harm trends and causation be useful for Comcare to have visibility of to inform its approach to regulating defence? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And um, in your view, what types of data would be useful for that? Um, look, I would, need to, I would need to look at that more closely, but, but I think any data is going to be useful. The, as Mr Napier indicated before, some of our own work on a very small sample, looking for common factors, um, associated with risks uh, within the public service as a whole. For example, we, we do look at census data, which is the whole of the public service um, uh, staff surveys. I don't know whether they have a, familiar, a, a similar one to that in defence, but where you get an opportunity to assess the um, attitudes, the reaction to, to workplace culture, those sorts of things of your employees, um, it's that sort of data that can give you those early warning systems. Uh, where you find a, a unit or a work group that um, has very low uh, positivity around the workplace culture, that's, a, that's the sort of red light. And you know, these are the sorts of things that we'd want to talk to Defence about. How can we, at the very early stage, capture some of these warning signs? As I understand what you've just said, that's not currently happening, right. but the plan and intention is to do that kind of work in relation to data. Right? Well, I don't think there's a plan there at the moment, but there's certainly a desire. There would certainly be a desire, yes. And has this been raised with de Defence or this is with Comcare at the moment? No, just with Comcare at the moment. We're looking at it from our own perspective and not specifically in relation to Defence. More generally, um, we're developing that and I think it will be specific uh, areas um, in our jurisdiction that we'd look to engage with uh, directly on this. Um, I, I know that you've said you, do, you don't have great insight 
into what um, data defence currently has, but um, does com to, to the extent that Comcare does get um, informed of some of defence's data, does Comcare require the ABF to collect more comprehensive data than what is currently collected? Um, do, we have excellent data on physical injuries because of the nature of the notification. We don't have very good data in terms of psychosocial hazards um, and we would encourage Defence to continue their journey to improve that, particularly lead indicator data and we would very much encourage them to share that with Comcare. Can you clarify what you mean by lead indicator data? Uh, incident reports. There's an issue here which we haven't really covered in relation to stigma of reporting and some of the challenges that Defence has in that space. I think if they can look at that and uh, encourage people to speak up at the early stages, if they are struggling emotionally, psychosocially in the workplace, because that is critical data that can help to inform, well, assess, assess the risks and apply the controls. And in that context, Comcare certainly has an interest in that type of data and would readily work with them uh, to assist them in, in, the, in the design of the data and, uh, and the reporting. Are you able to add, um, elaborate any further on the stigma and how you understand that's a barrier to reporting? And when you say reporting, I understand that's reporting non-notifiable incidents. This data does is not the data that's coming in. No, this is yeah, that's right. I mean, I think the hierarchical nature of the organisation and the command structure may uh, uh, block or limit people's um, desire to raise some of these issues. It might impact on things like deployment opportunities, um, um, promotion opportunities. Um, so I think there's an element of that that exists within defence and it's something that uh, my sense is that it needs to be um, considered and ideally addressed as a way forward in better management of psychosocial risk. So um, I take it from what you said that data on non-notifiable psychosocial incidents and ADF analysis of that data would be useful to Comcare to inform its regulatory approach to preventing suicide and latent psychological harm from ADF service? That's right, yes. And useful particularly to defence in the first instance. Mm. Um, just two last questions, Commissioners. I, I note the time, but we did start a fraction after. Um, um, operator, would you please display COM 0001 0002 0283. Um, this is Aaron Hughes' statement, who is the former CEO. And could we please, ex oh sorry, could you just, it's the um, Aaron Hughes' statement, I'm sorry, I'll just quickly find the correct reference for you. at COM 5001-0125. And if we could please expand paragraphs 31 and 33. And the paragraphs essentially relate to Comcare's regulatory operation group uses aggregate claims data in its risk model to assess the inherent risk of a PCBU, including in respect of psychosocial harm. The rates and types of injuries identified in Comcare's aggregate claims data has been utilised by Comcare when planning proactive and preventative work of, of the regulatory operations group. And then at paragraph three, Mr Hughes identifies notably Comcare has limited visibility of claims data in respect of the ADF as claims by members of the ADF or veterans are managed by the DBA. Accordingly, Comcare is limited in its ability to assess the inherent risk faced by members of the ADF or veterans in the same way it would for other PCBUs. So 
the question for you is, would there be benefit to Comcare having access to de-identified aggregate claims data for serving and ex-serving members to better enable Comcare to assess psychosocial risk? Yes. <laughs> and would there be benefit to Comcare having access not only to this type of claims data, but to a broader range of de-identified data sets for example, access to an integrated cross-jurisdictional data sharing system and data analytics capability? Uh, I'm not sure what that all would mean in practice, but uh, I think as I indicated earlier, any access to data that better informs um, our capacity to, and the PCBU capacity to target uh, areas, I think will be, will be useful, will be very useful. And useful to the PCBU, not just to Comcare. Um. Thank you, Commissioners, for the indulgence. There are the questions for these witnesses. Thank you. Christian Brown. Uh, thank you very much, um, but I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Thank you also, but I'm in the same situation <laughs> with that comprehensive um, uh, information you have supplied. Thanks. Thank you for your evidence today. I'm going to break the drought. I do have one question. Um, Mr. Vines, I just, I, in relation to the service nexus between being identified, suicide being identified as having a service nexus, I just feel, tell me if you feel differently, but I feel the discussion has sort of left the problem unresolved. Um, is there a, a plan to try and reach a more firm um, formula, if you like, between yourselves and the ADF about identifying? We discussed uh, cases where there may have been a marriage breakdown, mm. perhaps abuse of drugs and alcohol and so on, but there is nothing obviously to say that they're not directly related to um, service, which then cause these problems, which then may cause a person to tragically suicide. So I, I just feel we've left it sort of up in the air. Um, I'd feel better if you reassure me about what's happening next. Um, well, I think, uh, Commissioner, I, uh, my response to that would be I think Part of the problem lies in um, a lack of clarity in the way it is described in defence. I think what we've heard here, we're both on the same page. Um, so there isn't anything for Comcare to be clarifying. I think defence could be a bit clearer in more simple terms as to what it means unless, uh, unless there's no doubt or if there's any doubt, refer. I think it needs to be as simple as that. but. Unfortunately, in some of the documents I've read, it starts to get a lot more complicated as to what they mean by that. So I think at the end of the day, it's a... So it's really, I, forgive me for putting words in your mouth, but the ball's in ADF's court. I think it is to be clearer in explaining what the current situation, what we, as you have described, what the current situation is. And as we indicated before, we think there would be very, very few places where there would be that, or cases where there would be that doubt. And so we would expect that the vast, overwhelming majority of cases would need to be um, notified Before to it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Brown has just thought of a question. Just, a, just as a follow up to that, you did say before um, encourage the if in doubt refer, and it doesn't necessarily become a notifiable incident. Mm. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Um, so, so. How long can it sit there as something that you're told about before it actually is determined whether it is or is not a notifiable incident? Because it well, might take some time to determine whether or not there's a service nexus. Yes, it could, but it won't be until the service nexus is established that it becomes a notifiable incident. But that doesn't mean that we, we don't wait for it to become a notifiable incident for us to be investigating. As soon as it's notified, uh, it's just that distinction between it being notified and being notifiable. Yes. Um, but once we're aware of it, by whatever means, we would start to investigate. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Um, as you can appreciate, Mr. Barnes, it's a very significant issue because it, affect, it affects data quite significantly about what's related to work and what's not. Um, I'm in difficulty here. I can't see who's representing the Commonwealth. Is it? <laughs> okay, that's, that's right. Um, any questions? <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Embon, any questions? Uh, Ms. Batten, any questions? 
No, thank you, Chair. Okay. May the witnesses be excused yes. from their summons? Yes, okay. please. Thank you. Thank you for your evidence today. It's, a, it's a, some really important issues that we will be considering as we go forward. And we certainly hope that issue of um, service nexus is resolved um, completely. But thank you. You're excused from your summons to appear today. Um, are there any other issues for anyone? Not from council assisting. Okay. Commissioner. If that's the case, we'll adjourn till 9am Monday. We're adjourned. All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide will adjourn to 9am Monday the 25th of March 2024.